Hey, good morning. I am Councilmember Donovan Richards of the 31st District in Queens and the Chair of the Public Safety Committee. Thank you for joining us today. I want to thank the members of the Sub Public Safety Committee who will join us eventually. Uh, but I want to acknowledge my co-chair, uh, Rory, Rory Lansman, who is in attendance. I'd like to start by thanking the independent review panel of Mary Jo White, Barbara Jones, and Robert Capers. I know this wasn't an easy task, but it was incredibly valuable to protecting and improving the integrity of the NYPD. I approach today's subject with mixed feelings. On the one hand, I believe that by retaining a panel of legal experts to review the NYPD's disciplinary process, Commissioner O'Neill showed that he sees the need for meaningful changes to their process. I believe that by publicly stating that he supports changes to Civil Rights Law 50A, which is one of the most restrictive police records laws in the country, Commissioner O'Neill said what he needed to say. But I also think there is more he needs to do to prove his commitment to improving transparency. I want to see him in Albany and I want to see the mayor in Albany pushing for changes to state law. The fact that the commissioner accepted the panel's recommendations shows that he understands that the public does not have faith in the way the department holds its members accountable. It is essential that our citizens feel safe from crime and safe from those who are cloaked with authority but do not always exercise it appropriately. I should be clear that I think the overwhelming majority of police officers are good, honest New Yorkers who are committed to helping people. I'm speaking directly to those officers when I say, this is not about you. This hearing is about officers who act as if they are above the law in a system that does not hold them accountable, a system that, that does not have a set of consistent guidelines so that officers can expect to be treated fairly, a system that keeps the public in the dark about how a department keeps their public servants who pose the greatest danger of overstepping their authority under control. The public has a right to know how the police are kept in check. It's simple as this. The public must know, 50A must go. There are other laws on the books that protect officer privacy. There are rules of evidence that prevent officers from being harassed on the witness stand. We don't need 50A for those things, and they are not what 50A is really about. This hearing is about what it means to be a citizen in a free society. It's about being able to tell the people in positions of authority that they answer to the people. This is about the police department being able to look us in the eye and tell us that they truly are New York City's finest, that the ones who can't follow the highest standard of conduct will no longer be allowed to wield authority that comes with a badge. From what we have seen, that does not seem to be the case. The documents released by BuzzFeed suggest that too many officers are allowed to remain on the force after they've done things that most of us would be fired for, with no pension and no good guide letter. Those documents also tell us that the discipline does not seem to fit the conduct. The independent panel report tells us that the police department doesn't even collect enough data to tell them whether that is true. That, to me, is the most shocking thing about the report. Not what is in it, but what is missing. It just doesn't tell us anything about how disciplinary decisions are actually made and why certain people keep their jobs. The report says there is no favoritism or preference for higher ranking officers, but it doesn't reveal the data that led them to that conclusion. I would have thought that after reading this report, I would at least be able to identify a line that an officer cannot cross. But given the videos I've seen with my own eyes, it seems like there really is no line. But I am here to ask the police department to convince me that things are going to change. We are here today to listen to how the department intends to fix the problems identified in the report, but also to demand more, to get in the information the public is entitled to. 
and we are here to take up legislation that's going to require the department to, to provide the answers that we seek. We are hearing two bills I'm sponsoring, introduction number 1105, a local law to amend the administrative code of the city of New York in relation to requiring the police department to submit reports on complaints of misconduct, and introduction number 1309, a local law in relation to requiring the police department to study the impacts of implementing an internal disciplinary matrix. We are also hearing a pre-considered introduction number sponsored by the speaker, a local law to amend the administrative code of the city of New York in relation to requiring the police department to, public the, to, public the, uh, to make public the department's disciplinary guidelines and the number of officers disciplined each year and to provide a disciplinary action report directly to the council. We are also hearing two pre-considered introduction numbers sponsored by Councilmember Lanceman, a local law to amend the administrative code of the city of New York in relation to granting district attorneys access to law enforcement records, and a local law to amend the administrative code of the city of New York in relation to requiring the department to report on the number of arrests for resisting arrest or assault in the second degree. I am also sponsoring a related pre-considered introduction, a local law to amend the administrative code of the City of New York in relation to requiring the police department to report on the number of arrests for obstruction of governmental administration. Last but certainly not least, we are hearing a pre-considered resolution sponsored by Councilmember Jamani Williams calling upon the New York State Legislature to pass and the Governor to sign A02513, which would repeal Section 50A of the New York, City, New York Civil Rights Law in relation to the personnel records of police officers, firefighters, and correction officers. I will now turn the mic over to my co-chair, Councilmember Rory Lansman. Thank you, Councilmember Richards, and good morning to everyone. I'm Councilman Rory Lanceman, Chair of the Committee on the Justice System, and we are joined by Councilmember Debrie Rose, who is also a member of the committee. And let me thank Councilmember Donovan Richards for leading this very timely hearing on a series of bills concerning police misconduct, focused particularly on the administration's misuse of the state's 50A law to conceal police misconduct from the public, the council, and our district attorneys, and the abuse of resisting arrest and um, uh, assaulting a police officer charges in order to administer some notion of street justice. Transparency in policing policy has not been the hallmark of this administration. Reports required by law are delivered late or not at all. Letters requesting clarity on policy or procedure go unanswered for months. Civil Rights Law 50A is reinterpreted in the most narrow way possible, and its statutory exceptions ignored. And even district attorneys who require information from police to prosecute cases and comply with their own constitutional responsibilities are stonewalled. New York City, New York Civil Rights Law Section 50A creates an exception to the state's Freedom of Information Law, exempting a police officer's disciplinary records from public disclosure except by court order in the course of relevant litigation. The administration narrowed its interpretation of 50A so that even the routine reporting of disciplinary actions, not the records themselves, but the reporting of the actions, would now be withheld. And even when ordered by a court to release documents under a more liberal interpretation of 50A, the city appealed and appealed until it got the decision that it wanted. However, 50A expressly excludes from its coverage, among others, district attorneys, a grand jury, or any agency of government which requires the records in the furtherance of their official functions. Nonetheless, the NYPD has refused to supply this information to the city's district attorneys in a timely manner and refused to supply this information to the council, an agency of government, at all. One of my bills, intro 3706, addresses the delay in supplying police disciplinary information to district attorneys, making it impossible to vet the reliability of testimony and evidence 
of cases brought to them for prosecution by the NYPD and allowing serial misconduct to fester with impunity. Specifically, it requires the NYPD to produce disciplinary records to a district attorney within 24 hours of being requested. Given the department's own unwillingness to confront perjury and so-called test lying in its ranks, and as Councilman Richards alluded to, leaked disciplinary documents last year revealed that an officer found to have committed perjury in front of a grand jury was sanctioned without losing only 30 vacation days. It is more important than ever that district attorneys be given the opportunity to independently evaluate the credibility and strength of cases they are charged with prosecuting at the earliest possible time. My other bill, intro 3707, requires the NYPD to report on the number, circumstances, and demographics of arrests for resisting arrest and assaulting a police officer. A separate bill sponsored by Councilmember Richards does the same for obstructing governmental administration. No one should resist arrest, assault a police officer, or obstruct the administration of government. But we know that these charges are often brought against individuals whose only real offense is talking back or showing what an officer perceives to be disrespect. And these charges are often dropped by the district, by the district attorney. My bill will require reporting on where these arrests are occurring, the demographics of those being arrested, and how often prosecutors disregard these charges and decline to prosecute. Let me also note my support and co-sponsorship of intro 3704, introduced by the speaker, which imposes transparency and accountability on the district attorneys themselves, who are funded by the city budget for their charging, bail, diversion, and sentencing decisions for the very first time. <clears throat> This information has the potential to truly transform the criminal justice system in New York City. Thank you. Thank you, and once again, uh, we're joined by Council Members Rose and Menchaca and Deutsch. Alrighty, uh, we will call the first panel. I'll uh, start with Ass um, Assistant Chief Matthew Pontillo, First Deputy Commissioner Benjamin Tucker, Assistant Deputy Commissioner Ann Prunty, Executive Director Oleg Chernovsky. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee today and answer all questions to the best of your ability? Yes. You may begin. Okay, good morning. Uh, Mr. Chairman uh, Richards, Chairman uh, Lanceman, and members of the Council, I'm Ben Tucker, First Deputy Commissioner uh, and I'm joined uh, by Assistant Chief Matthew Pontillo, the Commanding Officer of the Office of the First Deputy Commissioner, Assistant Deputy Commissioner, and Acting Deputy, uh, Deputy Commissioner for Legal Matters, uh, Ann Prunty, and uh, Oleg Chernovsky, the Department's Executive uh, Director of Legislative Affairs. On behalf of uh, Police Commissioner James O'Neill, we're pleased to testify about the bills before you today. Uh, at the core of the department's mission and our obligation to protect the health, safety, and welfare uh, and visit uh, uh, and welfare uh, of those that live in, work in, and visit our city, a well-trained, focused, and disciplined team of more than 36,000 officers is vital to this mission. We are the largest police force in the nation and also the most scrutinized. No police department operates under much, as much public scrutiny as, or, uh, or as many layers of oversight as the NYPD, oversight and scrutiny that we welcome. In the past five years, uh, that is during the de Blasio administration, the NYPD has accomplished a series of sweeping reforms designed to build trust and encourage collaboration with New York City communities. In the context of all those reforms, the credibility of our internal system for disciplining uh, misconduct by police officers is an important component in winning public trust. If people see the department's discipline system as minimizing or discounting police misconduct, they will be far more likely to doubt the legitimacy of any police action. We recognize that lasting trust cannot be achieved without a fair and transparent police discipline process. That process should provide the people we serve with an understanding of and an insight into 
how the department addresses their complaints of officer misconduct, and how we ensure that our personnel perform with integrity. In the NYPD, we believe overall we have a very robust discipline process that holds officers accountable for misconduct and punishes guilty officers appropriately. But it is crucially important that the public believes it too. That's one of the reasons why the police commissioner uh, commissioned an external independent panel of criminal justice experts to examine our internal discipline process and make recommendations on how we can improve it. The panel reported their findings last week and the commissioner immediately accepted all their recommendations. He has charged me with heading an implementation group to ensure the panel's recommendations are adopted expeditiously. The panel raised important issues which their recommendations address, but they did not identify any significant systemic problems with the fundamental fairness or overall effectiveness of our discipline system. We are ready and willing to, rem to remedy any problems that they have identified. The members of the police department implementation group have, al have, have almost two centuries of combined experience in law enforcement, and they will assist me in ensuring that the panel's recommendations are executed faithfully. We're also committed to engaging an outside organization, as the panel recommend recommended, to audit our disciplinary process once the new procedures are in place. I'd like to thank the panel once again for their lending their lending us their time and expertise. They and their staff took, out, took time out of their busy, uh, busy lives to provide this vital public service. Their recommendations will ensure fairness, accountability, and transparency. And as it is always the case, once implementation is complete, we will continue to look for additional avenues of improvement. Before I discuss the panel recommendations in, dis in discipline system further, I'd like to talk a little about the department's wider reform agenda in order to, re uh, in order to present the context in which our disciplinary re reforms uh, are, taking, are taking place. Since 2014, the department has remade its patrol model, its investigative model, its training for both recruits and in-service officers, its use of force policy, its performance evaluation system for officers, and its approach to assisting and supporting victims of crime. Compared with just five years ago, we are far better connected to the communities, uh, to communities at the local level, far more service-oriented, and far better trained in diffusing situations and alternatives to force. Our investigative work is more sharply focused on the real drivers of violence in the city, and we no longer use arrests and summonses as primary measures of police officer performance. With the advent of the Crime Victims Assistance Program, we are much more responsive and helpful to victims of crime. All this has been accomplished with crime itself, while crime itself has fallen to its lowest levels in more than 60 years. The reforms that we call neighborhood policing are localizing police service and connecting in neighborhoods all across the city. Average population in, uh, in New York City precincts exceeds 100,000, so we are anchoring our police officers, our patrol officers, in smaller sectors within precincts to foster connection between cops and the people they serve. We are empowering our office, officers to work with residents and take initiative in solving problems and fighting crime at the very local level. This is a sea change in how policing is done as we invite neighbors to share responsibility with us and play a role in how their neighborhoods are policed. Trust is built by ensuring that officers spend time interacting with the communities they serve. Trust is built by including our advocate partners and making us more sensitive to the unique needs of diverse communities and victims of crime. And trust is built by collaborating with our elected community and faith leaders to make life better, safer, and fairer for all communities. On the investigative side, we've also moved to a more geographic model with most detective work, including proactive drug and gang investigations overseen by each of the eight localized detective commands. This new structure has propelled a series of precision gang violence investigations that have brought several thousand violent gang members to justice. As the effect of these investigations took hold in 2017, murders fell to 292. 
the lowest level since 1951, and shootings fell to 789, the lowest level on record. Last year, murders ticked up by three incidents, but shootings fell further to 754, an astonishing number when compared with the 5,200 shootings back in 1993. Our, our revised policing methods are helping us decrease the gross number of enforcement actions as we pursue less punitive approach, uh, a less punitive approach to public safety. In 2018, arrests were down 13.8 percent for the year and 37.3 percent in the past five years. Criminal summonses were down 45 percent in 2018 and nearly 79 percent in 2013. Transit bureau arrests were cut nearly in half last year alone, and misdemeanor arrests for marijuana have declined by 71 percent in five years. Following big drops in 2012 and 2013, street stops have fallen further than 90 percent since then. The NYPD also has transformed its training. From police academy courses for recruits to advancing the skills of experienced officers in de-escalating street confrontations with both criminals and emotionally disturbed persons. And probably the most significant change, we've abolished impact zones. These were higher crime locales where new officers were sent fresh out of the academy, largely to conduct stop and frisk operations and other heavy enforcement. Today, in contrast, New officers receive six months of field training with experienced mentors. They gain exposure to full, a full range of police functions and interactions and develop a, as well-rounded uh, providers of police service. The use of force reforms are equally transformational. As it has long done for firearms, the NYPD is now tracking all uses of force and requiring internal investigations in each case to ensure that each use of force was justified. The data is reported quarterly and broken out by the categories of firearms, conducted electrical weapons or tasers, uh, impact weapons, K-9, OC spray, restraining mesh, mesh blankets, and other physical force. Our use of force policy also goes far beyond the requirements of the law. It obliges officers to attempt to de-escalate encounters before using physical force, mandates that they intervene if another officer uses excessive force and establishes the duty to report all such incidents. Closed force allegations at the Civilian Complaint Review Board in 2017 had declined by 50 percent since 2013. The NYPD's victim services, victim services service initiatives have gone largely unheralded. By, the, by late last year, we had placed two victim service advocates in every precinct and in all police service areas that serve the city's public housing. One advocate specializes in domestic violence, while others, the other works uh, with other victims. We've never had anything quite like this at this level in the city. The advocates are helping victims to secure services and compensation and otherwise to rebuild their lives providing an unprecedented degree of support for innocent people traumatized by crime. The department has continued its policies of openness and transparency. We voluntarily published crime complaint and enforcement data. We have collaborated with the city council on dozens of transparency laws, including opening our patrol guide to public review with limited exceptions. We have equipped approximately 20,000 officers on patrol with body-worn cameras with more to come. And we have held regular meetings with community members, stakeholders, and leaders. All of these initiatives are designed to build trust with, with the people we serve. Reforms to our discipline system have the same goal. But as we discuss building trust with the public concerning police discipline, you should also be aware that we have faced a second challenge, which is winning the trust inside the department. Traditionally, our cops have perceived our discipline system as unfair, arbitrary, unduly punitive, and most of all, as taking far too long. Officers felt that their careers were put on hold, including promotions and transfers, while they awaited judgment, sometimes for many months, on pending disciplinary cases. In the past five years, we have done much to improve the system, cutting the process and, time, and trial times almost in half, and scaling back on draconian penalties for minor offenses. 
I think it's important for people outside the department to understand that we use the discipline process not just as punish, to, to punish offenders, but to train and instruct and manage our workforce. While we are always ready to terminate the, ser the serious offenders, we don't necessarily want to fire people who have made honest mistakes or even had ethical lapses of some kind. Many of these people are redeemable and may go on to successful careers with, it, uh, with us, and the discipline system is part of the redemption and training process. Transparency of the discipline process is key to building public trust. The department will continue and increase our uh, advocacy for amendments to Civil Rights Law 50A. These changes permit us to release information of significant public interest, including officers' names, trial transcripts, trial decisions, and final disciplinary outcomes. We will also be judicious in our application of the current law, as we have been uh, when seeking to release body-worn camera footage and, and disciplinary case summaries. Although we were enjoined from uh, releasing this information, we are optimistic that the final decision by the courts will support our position that those materials are not personnel's rec personnel records. The department, however, does not support the full repeal of 50A because the law provides vital protections for police officers from harassment in court and possible threats to their personal safety, both on duty and off duty. The threats in public work, in, in, in police work, are very real. Uh, there were 151 direct threats to individual officers recorded in 2017 and 154 direct threats in 2018. The right path toward greater transparency would amend the portions of the law that raise roadblocks to transparency but preserve those sections of the law that protect the brave men and women who protect us, protect us all. That is the responsible and balanced approach. I'd like to close with the explanation of how our discipline system is structured to establish a framework for further discussion today. Complaints about members of the service can be made to the Civilian Complaint Review Board, uh, the Internal Affairs Bureau, or by calling uh, 311. 311 complaints uh, routes complaints to CCRB and IAB based on the type of allegation. IAB has a 24-hour hotline that members of the public and the police officers may call to report misconduct, and the reporter may remain anonymous. CCRB handles complaints of force, abuse of authority, discourtesy, and offensive language, and CCRB investigates those complaints, finds complaints to be substantiated, unsubstantiated, or unfounded, and issues recommendations for discipline in substantiated cases. In 2018, there were 4,747 complaints made against officers to CCRB, as compared with 4,486 complaints in 2017, an increase of 5.8 percent. Of those 2018 complaints, 1,208 were fully investigated, with 19 percent substantiated and 74 percent exonerated, unsubstantiated, and unfounded. That represents a 2% increase as compared to 2017 when 72% of such cases resulted in a determination that the complaint made against the officer was unsubstantiated or unfounded or that the officer was exonerated. Authorized by a 2012 Memorandum of Understanding between CCRB and the Department, CCRB's Administrative Pr Prosecution Unit prosecute CCRB cases when an officer chooses to challenge CCRB findings and recommend discipline. The trials, which are open to the public, are held before the NYPD Deputy Commissioner of Trials, which is the adjudicating body in police disciplinary cases. Trials, res trial results are reviewed by my office and the police commissioner. The final resolution of discipline rests with the commissioner as mandated by law. He has the power to accept or modify recommended discipline. As the independent panel noted, the commissioner does not take the responsibility lightly. Lightly, he draws on his 37 years of police experience and works toward a fair and meaningful disciplinary outcome in each case. IAB investigates all other serious allegations of misconduct and corruption. IAB investigations are not only commenced as a result of allegations, but are also self-initiated, including the performance of integrity tests, uh, for example, in some cases, IAB investigations may be referred for criminal prosecution. 
If an IAB investigation substantiates an allegation, it refers the case to the Department Advocate's Office, which prosecutes disciplinary cases. If a case goes to trial, the adjudicating body, as a, such as the CCRB prosecutions, uh, is the Deputy Commissioner of Trials. As in CCRB cases, whether a case ends in a pretrial settlement or a post-trial verdict, the recommended discipline is reviewed by my office and then by the police commissioner. Depending on the, the infraction, penalties can, can include command discipline, retraining, loss of vacation days, unpaid suspension, and termination. During the time period from 2014 to 2018, discipline proceedings, and proceedings ended with termination in 150 case, uh, 156 occasions. Lower level infractions, generally involving administrative violations, are referred to officers commanding officer for command discipline. It should be noted that most discipline in the department results not from, com from complaints or IAB investigations, but from investigations conducted and, and penalties assessed at the command level by the officer's direct supervisors. The NYPD values the re our relationships with CCRB and our collaboration is always involved, evolving to be better served, to better serve the needs of the public. The 2012 MOU that enabled CCRB to prosecute certain cases also led to development of the reconsideration program, which, is, which was further revised last year and will be improved upon again based on the independent panel's recommendations. This program established a formal process for negotiating cases in which the department differs with the CCRB's findings or their suggested penalties. The differences may result from new facts emerging or from NYPD's judgment uh, that the CCRB finding was based on misinterpretation of the law or resulted in an unjust outcome. The department may formally request the CCRB to reconsider their findings or recommendations. The program has led to increased agreement between the departments and the CCRB's findings. I hope that we can all agree that, last, that the vast majority of police officers perform their uh, often dangerous work with integrity and courtesy. But the noble work of the vast majority cannot excuse or justify in any way misconduct by a relative few. Police misconduct not only hurts uh, its victims and the community with uh, writ large, but also harms other cops. All cops feel the erosion of the public's trust and all cops feel, feel the suspicion and the shame when one of, their, one of their own behaves in a way that is inconsistent with our shared values. Just as important, unless the public can see that there are consequences for these improper actions in a way that the department disciplines, is, disciplines its own, New Yorkers might be led to, to the false belief that, the, that acts of corruption and misconduct are shrugged off or somehow tolerated. As a department, we can never permit that, that outcome. It breeds a perception of lawlessness and damages our individual and collective reputations. Most of all, the first casualty of such negative perceptions would be our ability to build relationships with, uh, and fight crime successfully. I will now turn it over to Executive Director Oleg Chernovsky, who will discuss the legislation being considered uh, today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. If you could hold on one second, Oleg. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Tucker. I uh, just want to acknowledge that we've been joined by Council Members Cabrera, Gibson, Williams, Powers, and Cohen. And I want to go to Jamani Williams for a statement uh, on his resolution. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Richards, Chair Lansman, and uh, Speaker Johnson, and my colleagues for holding this hearing, and of course the panel. Uh, this is just an opening statement, won't go into any uh, back and forth. Uh, but power corrupts, and there is nothing more corrupting than power exercised in secret. Those are the words of the late investigative journalist at number 17 on Nixon's enemies list, Daniel Schur. And these words ring true even more today. Power exercised in secret is just corrupting. Whether it be the orange man in the White House signing executive orders in between executive time, or the governor and mayor forcing through $3 billion deals with the rich, world's richest man without public review, or the NYPD operating with almost zero public consequences in cases of misconduct and abuse, we must demand transparency and accountability at all levels of government. And that includes ensuring that those charged with protecting us are also answerable to us. This does not mean that we are anti-police or do not very much support the brave men and women who are tasked to protect us every single day. This is why I'm 
proud to sponsor a resolution on the New York State Legislature to pass and the governor sign, uh, which would repeal Section 50A of the New York City Rights Law. It's A02513 on the Senate side, 02673. According to the Committee on Open Government, the interpretation and application of the law deprives the public of information essential to oversight and lends a shield of opacity to the very public, state, and local police agencies that have perhaps the greatest day-to-day -day impact over the lives of citizens. Section 50A increases the harms caused to New Yorkers who experience police abuse by denying them and their loved ones access to information about whether departments take any disciplinary action at all about officers who mistreat them, including withholding information about officers whose actions result in a person's death. In fact, we learned thanks to a disciplinary records leak in April 2018 BuzzFeed News article that between 2011 and 2015, at least 319 NYPD staff committed offenses, including lying under oath, driving under the influence, and excessive force with almost no serious consequences. This is what arose public trust in our law enforcement and this administration. The mayor has to answer the questions right now. Uh, there are, we are in a much better place, I always admit, with this administration than we were before, uh, except in the areas of transparency and accountability. The two areas where people are yearning to see some kind of change is those two areas. And in those two things, we haven't seen much movement. In terms of transparency, I believe in many parts we have moved backwards. This has to change. 50A must no longer be used as an excuse to tie the hands of district attorneys as a reason for slap on the wrist treatment of officers who have undermined the duty to protect or a necessary cause of added pain and trauma to individuals and families seeking justice in the fairest big city in America. Of having been a victim of excessive force myself in the last term, I'm sad that not much has changed in that area. Uh, repealing 50A is a necessary step toward justice for Eric Garner, for Shahid Vassal, for Marley Graham, for Derwan Smalls, for Muhammad Ba, and for the countless New Yorkers just asking for truth and for openness. I am thankful that the uh, department and administration put together this panel. Uh, I'm very happy that I was uh, able to be interviewed by the panel and relay my experiences. Um, I'm hoping that uh, what I heard was true, that they will be accepting all of uh, the recommendations, but I do think it did show a systemic issue around discipline. Uh, again, I'm thankful to the speaker and chairs, uh, Richards and Lansman, for holding this hearing on these crucial pieces of legislation starting the much needed process of turning back tide on the corrupting nature of secrecy in our law enforcement. And I'll end with just saying I am glad uh, that I believe this conversation with this administration uh, at least has a different feel than the last administration. And that in itself is progress. So thank you. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Williams. We'll go back to you. Good morning, Chair Richards, Chair Lansman, and members of the Council. As Commissioner Tucker has just laid out, now that the independent discipline panel has commi commissioned by the police commissioner has completed its work, the department has commenced implementation of the panel's recommendations. As you probably have noticed, some of the bills or portions of bills being heard today address the same or similar topics. The police commissioner has accepted all of the panel's recommendations and we look forward to keeping the council updated as we wor work toward the most effective and meaningful way to implement these reforms. I would, I, would not, I would now like to comment on the legislation being heard today. Intro 1105 would require the department to report monthly on the number of complaints of police misconduct received by the department, specifically use of force or misuse of force, harassment and use of offensive language, and the action taken by the department in response to each complaint. While the department does not have an objection to providing transparency about such data, it should be noted that complaints about force and offensive language are handled by the CCRB, which currently posts such data publicly. Any complaints received by the department related to these areas are immediately referred to the CCRB. Additionally, CCRB has begun investigating and recommending discipline regarding sexual harassment complaints. The department supports CCRB's continued practice of allowing public access to this data. However, because this is not the department's data, we do not believe we are the proper entity to, to report about it. We note that the second sentence of the proposed new section referring to actions taken in response to each such complaint would have to be interpreted consistent with the limitations of Civil Rights Law Section 50A. Intro 1309 would require the department to study and implement a discipline matrix. The department supports the intent of this bill. 
As the Council is aware, the Independent Discipline Review Panel has also recommended the implementation of such a discipline matrix. While the implementation of any type of discipline guidelines must remain within the purview of the police commissioner as the legally mandated final arbiter of discipline, the adoption of such a matrix will be something the implementation group will be working towards and we intend on keeping the council informed throughout the process. Pre-considered intro 3705 would require the department to publish its disciplinary guidelines, which are effectively a description of the types of violations and range of penalties officers committed, committing misconduct face, as well as the number of disciplinary cases disaggregated by precinct, among other disaggregation points. With the exception of ongoing investigation or pending cases, the department's goal of amending Civil Rights Law Section 50A would permit the disclosure of such data with greater specificity than even this bill requires. However, given ongoing litigation over the interpretation of the types of information covered by the current Civil Rights Law 50A, the current, injunction, the current injunctions which are in place arising from such litigation, we are concerned that the disaggregation of all of the data points at the level of granularity sought in the bill may lead to, the, to additional litigation. We look forward to working with the Council on a draft bill at the conclusion of the litigation that comports with the court's rulings and law so that we may disclose as much aggregate discipline data as possible. We also commit to continue actively seeking an amendment to Civil Rights Law 50A that would, at a minimum, permit the department to post the type of data the current version of this bill envisions at the conclusion of a disciplinary proceeding. Pre-considered intro 3706 would require the department to turn over all disciplinary records requested by a district attorney's office within 24 hours of a request. The department opposes this legislation. The NYPD has a strong and productive working relationship with each of the district attorney's offices, as well as the special narcotics prosecutor. These relationships have developed over decades and have resulted in countless successful prosecutions of many criminals. We count the city's prosecutors among our vital partners who have worked with us to reduce crime to lows not seen since the 1950s, while at the same time, the number of arrests has been reduced by tens of thousands each year since the start of this administration. We call it precision policing, the targeting of the few individuals who are responsible for driving crime in the city. The prosecution of these bad actors requires ongoing collaboration and sharing of information to ensure that they are taken off the streets before they can find their next victim. Through the years, we've developed processes that ensure that our prosecutorial partners get material evidence in a timely fashion, including the ability of prosecutors to make expedited requests when necessary. These processes have evolved and have been strengthened over time based on court decisions, statutory amendments, and the mutual desire to improve. To that end, the Department led a working group with prosecutors that has revised the manner in which requests for discipline records are processed. We have centralized and stream streamlined this process so that the Department's document production unit is the single responsive unit to such requests from prosecutors. Also, based on the re request from prosecutors, we simplified and revised the form used by DA's offices to submit their requests to better reflect their needs, all in an effort to ensure a timely response. We have all fostered an effective relationship over the years that accounts for the prosecutor's need for time to prepare their case, meet court-imposed and statutorily mandated deadlines while use, utilizing finite department resources. We object to this bill because set it, setting by local law an arbitrary and stringent timetable for the transfer of information between law enforcement agencies effectively micromanages the day-to-day -day and hour-to-hour -hour operations of this department. It fails to account for the resources required for compliance and protocols for ensuring requests are limited to relevant information and are not overly broad. The department commits to a continued productive working relationship with the city's prosecutors to ensure fair and successful prosecutions. 
Finally, pre-considered intros 3707 and 3708 set out reporting requirements for charges of resisting arrest, assault in the second degree, and obstruction of governmental administration. We do not oppose the reporting of, of broad categories relating to these crimes that we would be unable to provide certain, however, we would be unable to provide certain detailed data points required by this bill. For example, the department can, can report on the number of arrests for these charges disaggregated by borough, by precinct, by age, by race, and by gender of the arrestee. However, we cannot capture data on the specific underlying charge that an arrestee resisted the relationship of an arrestee charged with resisting arrest to another individual whose arrest they resisted, the nature of injuries in a felony assault case, whether the district attorney declined to prosecute a case, the entity which operates the building where the arrest transpired, the ethnic origin or specific gender identity of the arrestee, or the specific government, government function obstructed. The department looks forward to working with the bill sponsors on amendments to these pieces of legislation to achieve a greater level of transparency within our data collection capabilities. Thank you, and we look forward to answering any questions you may have. Ready. Thank you. No other individuals testifying? All righty, great. Well, let's start off with the million dollar question. And, um, you know, I would argue that the public is not adequately informed of how and when police officers are disciplined for misconduct. Matter of fact, not just I, uh, the panel uh, that the police commissioner uh, put together called it a fundamental and pervasive lack of transparency. Does the police department agree with the panel's assertion of 50A? We, the, the department accepted and the police commissioner immediately accepted all of the recommendations of the panel. And I, I think it's important to note that the department has attempted to be more transparent and, and has been brought to court, you know, in, while, in those attempts. So for example, body-worn cameras are an example where the department sought to uh, release body-worn camera footage and was enjoined from doing so in that case is before the courts. The department sought to, to uh, lay out discipline summaries and discipline aggregate discipline data within what we believe the, uh, to be the bounds of 50A. And again, we were enjoined by, uh, uh, enjoined by the courts. So we await the results of those, uh, of those cases and we look forward to further um, advocating strongly for the amendment to 50A but that's the key. It's, it has to be an amendment to 50A that appreciates the safety concerns for our officers. And uh, so let's just stay on that for a second. Um, so I know the police commissioner has also committed to reforming 50A, obviously. Um, what aspects of 50A do you think need to be preserved that aren't accounted for uh, in other laws on the books? So let me speak to that, Chair Richards. Um, I think the police commissioner has been very vocal and very supportive of this, um, and we certainly are, that there are aspects presently of 50A that don't allow us to be as transparent as we wish. So in that sense, I think we have common ground with you. We would like to be able to provide the public with our disciplinary outcomes with the names of the officers, the charges, some of the documents relating to the disciplinary procedure, and also the outcome. We'd like to be able to do that at the conclusion of the process, when the officer has had full due process, all of the facts have been heard, and the decision makers have been able to determine what the proper outcome is. So in that sense, I think we have that common ground. On the other hand, um, I think what's really important to recognize and to understand here is that we want to be able to find an amendment to 50A that retains that part of it that addresses the safety concerns of our officers. And these are very real concerns. You know, um, the original underlying purpose of 50A 
was to make sure that officers wouldn't be harassed, intimidated, humiliated, threatened as a result of the release of data and information related to their personnel records. And that's still very important to us. You know, um, we've heard references to it in our testimony earlier, but threats to officers are very real today. Um, you heard Commissioner Tucker speak about the fact that we've got um, data that indicates that in 2017, um, we had 151 direct threats to police officers. Um, in 2018, that number rose to 154. Um, we've had officers who have responded, for example, to uh, an incident of a, um, a vehicle accident, and that officer was stalked and harassed um, as a result of taking police action in that case. We've had officers who made an arrest, and in one instance, we had an individual who um, was determined to send bombs to what he believed were the homes or the locations where that officer might be. And unfortunately, one of those bombs detonated and killed an innocent homeowner when he sent it to the wrong address. Um, and of course, everyone knows that since 2014, we've had um, assassinations of three police officers who were doing their job on the street and were killed simply because they were officers in uniform. So we need a 50A amendment that recognizes all of our concerns about being more transparent, yet at the same time takes into account those very serious and real concerns about officer safety. So your panel noted, and I, we're certainly sensitive, and we want to ensure that um, police officers are protected in, in every which way, and we believe in, in, in ensuring that they have uh, safety. Um, however, in your, in your panel's report, uh, they discussed uh, Chicago PD, I believe, released two, over 200,000 cases. And within your panel's report, it concluded that even when those uh, names in cases were reported, there were no threats or harassment to officers. The other thing um, I, I want to mention is, so there have been names of officers put out there, so Pantaleo and, and others. Have there been any threats uh, directly to officers' names who have been put out uh, in the press currently? Well, there certainly have been threats to officers whose names have been put out in connection with uh, discipline. Okay, I've, I've heard that. So based on names that, so can you name some threats to officers whose names recently have been put out in newspapers? And, and can you give me some conclusive information on uh, those threats? Well, I, I mean, listen, I think I don't have names for you, but, but I think that's not the point. But I think you would know the answer to that. So is the Well, but, no, but the answer is probably no. We don't have any okay. threats against Pantaleo that we're aware of. But the point And is not just Pantaleo. Any officers right now whose names have, over the last year or two or three or four years, who've been put out in the press, have there been direct threats to these officers? Yeah, we have, we have those information. That's that, in that number that, that, uh, that, the, that uh, Ms. Prunty uh, mentioned, the 154, the 151, within those, the scope of those numbers, uh, there are officers. We know who they are. That's how we know that the, that the complaints are real. So, and you know, you can't predict this. This is not something where you can say if it didn't happen within the last three months, then somehow it's not relevant. Uh, it is relevant and it's important. So, so you know, we should, we, we should take that into account. And all we're trying to establish is trying finding the right balance to how we um, provide the information that we are ready, willing, and able uh, with all the liberty speed to provide to the public. Uh, we just told you that, and, and we gave you some specific examples that Ann mentioned with respect to what we've been trying to do, but we've been prevented from uh, because of the litigation. So it is not that we lack the, the, the will or the desire to, to find uh, some way to be more transparent, uh, certainly with respect to the body worn camera. Uh, videos that we've produced. Um, we said we would when we in implemented the, the body worn camera program. We would continue to do it and would be doing it even even still, but for the for the litigation. And we hope and believe that maybe we'll prevail uh, and be able to do it uh, subsequently. 
And take me through what advocacy, so we've been hearing at least for the last two years that the mayor and the police commissioner support uh, an amendment to 50A. Uh, can you speak to any advocacy that has happened uh, in Albany? Can you speak to any trips the commissioner has taken to Albany to lobby legislators? Can you name legislators that the administration has lobbied on uh, an amendment to 50A? Sure. So, uh, I mean, in, I think it's important to highlight the process first in, in terms of we're, we're in a mayoral agency, so uh, the, the administration speaks with one voice. The process for, for pushing forward or supporting legislation or pushing for legislation is centralized and done through the mayor's office. So, yes, we have done significant outreach and significant work over during the course of this administration to seek amendments to 50A, now both publicly through the last two commissioners, Commissioner Bratton and O'Neill, as well as the executive staff have made public comments, have uh, written op-eds uh, in support of uh, such amendments. Uh, we have also worked with elected leaders uh, through the mayor's office to introduce legislation that struck the right balance. Because I, and I think this is worth noting, this stemming from your, your prior question, that if we all agree of the type of transparency needed, the type of records that, that should be released ultimately. Why, why are we disagreeing about the need to protect police officers? The need to protect police officers is not linked or somehow shielding transparency because we all seem to agree to amend the law to allow these certain vital records that are of, are of public interest. But why throw away the protections afforded police officers in doing that. I think we could achieve both. We don't need to, we don't need to choose one over the other. We can have both, and I think that that's the approach that the department has taken: greater transparency while also protecting the officers that protect us all. And I, I would argue, first off, once again, we are, we want to be 100% supportive of. Uh, protecting our police officers, uh, but we also want to be 100% uh, positive in protecting the public as well. And when you look at the families, uh, unfortunately, who uh, misconduct and, and police violence has uh, taken effect on, it truly erodes uh, that transparency and, and, and community building between the police department and local communities. So I, I just wanted to hear a little bit more about, you know, obviously the, the panel has agreed, right, that 50A is a huge problem, that transparency within the department and accountability is a problem. Um, do you acknowledge the toll that 50A and, uh, and the lack of transparency in the department, uh, the toll it takes on uh, the victims of police abuse and their families when a department doesn't tell them what's going on with an investigation. A absolutely, and I think that's, that was the point of our advocacy for an amended 50A. But in all of the examples that, that you're mentioning, which would be addressed by the options that we're offering, right, I don't think in any of those cases you would say that, well, we could achieve the transparency that's needed, that's called for by everybody, including us, but let's at the same time make it somewhat easier to harass a police officer on the stand or threaten a police officer engaged in a high-profile incident. We could have both. The concerns that you're raising, raised by the community, concerns that we've acknowledged time and time again, and we've, we've pushed for amendments to the law, that's because of these concerns. We agree with the panel that transparency is absolutely needed. But we don't need to throw away the protections afforded our officers in the law. That's what needs to stay. The transparency piece is the piece that needs to change. So tell me what pushing looks like now that we have a, a, a different uh, uh, ear in, the, in Albany. What is that going to look like this year? I think pushing is going to look like uh, would-be travel. How's it going to look different? I mean, it's going to, well, I mean, we're really, I don't have a vote in the state legislature, so obviously I write a bill, introduce a bill, and So you're and not running for the, for the state senate but, anytime? Yeah, no, I don't, right. I don't think okay. I will. I don't think you want me to. <laughs> but um, I, I, what we're going to do is we're going to work through the mayor's office with the Senate, with the Assembly, with the Governor's Office to advocate for this approach, the approach that I'm stating publicly for you today, 
um, the approach that we've supported for a number of years now during this administration. And uh, hopefully we're gonna, we're gonna have favorable court rulings uh, that further the expansion of reporting that we, we're trying to do without an amendment, and hopefully we'll have an amendment that we've been calling for for a number of years. Right, and I will say I don't necessarily support this, the particular bill you're speaking about today, but we'll we'll continue to, to, to have discussions on that and work with our state partners. I want to get through on um, some of the reporting. Um, so one of the bills we're hearing today uh, asks you to report data about what kind of offenses uh, get discipline and how much discipline uh, different off how uh, and how much discipline different offenses get in the aggregate. Do you support making that information publicly available? So we're talking, uh, just to be clear, we're talking about intro 1105? Yeah. Okay, so with intro 1105, uh, and I, I mentioned this in my testimony, that uh, the highlighted uh, offenses of misconduct that you mentioned are handled by CCRB, and they actually currently post this data online. The pieces of the portions of the bill that address, so I, I think just as a logical conclusion, I think that data should be posted and continue to be posted by them, and we clearly have no objection to them doing that. The portion of the bill that would link each and every case to an outcome, to an investigation, I mean, meaning advertising the fact that we're, we're conducting an investigation, as well as releasing the disciplinary conclusions of the investigation, I mean, these are all things that are either the subject of litigation or are covered by 50A. So, again, we await the conclusion of that litigation, and wherever that conclusion takes us, the more they allow us to release at that point, we'll be in favor of doing that. And again, we'll be pushing for an amendment to 50A. That's actually going to give you even more than what you ask for in this bill. So, let's go through uh, agencies and, and non-governmental agencies you, you work with. Um, so obviously the CCRB, are they, they're covered under 50A? Are they precluded from looking at cases under 50A? Can you go through, so, so can you answer that question? I just want to get it on the record. No, um, under 50A there's a, I be believe it's subdivision four. It allows for certain agencies that are um, conducting their official functions to have records, and we routinely provide CCRB. And can you go through all of the agencies who could have full access? Um, well, I can, off the top of my head, I can tell you the district attorneys, which are one of the mm -hmm. named agencies in 50A. Um, the attorney general's office is also one of the um, accepted agencies in 50A. Um, I know that we have provided disciplinary records to, for example, the Department of Investigation. Um, we have provided them to the Office of the Inspector General for the NYPD. Um, we've, I'd have to, Corp Council, yeah, Corporation Council is another one. So those are all agencies that we um, consider to be, um, fall within that exception in 50A and we provide them with records. And that makes sense because they need the records in order to perform their official functions. Right, and you saw, and I appreciate the commissioner once again in, in pulling this panel together, um, but you just went through a bevy of different agencies that could perhaps look at your disciplinary process um, period. Uh, I'm interested in knowing, um, uh, you know, don't you think an outside agency is in the best position to evaluate whether uh, your system has improved? Well, I think um, one of the so reasons... So being that we had this panel, and this panel, were they covered under 50A2? How much were they able to look at? They were able to look at essentially what those other oversight bodies were able to look at. Um, and they also agreed to... A abide by the confidentiality provisions of 50A and not disclose anything that would violate 50A. So they were able to look at particular officers' case files? That's correct. That's correct. And did. How much, how many files did they have access to? I don't have off the top of my head, but they looked at, oh, at least 100, maybe more. But if they wanted to look at 
I don't know, every file in the department, would they have had access to that? They absolutely would have had. I mean, one of the things that's important to note about the Blue Ribbon panel that the police commissioner convened is that we, the NYPD, did not direct their work at all. They were a completely independent panel. They determined what they wanted to look at, when they wanted to look at it, who they wanted to speak to, um, and they got full access because we wanted an outcome that was had integrity and was entirely impartial and objective, and that's and, what we got. And, and with the documents provided to the panel, were any of the documents, have, did any of them have redactions? No. So none had redactions. All right, why didn't the panel provide an analysis of all the most common offenses and what kind of discipline is handed down if that's the case? Again, I don't, we didn't direct what the panel would report and what they would examine and how they would go about their business, so I simply can't answer that. But I'm just having a hard time understanding if they had access to all of this information, uh, why couldn't they hand, uh, why couldn't they get that specific information to us? Um, one of the few analysts, uh, analysts they did in, involve that they did uh, point out was on DV cases, domestic violence cases. They said that domestic violence is not taken seriously enough. What, what are you going to do about it? What, do, what are we going to do about domestic violence cases? So mm -hmm. let, me, let me just talk a little bit about, about that. We can give you some details. But for some time now, we've been looking at the data uh, with respect to domestic violence cases that have come through the Department Advocate's Office, and we've seen an increase over three years, Matt. Um, and so, so we, we are, as we did with our DWI cases, took a look at uh, those carefully and recognized that we need to um, think about ways in which we change the, the way we handle those cases with respect to penalties and so forth. So that process is underway, and as part of the implementation group, we'll be looking at it much more in much more detail, uh, with a view toward coming up with uh, some different approaches to how we handle those cases. One of which will include a variety of, of, of increases, such as dismissal probation, uh, looking at the, the nature of the case. Sometimes it's violent violence involved in a domestic violence. Sometimes it's not. So we'll have to assess it and, and sort of think about what level, what the nature of the, this, each case is, and then think about what the penalties ought to be. Um, but certainly something that's on our radar, certainly something we, we, we care a lot about, and, um, and certainly uh, it could end up in terminations as well, as, as it does on some cases with, uh, with DWI cases. And so, um, again, the, there is this, um, we have this desire to figure out as we learn things. This is a work in progress, and as we and we discover that we're having, uh, we may be we may have been looking at um, uh, the way we discipline people for DV cases uh, based on precedent. We now know, or we believe, just because of the increase that we see, and and perhaps even the nature of of of, of the of the conduct of the individual offender, uh, know that we now need to 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 do something more than that. But I'm just astounded why it took a panel for us to understand the importance of ensuring, and I know there can be people who, well, you know, so let me just give a case because I, I just want to speak factually. So the panel said that there's an officer who was not dismissed even though he had eight prior domestic violence incidents, two of which were substantiated. What possible reason is there to not fire someone who has uh, two substantiated DV cases? Well, and, number, and I just want to point out, this is why there is such a lack of trust when it comes to the way the NYPD disciplines its officers. Well, part of the, um, and this is just one case, right? So if there's a crack here, how many other cracks are? Well, I, I don't know that it is a crack. I mean, that, the officer you're referring to has been terminated and was terminated. When was he terminated? Um, August of 18. August of 18. Yes. And it took eight incidents for us to terminate him. Well, we don't know what the incidents were. Uh, we know we, we know Two what they are now. Two were substantiated, and was he still serving in the department during that period when these cases were substantiated, even after the first one? Well, clearly the one, well, he was terminated based on the cases that were substantiated, so. So he got two shots 
at working on the streets of New York City, although he had one, one substantiated case should have been enough for termination. Is that correct? Would yeah. you agree? Yeah. You, you know, the, the challenge with this. Right, hold on. Would you agree that one substantiated DV case should have had this individual terminated? No, I don't agree. I mean, you don't agree that an individual who had a substantiated case on domestic violence let me, for the first time should not have been terminated? Not necessarily. It depends on what the... So how do we... How do we... Council member, if, you, I, if I can, can we let... Let me, let me, just, let me just say answer. this. So in a time where we just had a hearing on the, the SVD unit, how could the public trust the NYPD to deal with victims of sexual violence and domestic violence when they're not even disciplining individuals within their own department. Well, well that, first, that's first, not a fair characterization. It's not. And if, and if the commissioner can So why this, did it take two if, substantiated if cases to get member, rid of an individual? Council member, you, know, you, listen, you asked the question, I would like the commissioner. If there was a person in my like office with one substantiated case, that person would be gone. Well, so why, why, sure. why within the NYPD, how could we have an individual with two substantiated domestic violence cases still working in a department? Well, let me just say this. You don't know the facts in any of those cases. You don't. And so, I know enough to know that they were substantiated. Well, that doesn't mean that, yeah, they may have been substantiated, but you don't know what they were substantiated for. So why did you terminate them? Listen, we, we can go around all day. I but mean, he was what, terminated, Why don't correct? we do this? Because okay. I will get the specific facts to that case, and I will walk you through every single incident that okay. occurred so you have a sense of what transpired. Um, but I, I want to say to you that just because you have one substantiation doesn't mean you're going to terminate the individual. You don't know what that was. It was an argument. You don't know whether it was violent. So you, but, they had, but he had eight prior incidents to that. Well, but that's what I'm saying. So yeah, I can walk you through what those prior incidents were, and they may not have risen. So this not one, one person had eight priors and two substantiated, and you don't find something wrong with that. I didn't say I didn't find anything wrong with it. Don't put words in my and mouth. Also, I'm suggesting to you that until you know the facts, okay, it's, it's important to understand every single case and the circumstances and, and what those complaints were and how they were handled. It's as simple as that. Okay. The panel also indicated that DWI cases ended up getting higher amounts of lost vacation days than domestic violence. Why are police officers who are caught driving intoxicated giving any leeway? What was the question? Why, are Why do officers who are, um, who are caught driving intoxicated given more leeway than individuals engaged in alleged domestic violence? They're not. Any leeway at all. So your panel, this is not Donovan Richards making this stuff up. This, is, this was the police commissioner's panel. I'm just taking the facts well, but just be, from, be more from what the what, panel what, came up with. This is not, I know I'm viewed as crazy on some days, but this is, this is not Donovan Richards <laughs> making this stuff up. Just, this is just, a panel that you appointed who stated in their report um, that it indicated that DWI cases ended up getting higher amounts of lost vacation days than domestic violence. Why are police officers who are caught driving intoxicated given any leeway at all? Well, again, it's, this is, it's, it, you, you have to put all of this in context. And so we are holding officers. You, you just heard me say that we increased the penalties significantly based on what we observed uh, in the number of DWI cases uh, occurring in the department by members of the service, both uniform and civilian, by the way. And so we took steps now to, to, to increase the number uh, of the, the penalty days, uh, and they can be quite significant, but those penalty days come along with typically a dismissal probation, and when that event occurs again, that individual will be terminated, will be terminated. They go to counseling, they get breath, breathalyzers, you know, the whole, we follow the investigation, um, it's very methodical, we go through the, 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 the process. What we're doing is going through the same approach, we're taking the same approach we took with DWI, uh, we're looking at taking the same approaches, uh, that same type of an approach with uh, domestic violence. But domestic violence has some other, I think, factors to it that may make, make what we do uh, slightly different. But that will all be determined uh, when, we, when we sit down with the implementation team to think about what this looks like going forward, specifically around DV.
Right. And I, I'm, I'm, and I'm going to come back around. I, I'm going to go to Rory after this. But if I could just add on the DWI point, um, I think it's also important to note that if an officer is found to be driving while intoxicated, um, the vast majority of those are going to be criminal prosecutions. Right. Those cases are referred to the prosecutor's offices, um, and those cases are dealt with in the criminal system. So it's not that those cases are not treated seriously. There's probably nothing more serious that can occur to an officer than to wind up in handcuffs in the criminal justice system. And the outcome often. And how, and how often does that happen? How often are those cases followed up on when by it, the DAs and you? They're followed up on, every single one of them is followed up on. Okay. And, and, we, and we follow up on it. So it's, there's two tracks. There's the criminal track and whatever's happening with the DAs. But at the same time, that same officer, we, we'll be deal with, dealing with it through our administrative uh, process as well, disciplinary process. All right, I'm, I'm gonna come back after. I just have a few more questions, and then I'm gonna come back. I wanna get to my colleagues as well. Um, so you were talking about vacation days, and, and, and obviously a lot of individuals seems to be, uh, seem to be disciplined with the vacation days being taken away, docked. Um, do you consider, uh, taking someone's vacation days as an uh, effective deterrent to misconduct? Well, it certainly has an effect on, on, on officers who lose the, those days and the number of those days. Uh, yes, that's one of the things that, that, you know, if you are, for example, if you're a new police officer, probably under three years in the job, and, and we take 10 vacation days or 20 vacation days, depending on the nature of the conduct, uh, that means you're not getting a vacation for uh, two years, maybe three years. So, you know, again, it depends on it, what the conduct is, and then the, the, what we're trying to do is, is use the penalty that, you know, that fits that particular conduct. And is there evidence to suggest that docking of vacation days uh, is the most effective way to deal with? I don't know about the most effective way, but, you know, we'd look at the data, but if that officer doesn't ever violate again, then it, we, that, that's an indication that uh, he or she learned his or her lesson. How does the department assess how many vacation days should be docked? So in the panel's report, for instance, it spoke of the discrepancy between um, individuals who I believe have uh, DUIs opposed to DV. So they saw a higher amount of uh, vacation days docked for uh, DWI or DUI opposed to DV, so more 30 day, 30 days well, but, being but, docked for yeah, DV yeah. opposed to 60 days for DUI. So can you just well, speak just, on that discrepancy a little bit more, or disparity, let me not say this, but disparity, well, it's, it's, and why do those disparities exist? Well, it's pretty simple. I, you, you just heard me say that we looked at DWI, and, and two years ago, we restructured the penalty uh, process for those cases based on the, the, the number of cases that we were seeing, um, and, and, the, um, and the nature of those, that conduct. So we changed the, we shifted and we changed what had been uh, heretofore precedent that we thought was not making the grade because people seemed to be uh, getting involved in these, in these incidents. So we changed the penalties. Uh, and with those changes, we've seen a change in behavior. We've seen a decrease in, in those incidents. Uh, that happened, so, so this is, the way to think about this disciplinary process is it, is it is a work in progress. And so as we discover that there are challenges or issues with a particular type of conduct, we address that, 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 uh, that conduct in different ways. We did with DWI, we raised the penalties, they're much more severe, and there is a, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it steps up, so for, you know, it has, you know, um, levels to it. So if, if, if I'm an officer and I'm driving uh, and I'm drunk, uh, but I also have my weapon with me, or I have an open bottle in the car, that, you know, the penalties get higher and higher and higher. Ultimately, those officers might be terminated as a result of, of, uh, of the conduct in a number of days. But they will almost certainly, uh, even in the first instance, end up on dismissal probation in addition to the number of days that they take and that they lose and so forth. And I just want to stay on that. So any citizen charged with a DWI immediately loses their license, correct? I don't know. I mean, I, I, not, they, have a hearing. Yes. they have a hearing. They, they could lose their license, but it's not in every instance, no. And that's and not to say that that couldn't happen to an officer either. 
you know, I mean, it's, again, it, as, as uh, Commissioner Pronte pointed out, there, there usually there may be, depending on the circumstance, there may be a separate, a parallel a criminal investigation taking place, which will have I implications for that officer. All righty. Uh, I'm going to go to Councilmember Lanceman uh, and then my colleagues, and then we'll, I'll come back for a second round. Again, good morning. Good morning. When the panel released its report, um, Commissioner O'Neill said, I and the entire leadership of the NYPD accept and fully embrace all the recommendations in the panel's report. And I'm going to assume, unless you want to correct me, that that includes the panel's recommendation that, quote, until 50A is amended, the department should interpret it as narrowly as possible, consistent with the Court of Appeals ruling. Let's take a look at 50A so we understand what it is that we're talking about here. Civil Rights Law 50A. All personnel records used to evaluate performance towards continued employment or promotion under the control of any police agency or department of the state or any political subdivision thereof shall be considered confidential and not subject to inspection or review without the express written consent of such police officer, except as may be mandated by lawful court order. The next two sections then describe the process and the mechanism for, for getting that court order. And then we get to section four. The provisions of this section shall not apply to any district attorney or any agency of government which requires the records described in subdivision one in the furtherance of their official functions. As a baseline understanding, does the department accept that district attorneys under 50A, section four, that district attorneys are not covered by the restrictions of 50A and that they are entitled to these disciplinary records in furtherance of their official duties. Yes, in furtherance okay. of their official duties, we absolutely agree with that. And, and I assume that there's also no debate that when a district attorney asks for this information in the context of a, a, a criminal case where they need to evaluate whether or not an officer's testimony will be credible, whether or not the affidavit that they might have sworn out is credible, whether or not they have a, a history of uh, uh, being disciplined for perjury or, 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 or misconduct or, or falsifying um, um, records, that that is relevant and in furtherance of their responsibilities as district attorneys, correct? Yes, and we provide those records to the district attorneys routinely. So let's talk about that, because I don't think there's any other way to describe the department's view of your disclosing those records to district attorneys and the district attorney's view, or at least the, 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 rep, the, the, the view of the Manhattan District Attorney's Office, as just representing two complete alternate realities. And this gets to my bill, intro 3706, which would require the, district, the police department to disclose disciplinary records with, to the district attorneys within 24 hours of being asked. In the testimony this morning, it was said, the NYPD has a strong and productive working relationship with each of the district attorney's offices, as well as the special narcotics prosecutor. Through the years, we have developed processes that ensure that our pr prosecutorial partners get material evidence in a timely fashion including the ability for prosecutors to make expedited requests when necessary. We object to this bill, 3706, because setting by local law an arbitrary and stringent timetable for the transfer of information between law enforcement agencies effectively micromanages the day-to-day -day and hour-to-hour -hour operations of the department. That's one view of reality. This is the letter that District Attorney Vance, Vance's office, sent to the NYPD in May of 2018, discussing the disclosure under 50A 
or disclosure, not really under 50A, but disclosure of these personnel records. To date, little progress has been made and the focus has largely been on how we as prosecutors can make accommodations to address the NYPD's resource concerns. For example, you have asked us to delay requests for disciplinary information until a case is actually headed for hearing or trial. As you know, very, very few cases in the criminal system actually go to trial. And almost all guilty pleas are secured, almost all convictions are secured through guilty pleas long before there's a trial. You've asked us to delay requests for disciplinary information until a case is actually headed for a hearing or trial, rather than um, upfront when we are assessing the credibility of police officer and civilian witnesses and the merits of an arrest. You've also asked that we avoid requesting such information until we have confirmed with an officer that he or she has been the subject of discipline, regardless of whether the officer can ac accurately recall and relay that history. You have insisted that after such an inquiry, we make specific narrow requests for information using a checklist through a single point of contact, a process that can take weeks or months for your office to complete. And despite the terms of an agreement reached with our office in 2014, the NYPD has failed to provide us with access to certain reports and video surveillance feeds. These limitations frustrate our ability not only to prepare for trial, but to make early assessments of witness credibility, explore weaknesses in a potential case, and exonerate individuals who may have been mistakenly accused. Listen, I'm not sitting around thinking up bills to put in. Believe me. You have the district attorney of New York County, and I am not aware and I have not heard either privately or publicly any of the other district attorneys contest uh, Vance's office's representation of how the D NYPD is producing this information. But you have the, the district attorney saying that the NYPD is not getting this, this information in either a timely manner or in a complete manner. And that is inhibiting our ability as district attorneys to do justice, to determine the strengths and merits of the cases in front of us, to determine what kind of pleas to offer, and to make sure he uses the word exonerate to make sure that we're not wrongfully convicting people. So, in light of the district attorney's representation, which I hope that I assume that my co chair here will not object to me making this letter a part of the record, in light of the district attorney's description of, of the NYPD's refusal to, to provide this information, why shouldn't the council pass a law requiring you to do so? so Chair Rich, um, I'm sorry, Chair Lanceman, let me um, give you some background. Um, you know, the short answer to your question is that some of the claims in that letter are inaccurate. Um, I'm very familiar with that letter. Um, the NYPD responded fully to that letter, and um, I'm happy to enter into the record the NYPD's response to the letter. But let me give you some background, which I think will assist you in understanding our position. Um, let me start out by saying that prior to my arrival in the NYPD, I was a assistant district attorney in Manhattan for 31 years. Um, and I think that gives me um, a unique vantage point in understanding both the needs of the prosecutors who are very important partners to us and people that we value very highly in that partnership, you know, the needs of, of the, the prosecutors in order to effectively prosecute cases. I understand those and I have members on my staff who are also former prosecutors and we understand that acutely. So in 2016, we formed a working group. Actually, it was initiated by the department. We asked each of the district attorney's offices in each of the five counties, the special prosecutor's office, and the two federal prosecutor's offices, Eastern District and Southern District offices, to join us on a working group. And we had executive representatives from each of those offices join in that working group. And we convened that working group for the express purpose of addressing exactly what you are speaking about. And that is ensuring that prosecutors have uh, information about our police officers that are necessary to assess, assess their cases and effectively prosecute their cases. Um, 
that working group met numerous times. We also spoke in conference calls numerous times. And based upon all of that work and all of that discussion, um, and by the way, that included the Manhattan District Attorney's Office, um, we arrived at a mutually agreeable process in order to ensure that the prosecutors would have this information. I need you to just fast forward to May of 2018 when the District Attorney's Office sent this letter which indicated that the working group isn't working. So what's the disconnect? Well, the disconnect is that many of the things that are said in that letter are inaccurate. The individual who wrote that letter was not part of this working group, was not fully familiar with the history of this working group, and clearly was not fully familiar with the processes that we arrived at. But let me continue in, in the efforts that we've made in order to ensure this. We well, the NYPD, yeah, no, I'm sorry, go ahead. We in the NYPD in order to effectuate this, and at the request of the prosecutors, all of the offices, we assigned a single point person within the NYPD to be responsive to all of the prosecutor's offices. And in conjunction then with that, we asked each of the prosecutor's offices to assign a point person for this process. Um, we regularly communicate that point person from the NYPD with the point people from the prosecutor's offices on requests on needs, on things that are urgent or an emergency. Um, and we have had instances, and in particular instances with the Manhattan District Attorney's Office, where we've gotten a request as late as a Friday afternoon for something they needed on a Monday morning, and we've gotten it to them over the weekend. So I would suggest to you that what we did was we collaborated with all of the prosecutors arrived at a mutually agreeable process, and that that process has worked and is continuing to work. Well, I, I, have, I have written testimony from the DA's office, the Manhattan DA's office, for, for today's hearing, where he still, they still describe, given the inadequacy of the existing disclosure process, and this is a very supportive uh, letter of, of, of what our bill is trying to accomplish and what we're trying to do here today. So, I'm going to end this part of my, my questioning where, where it began, which is the NYPD and the district attorneys are, are describing two different realities. And um, the reality that the, 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 the DAs are describing, that, that the advances office is describing. Well, that's one DA. That's one DA, but none of the DAs have, have contradicted that, either, either in their personal conversations with, with me or publicly. And everything that, that the, the advances office is describing, um, we've heard from other district attorneys. So um, if, if, if your objection to our bill hinges on us believing that District Attorney's Vance and the common experience of everybody in the criminal justice system is, is, is false and wrong, that's not much of a, of, of a case. I'm, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is we also have um, very frequent conversations. I have frequent conversations with the executive members in each of those offices. They did not join in that letter when that letter was issued by the Manhattan District Attorney's Office in May of 2018. And I would like to enter our full response to that letter into your record as well. I, I'd be happy to have it. Is that the statement from Phil Walzak? No, it's not. Okay. Well, I'd be happy to. I'd be happy to have that. Okay. Um, but right now, we're looking at a very, very detailed description by a district attorney's office in, in New York that comports with what I hear from other offices that the NYPD is not disclosing the disciplinary material in a timely or comprehensive manner well, and unless not, I unless I here. unless I am persuaded that that is that is flat out false then I don't see any reason not to to, to move um, to move our bill well I think Let, that's an, it's an important to hear us on that as well well I, I look forward to, to hearing and, and viewing your response to that let's move on to the other uh, another <coughs> very very important um, issue and that is the NYPD's disclosure of so-called 50A material to the council, or lack of disclosure. In, in August of 2017, the Daily News reported 
The city's top cop recently overturned a guilty verdict against an officer in a department misconduct trial. Then the NYPD and the Civilian Complaint Review Board, citing a state law protecting police disciplinary records, wouldn't say what the cop was accused of. But sources told the Daily News the cop was charged with using a banned chokehold. Now, 50A, Section 4, as I read before, expressly, expressly declines to apply 50A to other government agencies in furtherance of fulfilling their obligations. And you mentioned a few of the agencies that you recognize, a few of the other government agencies that you recognize as being exempt from, from 50A. And certainly, you know, if one looks at the powers of the, the council, right? we have the power to legislate, we have budgetary power, we have oversight power. I could cite all the provisions of the charter, but I don't think that's in dispute. You're here today testifying to the council about disciplinary issues regarding legislation that we may or may not pass, that we are considering. And so when I read that story, it got my attention as a council member with legislative and budgetary and oversight responsibilities as a government official. As you might know, I'm sponsoring the bill in the council that would make it a misdemeanor for an officer to uh, apply a chokehold. As you might know, I'm sure you, you think some of you have testified at hearings that we've had on, on use of force and particularly use of chokeholds. We've had testimony. We give a tremendous amount of money to the NYPD related to the training that officers get on use of force issues. The chairman has had hearings, many hearings, on the effectiveness of the CCRB and its, its role in disciplining uh, officers. And so I wrote a letter to the commissioner after reading that daily news story in 2017 as the sponsor of currently pending legislation which would make a police officer's use of a chokehold a misdemeanor I write to request the records in the recent case which you overturned an administrative judge's guilty verdict against an officer accused of using a chokehold. I specifically cited section 50A, subsection 4, which provides an exception to 50A for any agency of government which requires the records in the furtherance of their official functions. Now, the response I got a month later from the commissioner was three sentences. New York State Civil Rights Law 50A prohibits the type of disclosure sought in your letter. Not even the courtesy, really, of making, distinguishing why 50A subsection 4 doesn't apply. I'm used to that. It's okay. The third sentence, interesting, was, however, a video of the incident was recently made available with the consent of the police officer involved, which raises the other issue of the department's selective disclosure of information to support the decisions that it makes. We'll put that aside. Sitting here today with the panel recommending that the department interpret 50A as narrowly as possible, with the commissioner's statement that he fully embraces the panel's recommendations, Will you commit, well, will you acknowledge that the city council and council members as government agencies, or government actors, are entitled to this information as long as it is in furtherance of fulfilling our, our governmental responsibilities? So, Council Member, I, I think first I'd like to address the point about the selective disclosure. Even in the example that you mentioned, and I, I noticed when you were reading 50A into the record, one of the prongs that you left out was not only a court order allowing uh, a, a personnel record to be disclosed, but it also could be disclosed with the consent of the officer. Yes, yes. Okay, so, and then the body-worn camera footage example that you gave, you correctly pointed out that we got the, the consent of the officer before we released it. Now, I'll go a step further to say that the department has taken a position publicly and in court that f that body-worn camera footage is not 
50A material. We were enjoined, of course, from releasing it. Okay. But these, but these are points of how we have interpreted 50A narrowly, in addition to seeking to release summaries of disciplined data. Now, what you're talking about is potentially a significant expansion, or not even potentially, actually a significant expansion. Let me just put it to you this way. Do you consider, do you recognize that the council and council members are government agencies, and that in circumstances where we can demonstrate that we need this disciplinary file in order to, in furtherance of our obligations, whether it's our oversight, our budgetary, our legislative obligations, that we, like district attorneys and grand juries and other agencies that were referenced before, should be entitled to this, this information? Well, I think that's what you raise is an interesting question that's probably would be settled in litigation. Now, you're certainly a branch of But it would be settled in litigation if I had to sue you again. I, if I can finish. You're certainly a branch of government, the legislative branch of government. I mean, the fact that you're choosing to interpret yourself as an agency and not a branch of government, whereas agencies generally fall under a different branch of government, which is the executive branch, the fact that a law was enacted uh, designating an inspector general to do oversight of the department, uh, which is part of an agency of government who routinely receives these records. The fact that if you take a look at subdivision four, before you get to the last provision, what you see is executive, level, executive branch agencies, uh, ma mainly prosecutors and, and uh, attorneys uh, who do prosecutorial work. Uh, that's an interesting question that you raise. I, I have not viewed a branch of government as an agency. I viewed it as a you, you don't, different branch. Within the, the, the ambit of, of, uh, of 50A section four, you don't, this is what I'm here to establish, you don't consider the city council a government agency? I think that's a question that would need to be, that would need to be researched. I mean, certainly the council uh, in a variety just, just of- Just to be clear, sorry, just to, I don't mean to interrupt this time. Yeah. Just to be clear about the language. Any agency of government, mm -hmm. so we're not even talking about a government agency, like in a specific mm -hmm. sense. Any agency of government, you, you don't consider the city council any agency of government? That, that's the question I'm putting to you right well, now. Well, no, I understand, and I was answering the question before I was okay. interrupted. But what I, what I mentioned was that the council is a branch of government, certainly. The police department and the mayor's office is certainly part of the executive branch, as well as the prosecutors. And then there's the judicial branch of government. Uh, the approach you're taking, or the interpretation you're taking, is a unique approach, given other laws that are in the ad code and the charter where the council is not seen as an agency of government. So I think it's certainly uh, certainly a path that should be looked at. I, I, would, I would love to know, wh wh what are you referencing when you say there's somewhere else that doesn't see the council as an, I believe an agency a, of government? I believe I, I had read a provision of the charter where members of council are not permitted to be employed by an agency. So. I, that, that's certainly a conclusion, uh, a logical conclusion to reach. But there are, there are, I'm sure there are other provisions and other laws that we can look at as we explore the issue that you've raised. That's right. So how do you reconcile that with um, Commissioner Tucker's willingness to share with Chairman Richards and presumably other council members the disciplinary file of the individual who was uh, involved in the domestic violence dispute? I mean, what would be the basis for, for sharing that with us if it wasn't that we were an agency of government that was not covered by 50A? Well, the, the individual is terminated and not an employee of the NYPD. I mean, there is, there is a distinction there. Uh, so that's the distinction you're making? That, I mean, well, it's, that's, that's, it's a fact. I mean, it's... No, 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 I, I know that it's a fact. Yeah. I'm, I'm, so the distinction you're making is you can share that disciplinary file because that individual is terminated. I, First of all, I want to say that the, police, that, that the commissioner did not say he was going to turn over a disciplinary file. What he said is he was going to speak to Council Member Richards right. and give him context and give him an overview of the scenarios that happened. That's, different than turn, that's a different scenario than turning over right. discipline records. But yes, the individual that, that you're referencing no longer works for the police department. Okay. Um, I understand the speaker's here and he's going to on a schedule. Um, and then we will come back to me because I want to talk about the second bill.
the issue of resisting arrest, et cetera. Thank you. I want to acknowledge we've been joined by Councilmember Miller. We'll go to the speaker now. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Lanceman and Chair Richards. I want to thank you all uh, for being here today. It's good to see you, uh, Commissioner Tucker and, and Oleg and everyone else. I really appreciate you being here. I apologize I wasn't here for the beginning of this hearing, uh, which is a very important hearing to give an opening statement. So I want to uh, give some brief remarks uh, on my thoughts on where we are today and why it is so important that we're having this hearing and considering these pieces of legislation. Um, so we, we don't want to make it harder for good police to do good police work. But officers, as you all know, are given guns and batons and tasers and the authority to use them against ordinary citizens who have the right to be treated with respect and with dignity, whether or not they have done something wrong. The public has every right to know at least the basics of what happens when people, police officers, with this kind of power, misuse that power. And the current lack of consistency and transparency in this area is alarming. Police officers who kill people over untaxed cigarettes should not be allowed to be police officers anymore. And it shouldn't take four years to figure that out. Police officers who break into people's homes without a warrant or without consent because they think they are above the law should not be police officers anymore. Police officers who lie to make their case stronger should not be police officers anymore. Police officers who commit domestic violence or drive while intoxicated should not be police officers anymore. Police officers have great power, and with that great power comes great responsibility. And because of that responsibility, these officers should be held to a higher standard of conduct. So while I commend the police commissioner for taking steps last summer to produce the report that came out last week, I am deeply concerned that the report does not really say what happens to people who do those things. It does not say how many officers were fired and why, or how many officers were allowed to keep their benefits when they were fired or, and why. It does not say how the department treats the worst offenses, except to say that domestic violence isn't taken as seriously as being insubordinate to a superior, which is very disturbing. And I think the report only shows how important it is for there to be more oversight by the city council and by the district attorneys and maybe by other agencies as well. Because when an independent panel says that the police department doesn't have the data that could tell them how people are being disciplined, that is a very serious problem. I know the commissioner has agreed to retain outside experts to do routine audits, and that is an important commitment, but it is not enough. The city council has a duty to the people of this great city to look closely at exactly how these cases are handled, and that is why I'm, I am sponsoring a bill to require that the police department publish reports to the public and give the council the data we need to do our own analysis. I look forward to working with the commissioner and allowing him to make the changes that he has committed to, but we are gonna make sure the council is doing what we have to do as an independent branch of government, what we are mandated to do in order to guarantee the level of transparency and accountability our citizens expect from the people charged with keeping us safe. Now, in just a little while, I'm sure you know this, we are gonna have family members who are, who are coming here to testify. And I sat with some of these family members last week. And it was extraordinarily painful to sit with these family members and to see the grief and trauma and loss associated with their loved ones being killed. So today we're gonna to be joined by Victoria Davis who is the sister of Delron Smalls. And we're gonna be joined by Eric Vossel, the 
father of Sahid Vassal. And we're going to be joined by Constance Malcolm, the mother of Romarley Graham, or Marley Graham. These families deserve justice. They deserve answers. And if there are police officers who are still on the force that acted inappropriately, that were involved in what most individuals would deem as misconduct, where now these families have to live with this for the rest of their lives, we need to do right by them. We need to do right by the citizens of New York City because the police department does a tremendous amount of good work every day in this city. And I think it's important to acknowledge that. But when there are mistakes, we have to say that and there have to be consequences. So um, I look forward to uh, hearing from these family members, hearing what they've gone through, acknowledging their pain, and seeing how we, as a body, can be involved in hopefully righting those wrongs and making sure that if there is a police officer in the future that does something that is wrong, illegal, criminal, outside of the patrol guide, that they suffer the consequences, because that's important. So I, I have a couple of questions that I want to uh, ask. Uh, when there is a high profile case, wouldn't there be so much more value in the commissioner coming out and saying something was wrong? Don't other police officers need to hear that? Doesn't the public need to hear that? Well, I, I would agree that that's true. Um, and we have said that when things are wrong, they're wrong. I mean, your statement is not unique to you, and, and we understand certainly the pain of anyone who loses someone. Uh, you know, we don't take that lightly. Um, but it is also true that the, you know, there's a process in place, and sometimes it doesn't move as quickly as people, particularly people in grief, would, would like and prefer. And so, but, but in terms of understanding uh, and, and making sure that our officers, you missed the opening statement, you missed some of, I much apologize of, much for that of what I said, but, um, but you know, I don't take that lightly, and I, and I can tell you that notwithstanding the conversations we've had here, w which talk about things that are, you know, maybe in the future that we can do better, that, um, that there is a whole lot that is different over this last four or five years that is, that is very different than what the norm was prior to, uh, prior to 2014. And part of that and everything that we've done with respect to training, to improve uh, the way officers are taught and to give them the strength to do what they need to get done to do their jobs every day um, and to keep people safe and look at the, uh, the statistics with respect to civilian complaints to, to, and, and to, I think, a greater degree, look at our statistics with respect to firearm discharges and how often, off, uh, how, how little officers fire their, their, their firearms uh, over the last five years and the numbers continue to go down um, and, um, and what they're, what, you know, typically they're usually in adversarial circumstances. So um, I understand what you're saying and, and would, would agree that, that we all should be paying attention to um, and have a desire to, uh, to eliminate those circumstances where uh, people die at the hands of our police officers. But the truth is, um, we, it's not as if we rest on our laurels there. So um, we're, we are, I think, working every day uh, to, to make the department better. And I think we have in so many ways that um, that is that's pretty extraordinary. And I can tell you going back, you know, I can sit here and, you know, I've been around for a long time. And I can tell you that, that the work that's been done by this agency over the last five years is, has been unprecedented, both with respect to crime victims. I think you know that uh, uh, for sure. But also in terms of, of, of the, the way we fight crime and, and the focus on those tiny 
that, that small um, group of folks who are committing the most violent crime in the city. We've gotten much better at doing that. No more dragnets. Stop and frisk is down at, at you know, record lows, um, and, you know, which suggests that it's being used more judiciously um, and under the proper and correct circumstances. So, but, but, Commissioner, I appreciate all that, but do you agree that if you were a family member of someone who was killed, taking four years for a departmental trial, how painful that would be? Oh, listen, I, of course, I can understand. So the why, why has it taken four years? Why has it taken so long for Daniel Pantaleo, the officer who killed Eric Garner, to be brought to departmental well, trial? Well, I think you know part of that answer. And it's not, it's not always been in our court in terms of the process. I mean, you, there is a process to these prosecutions and to the, the, the way discipline is, is, is meted out. But if it takes we, so long, it feels like something's broken. It feels like the process is broken if it takes this long. Yeah, it, pro you can, it may be broken, but it's not, it doesn't mean so that So what are we going to do to fix it? Well, it's not, it, but um, my point is, it's not just the police department involved in this process. And, and so, and, and I don't want to debate this with you, um, but, but I think I understand the reality, and I, as, I, as I preface in my opening remarks to you uh, in reference, in response to, to your comments, I do understand the grief of the families. I mean, no one can, can ignore that. But, but um, you know, to sit here and suggest that somehow the, the police department is solely responsible for a four-year delay in how this process has worked is just not the case. I, I didn't say solely responsible. Well, but you but suggested there, but no, that but there we is need to fix it. There is responsibility. Not, not, not sole responsibility. Of course, the Justice Department uh, did what they did, and there are major issues with what they did. But separately, this has taken far too long, I think, from our perspective and from the public's perspective as it relates to it's, it's the, taken, late, the process from the PD level. Well, it's taken far too long for, from our perspective as well. Well, I'm happy to hear that you think. But I'm not suggesting we're the reason for it. I'm just saying that you're not, process, I didn't hear what you said. You're not suggesting what? That we're the reason for it. One of the bills we're hearing today asks the PD to report about what kinds of, uh, report data on what kinds of offenses get discipline and how much discipline different offenses get in the aggregate. Do, do you support making that information publicly available? Uh, yes, Mr. Speaker, so thank you for the question. So the, we, we took a position on this bill, and I, I just want to explain the position to you. Uh, the first part of the bill, it's, it's important to parse, to parse the bill. The first part of the bill basically requires us to post uh, the different types of uh, violations that an officer could commit, the range of penalties uh, that each one of those violations can, can get uh, an officer if they're found, if they're substantiated. And then it also uh, asks for a description of the offense. I mean, that's clearly something that we would want to do. That's something that we sought to do in a case that's now before the courts where we're being enjoined, because we actually tried to go even further and offer case summaries on certain cases. That's, that's a, that particular issue is in the courts right now. But the description of our process and the way the first part of your bill envisions is certainly something that we support and is something that we would, we would be interested in doing. Uh, the bill goes further uh, in the subsequent portions and talks about disaggregating certain types of data. Now, certainly aggregate data is not something that uh, we have an objection to, to posting. I think if you um, take a look at the ad advocacy we've been doing to uh, amend 50A, uh, Civil Rights Law 50A, it would allow us to go even beyond what this bill prescribes and actually put even more meaningful data so, out Oleg, there. So, do you have any issues with this bill? Uh, there are a couple of issues. What are those in issues? In terms of uh, the disaggregation points that would actually disaggregate the specific types of discipline by specific precincts. Uh, that currently is the subject of litigation, or not the exact issue, as, as you mentioned, but similar issues are before the courts right now, and we're being enjoined from sharing a discipline report that has case summaries in addition to a lot of the things that, uh, that are called for in this bill. So what we are asking is that we await the court's determination in, in those cases. Okay, I and think, what's the other part that you have an objection to? Uh, I think I kind of grouped in 
I think whether you, you look at subdivision B and C, both of them call for disaggregation. The difference is that uh, subdivision C calls for an even greater disaggregation, but we would be providing it directly to the council rather than posting it on our website. But it has uh, I know the police commissioner has been very um, vocal about um, supporting the changes to 50A in the state legislature. Has the police commissioner sent a letter, or the police, would the police commissioner send a letter to the uh, majority leader and the uh, assembly speaker and all members of the legislature talking about that support? Sure, I think uh, we, we've advocated, just to give you a, li a little bit of, uh, of background on this, I've, uh, the police commissioner has advocated for this, the executive staff, Commissioner Branton as well. Uh, but have you guys a done a letter to the... Uh, to they've the written op-eds, I don't think they've written a letter Would yet. Would you guys certain, be open to I'll writing a letter? I'll certainly bring that back to them, but uh, the, the core principles that I think both of us are advocating for in terms of transparency is something that, uh, that are very well documented. I'll bring the idea of, of issuing a letter to the legislature to them to amend, to amend 50A. So e the panel that, was, that came out with the report last week said that the PD isn't collecting the data that would enable that panel to conduct a full analysis. They said that. So don't you think that given the council's oversight responsibility as a municipal legislature, we have to require to collect and provide that information so that a full outside independent analysis can be done? Well, let me, let me just say that, that we are collecting the data. Uh, and I think it's the way in which we collect the data that, may, that, 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 that the panel may have been referencing because we, what we need to do is, and what we're, I think we'll be discussing as part of the implementation group is to think about how we can, you know, have one system that, that where the data is controlled. Right now, we, can, we have a number of databases that collect data for, set, for, for different reasons and, and thus um, I think the, the panel says it's hard to really understand what's going on if the data is scattered throughout the throughout the agency. So, so we'll be taking a look at you know what the, what does that mean to us and what can we do going forward. Uh, but it, I'm I'm sure you know it's uh, it won't be an easy lift as we you know we have to think about what that means for purposes of technology and how we aggregate the data into one system or fix put a fix in place that allows us, allows the data to be shared between and among systems that would generate an aggregate report, for example. So, so just food for thought, but, but we, we, we heard it in, in the report, we understand what they mean, and, um, and that will be one of the issues we take up as part of, our, a part of our discussions in the group. But part of the issue here is that we believe that there needs to be the ability for outside entities to do analysis of this data, not just the PD doing the analysis on their own, but that we as the city council, who have oversight responsibility on city agencies, we need to be able to conduct our own analysis. So is there an objection to that from the PD? No, so uh, council member, uh, Mr. Speaker, I think, I think we're getting at the same point. I think that, and what I was saying before is when we await the resolution of the two pending piece, uh, the two pending cases in the courts, combined with the push for amendment to 50A, when we achieve that, we will be able to publicly disclose even more granular data than is required in the bill. At a minimum, it would do what the bill is looking to do. What we're talking about is the current state of affairs. So. so so there are currently restrictions within the statute of 50A. There are currently restrictions put upon us by the courts because of pending litigation. So whereas we can certainly share some of the data that the bill requires and we want to share, if, we, if you look at our position on 50A and the amendment to 50A, we're going exactly where you're going with this bill. The idea is though, because of the pending litigation, because of the statute, we're constrained at this point from doing it. So who currently gets fired for misconduct? Yeah, we can give you some, some sense of that. Uh, tell, tell me what offenses one has to commit to get fired for misconduct. So uh, I'll give you some data. Between 2014 and 2018, the NYPD has terminated 156 police officers or forced them to separate from the department because of disciplinary proceedings. The reasons vary, and I think this maybe points to one of the challenges the independent panel had when talked about data. 
uh, that the fact patterns and the levels of offenses uh, can be very, very specific and, and very, very fact sensitive. So uh, in, in general, we've terminated people. Uh, so one of the issues that came up was a discussion about uh, domestic violence. Uh, so in 2018, for example, uh, we terminated eight people for domestic violence related offenses uh, that were substantiated. Uh, we talked about false statements and perjury, uh, you know, over um, uh, when, when we look at the number of cases, we've terminated uh, a number of people uh, for, for those cases as well. Uh, cr uh, conviction of a crime, if a police officer is, con is convicted of a crime, either a felony or a crime that goes to their oath of office by operation of law, uh, they vacate their title and we separate them. So there are a lot of reasons why, however, uh, well, why do some very, people very get, fact specific. Why do some people get voluntary separation? So it's, it's part of the analysis that the department advocate does on every case that comes before it. So when the advocate considers a case, they look at the strength of the evidence, the strength of witnesses, the likelihood of prevailing at trial, and they have to make a tactical and strategic decision on where to go with this case. Um, does, does a memo get written up to defend that decision so that it doesn't feel like favoritism is being played Yes, yeah, so internally, uh, the, um, within the advocate's office, there are teams of attorneys that handle these cases. Every team has a supervisor and a team leader. Uh, then there's executive oversight. Uh, and then every disciplinary case that comes out of the advocate's office before being implemented comes to the first deputy commissioner for review and then to the police commissioner for final review and determination. So, Commissioner, you review those? Absolutely. So, um, do you, do you have a list, is there a list publicly available of the offenses that are considered serious enough to warrant termination? Well, we know what those offenses are. I mean, we don't have a list, but you do case by case and you look at the conduct of the officer, you look at that officer as an individual, you look at his or her conduct. Sometimes the conduct in and of itself, notwithstanding the officer, uh, and their background and whether they've ever been in trouble before, it doesn't matter that the conduct is so egregious. Um, uh, that we would terminate um, under those circumstances. But there are those cases, uh, they're not all that cut and dried, and there are those cases in which you have to look at the larger picture and get a sense of what, uh, what the circumstances are. And that's how, that's really, that analysis gets done by the advocate. They usually do that duper, deeper dive uh, there, but when it comes to us, we look at what, they, what their rationale has been um, and then we make a determination as to whether we're sending it forward with their recommendation or we sometimes change it and sometimes we disagree uh, and we think it may be, uh, they may be asking for a penalty that we think should be stronger uh, and we go higher or it may be uh, lower and we go lower or we, we make a recommendation, uh, send it forward to the police commissioner as is. And of course, then there's a, a whole other discussion that takes place as another review process at the commissioner level uh, with all of us present for those conversations. So there is a process, it does, it does, um, uh, it, it is rational, it does make sense. And I think by and large, the outcomes are the right outcomes. Uh, does voluntary separation mean that someone can get a job at another police department? Well, we, we wouldn't give them an endorsement for that. It depends on the nature of the conduct, but we don't, you know, it, it depends on the other police departments as to whether they want to hire them, but unlikely that they would. We're yeah. talking about getting approval for a license or, or you know, we, we may not give them, um, you know, when we, when we put people out of the department uh, under, under those circumstances where they're being terminated, they don't get a letter from us that says that they're entitled to, or we endorse their ability to get a, a license for a firearm. But even though you may not endorse it, I mean, isn't it very problematic? Oh, okay. So um, well, well, let me just you know, finish, let me finish. My, isn't it very problematic if someone has been given voluntary separation for serious misconduct? You know, as you said, it's a case-by-case -case circumstance where you figure out if it's mm -hmm. termination or voluntary separation. It's case-specific. Mm -hmm. Right. So it, we, but, but if someone has, has done something that the 
police department internally has said, this is serious misconduct, but they're given voluntary separation. Isn't that a real problem if they are then able to go and be a police officer in another department? This is what so they've been they, found to have engaged in serious misconduct? Right. Oh. Short, short answer is no, uh, right. because... No uh, to what? That it's, it's not a, a problem? That it's a problem for other police departments. It's no. not, and I'll, I'll tell you why. That's um, what he was going to tell you in a second yeah. ago. Uh, so if, if there is a negotiated penalty with a respondent, a member of the NYPD, for misconduct, <clears throat> and, and part of that negotiated penalty, <clears throat> excuse me, includes separation from the police department, uh, typically that will be coupled with other uh, penalties, uh, suspension time, vacation time, uh, change in duty status, uh, et cetera, depending upon the facts and circumstances of the case. Uh, several weeks ago, we just completed a round of reporting to the New York State Division of Criminal Justice Services on members separated from the NYPD. So there's a state law and DCJS, maintain, DCJS maintains a state database, and we report to them all members of the service who have entered the NYPD, but also all members of the service who have left the department in the prior six months. And we give the reasons for that separation. So it could be normal retirement. Uh, however, we do break out by a very, very specific category, all members who are separated either as a result of a disciplinary hearing who were terminated or who left, resigned potentially when they had a disciplinary matter pending. So they quit to avoid being disciplined uh, as well as these negotiated pleas. So DCJS maintains that database, and that database is there. So why not just fire them? Well, then again, it goes back to the strength of the case, right. the strength of the evidence, the likelihood of success uh, at a department trial. Um, you know, so if we go that route, there's always a risk that we lose that trial. So that's right. why we have the advocate, and, and he has a cadre of very experienced attorneys uh, who look at these and make recommendations and then like we described that review process up through the first deputy commissioner, will be the police commissioner, uh, to make sure we're getting it right and that the approach is sound. Uh, you know, the, like I said, the risk is we uh, go to a trial and lose, uh, or uh, the person goes to the Civil Service Commission or brings in Article 78 and gets reinstated. So we have to make sure that we have a sound case to bring and that it's, it's sustainable. And the other benefit of a negotiated plea. I just, wanna, I just wanna point out, the commissioner can overturn a finding of not guilty if a commissioner determines that it was found in the incorrect way, is that correct? He, he can, but then you know the risk there is then what happens next, whether right. it's the Civil Service Commission or an Article 78 proceeding. So we also have to think about what happens on appeal uh, if we bring a weak case. So there are a lot of factors that have to be considered and we, we try to take the most reasonably objective approach to get the desired result. So sometimes that's a negotiated plea where we're able to get rid of the person uh, much more quickly than we would if we went through the full trial process. If someone goes to work for another police department after voluntary separation, do they still collect their police pension here? So that, that's, uh, it depends. Right. So, uh, and, and that is not a result of the disciplinary process per se. Uh, a member of the NYPD who is entitled to a pension, even if they are terminated, by operation of state law will still collect their pension unless they are convicted at a criminal trial of a felony. So if you're convicted at a criminal trial of a felony, you're terminated, you lose your pension, we serve you with a final order of dismissal. Other separations, even though you're being separated from the police department, uh, under state civil service law, you are still collecting your pension. And, and that's not something the police commissioner can override or change the outcome on. Um, well, I'm glad we're having this hearing today. I think it's important for the public to have a level of confidence in the New York City Council and in the NYPD that these conversations happen openly and publicly so people understand what the independent, uh, what the panel uh, looked at. Uh, what the council's looking at, what this legislation uh, seeks to uh, remedy and uh, figure out for greater transparency. And uh, I just, you know, I, I really, 
It's very painful, not just for the family members involved, but for the public. When you see Daniel Pantaleo still on the job, collecting a salary, when that video was very clear about what happened, and the other officers that were involved as well. And this is about doing what's right. This is about justice. This is about ensuring that no one is above the law, no citizen, no police officer, no one. And it's my hope that these bills will hopefully help fix this from happening in the future when there are instances of misconduct and that and that we do what's right by by these families who have suffered so much and where this panel said that there are still major flaws in the disciplinary process so you know, these, I'm glad the commissioner appointed this panel. I'm glad they came back with recommendations. I'm glad the commissioner said he's accepting those recommendations. I'm glad you all are here today talking about sending a letter to the state legislature on 50A and improving this. But it, part of me wishes that it didn't take this long, you know, that these changes were made before and that people that have had to deal with so much um, grief didn't have to wait so long for a panel and for us to propose bills to see some of these important changes to happen. And I appreciate uh, you answering the questions and I look forward to continuing of a conversation. Uh, Commissioner, I, I, you and I have always worked really well together um, and I look forward to working well on this together to actually see some changes be made. So Absolutely. thank you. I wanna turn it back to the chairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm gonna to go to Council Member, Councilwoman Rose. <coughs> Thank you very much, Chair. Um, please forgive me, I have a, a cold or something. Um, and thank you, uh, Speaker Johnson, who uh, pretty much asked most of the questions I had. But I am, I and the people in my district have been impacted by the fact that it has taken an awful long time an inappropriately amount of t a long time for uh, discipline actions to be taken. And I'm, I'm specifically speaking in the case of Officer Daniel Pantaleo. Um, so I am concerned that, um, is there a timeline that guides the length of time that it can take before a disciplinary action is taken? So I, I'll jump in. So th th there's no artificial timeline. However, in a matter where there is a criminal investigation and either a prosecution or a potential prosecution by either a district attorney or the U.S. Attorney's Office, the NYPD's internal disciplinary process, or as in this case, the Civilian Complaint Review Board's process uh, for uh, their case and then bringing that to an administrative trial to impose discipline, which is different than the criminal aspect. Is there a specified time that discipline has to take place? No, so there, there's a statute of limitations for administrative disciplinary proceedings, which is 18 months, but that can be stayed uh, once we serve charges or because there's an ongoing criminal prosecution. So in this case, for four years, or almost four years, there was an ongoing criminal investigation and possible criminal prosecution by the Justice Department. So therefore, because of the pendency of that possible criminal action, the administrative action was stayed until that was resolved. Once that was resolved, then the administrative case for discipline is then allowed to move forward. But you were not mandated to have to wait for the criminal action to have occur, the criminal case to be disposed of, you could have gone on with disciplinary action before or during that time. 
We could have, but if you, you then you, I mean, listen, you, you want an outcome uh, and you want the right outcome. And so if, if, the, if it, the case is being prosecuted criminally or they're going, or in a later time, going uh, for a civil rights violation. Uh, and so you don't want to jeopardize those processes in, in the interim. And so we are almost always asked by those entities not to proceed with our administrative uh, proceedings because it will interfere with the outcome of what. But in this particular case, Commissioner, um, the Justice Department um, still has not rendered any sort of decision, and you have and we proceeded, have proceeded. Right. without. So and we waited. It, we waited. You waited four years, but it could have happened sooner. Well, but that was unusual. It really was, and and um, and. Uh, I can't think of another situation where that situation would have occurred for a whole host of reasons. But in any case, it's now back in our, our court and, and, a, and a, a trial has been, a trial date is, is, has been set. So we'll, we, we're moving forward, uh, albeit um, certainly not, to, yes. not, and not I soon enough. That the trial now is the CCRB process, right? Correct. And so could you tell me how many how frequently is it that the commissioner follows the findings of the CCRB, um, whatever their, their trial finds to be the just and cause, um, just and equal discipline? So when it, when it comes to the Civilian Complaint Review Board, I, I think a little context yeah. uh, is helpful. So when we look back, so currently uh, we look at police officers in the NYPD, uh, over 15,000 of the NYPD police officers have no civilian complaints. That's 41% of the police department. And another almost 8,000 only have one complaint. That's about 21%. When we look at substantiated complaints, uh, almost 33,000 police officers or 90% of the police department have no substantiated complaints. And uh, about 8% or 3,000 have one substantiated complaint. When we look at 2018 and we look at the cases brought by CCRB, their administrative prosecution unit, where they brought a trial against the police officer, um, the, the concurrence rate was 85%, meaning the police commissioner uh, enforced APU's recommendation 85% of the time, and that's because three of those cases uh, were not guilty. Uh, so the person went to trial, they were found not guilty, and the police commissioner went along with the determination uh, made by the trial judge. So when a case is substantiated and a discipline is recommended by CCRB, the commissioner usually follows that recommendation? So I think if you look at the independent panel report, they did a sampling of a few hundred civilian complaint cases and they found that the police commissioner uh, agreed with the findings uh, in, in most cases, when, when we break it down and we look at it, uh, you know, we also see that, like I said, the, the disciplinary concurrence rate with the administrative prosecution unit trials was 85%. Uh, one, you know, three of those were because they were uh, found not guilty at trial. Uh, the concurrence rate on other matters that, are, that, that don't go to trial, uh, that are just a board, a, a board vote and recommendation, uh, the concurrence rate there is 78%. Uh, when we look at the breakdown of those cases, uh, we see that um, the police commissioner, uh, in, in about 31 uh, of, of those cases, uh, he, uh, or a little more than half, uh, he concurs with the findings and, and the recommended penalty. Uh, in two instances last year, he increased the penalty, and in 21 instances, he uh, uh, lowered the penalty. Uh, Is there, um, are all of the disciplinary actions um, brought um, to bear by the CCRB, or is there an internal process that would, could trigger a disciplinary action without the CCRB? Oh, so, yeah. it's both. Yes. So um, would an officer's disciplinary history, what, what, how many incidents would it take in an office's disciplinary history before it would trigger an internal um, investigation and um, possibly termination? So uh, a single incident, 
uh, and it, it depends upon the nature of the incident and will determine who has jurisdiction over it. So if the incident is related to use of force, abuse of authority, discourtesy, or offensive language, the Civilian Complaint Review Board, as per the Charter, has jurisdiction over those allegations. They get those cases, they investigate them, uh, and then they will make uh, a recommendation in terms of both findings and penalties. I think it's interesting to note that you know, the Commissioner mentioned the total universe of complaints that came in uh, last year. Civilian Complaint Review Board uh, substantiated 226 complaints, uh, but they exonerated 218 and found 92 unfounded. So um, more were exonerated or unfounded. Uh, than I'm, I'm, and that's, that's I'm, I'm really glad to hear that. But um, uh, what I'm trying to get to is the fact that um, you can have an officer still in active duty that has multiple numbers of, uh, of disciplinary actions that have been taken um, prior to, um, and, and again, I'm talking about, for transparency, I'm talking about Pantaleo, who has had multiple disciplinary charges brought against him. Um, and he has not been terminated. Well, so what would trigger that internally without having to have um, a CCRB inquiry into this? So speaking generally uh, about the process, if, if a complaint is made that is investigated by the Civilian Complaint Review Board, they will investigate it. They will eventually uh, send their findings and recommendations to the police department. Independent from that, the police department, whether it's through internal affairs or... Well, would you say that, um, that an officer that has at least eight charges of, of you know, misconduct uh, against him um, should have been um, addressed by some sort of internal process that could have led to termination? So I would say it depends upon the facts and circumstances of each case. Each case will be addressed, whether it comes from the Civilian Complaint Review Board or it's a matter that is under the jurisdiction. So is discipline um, pretty much arbitrary? It is absolutely not arbitrary. Well, it, it seems as if the process then is broken. If someone can have multiple charges of misconduct and still be on the force, well, it depends whether or not they're just allegations or they've been substantiated. And then substantiated. what the level of the offense was, its severity, uh, as well as any other aggregating or mediating factors. They were substantiated. I, I'm just having a hard time understanding how discipline is meted out um, in, in, the, in the department when you have officers that have a known history. What triggers that? Uh, what triggers? So, so if, if you have an officer who's, so we monitor the officers and we look for uh, the number of, for example, civilian complaints, but we also look at their other conduct. And whatever that conduct is, maybe they're, they're, they're administrative violations, maybe they're stealing time. It could be a whole variety of, of, of issues. Um, but we monitor the, that, that it's so discipline would be progressive. And we may have officers, if you have an officer who's, who's been found guilty of, of some violation uh, or for, for being off post, those are more minor, uh, not doing the, the job, um, um, out of work but not reporting in and stealing time, it, it, it depends on what it is. But in any case, we will follow that officer, we look at his history or her history, and, and at some point, you know, we will put them on, um, we could put them on dismissal probation, depending on the severity of any number one, any of those particular, or the conglomerate, the, 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 the fact that he had multiple violations, and we violations dealt with each one. Violations of the rule book? No, no, no. It's, it's, we're looking at the individual officer and what it is they've done. Mm -hmm. uh, and we look at their evaluations uh, based on, you know, from their commanding officers. Uh, so if we find that this officer has a history and is, and is a problem, we will be, we have progressive discipline and we will hold them accountable for it. And ultimately it could get to the, to the point where 
we put them on dismissal probation. Dismissal, dismissal probation really means that in addition to whatever the penalties were for any one or more of those charges that we brought them up on, or any one of the command disciplines that they had, uh, in addition to those penalties that they served, uh, dismissal probation says that if you engage in, while you're on probation, dismissal probation, which usually is for a year, um, if during that period you, you um, engage in uh, some other misconduct, we can terminate you. And we don't have to go through a, uh, a process. We can do that automatically, the fact that you're on uh, dismissal probation. We don't have to have a hearing. We don't have to have a trial. We can just terminate you. Um, that's rare, those, those, those circumstances, not the dismissal probation, but, but where you have an officer that, that has multiple events and goes out that way. Typically, there's something serious enough that they've engaged in, that, in, in, in one event that we then put them on the dismissal probation if, in fact, that event was more serious then we might terminate them on that one, as, as, as chief, the chief pointed out, on that one instance, in that one, um, for that one yeah, no, no. Uh, Thank you. type of conduct. But I, also, I think you may have some inaccurate information about the number of substantiated cases if we're talking about the same case. Uh, my understanding is uh, that individual has one prior substantiated uh, misconduct allegation for uh, making a pedestrian stop that was not legally justified, uh, but that was the only prior substantiated disciplinary history, whether it was from a civilian complaint or internal policy violation. I would like to continue my conversation with you offline because my time is up. But um, I just want to say uh, it's um, in light of transparency, it's very telling that we knew everything about the young man's criminal record um, who took the video, but we were not able to get any of the information about the officer that was implicated in the death of Eric Garner. There has to be something done about transparency and accountability. Thank you, Debbie. And let me just, I just want to point out a fact on substantiated and unsubstantiated cases. Um, and because I, those words are being thrown out around a lot. And just because a case is unsubstantiated, it does not mean that uh, there was not a case there. Uh, it might mean that there was not enough proof to bring, you know, more discipline. But if there's a pattern of okay. unsubstantiated cases, it doesn't mean a person was exonerated. It means that, you know, am I correct? Uh, no, you're absolutely you right. It, okay. doesn't mean you, it just means you couldn't prove it. We just couldn't prove right. it, right? right? But, but, but it doesn't mean that nothing important. happened. Right, but occurred. due process is still important. And then I just want to hop back in because you talked about CCRB a little bit. And the panel talked about the uh, departmental, departmental Advocates Office and undue influence specifically that could be occurring in that office. The panel report indicated that the department advocate may be subjected to improper influence in particular because he asks questions about certain cases after he attends social events where disciplinary cases are informally discussed. He said he was encouraged to increase communications with unions. Why is it appropriate for there to be informal conversations about these cases at all at events? Well, so if I'm at I a party, they mentioned that, but, but this, is, is, this is not it, Donovan it, Richards making it, is it up. Not, it is hold not. Hold up, hold up, hold up. This is not Donovan Richards making this stuff up. This is what the panel came back with. Up. And this is also what Kevin Richardson, who's in charge of the department, that particular uh, department uh, specified to the panel. So do you think it's appropriate at any time uh, for conversations to occur on disciplinary cases outside of the realms of, a, of an office. It's not appropriate, but you, know, you never know what people are gonna ask you or you know, you ask a, they ask you a question, you can, if it's about a case, you shouldn't be having a conversation. The, 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 your response should be, I can't discuss that with you. Right. It's as simple as that. But I mean, it seems listen, like we, that may we not We all go to, right. to these events mm -hmm. as, as executives in the department. We attend mm -hmm. 
you know, a plethora of, 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 of you know, fraternal organization events yep. and all of that. The union people are there and so forth. So, but, but it, you know, you just, you know, this is not rocket science. Do you, you think just, it's appropriate? And I stopped, no, getting, it's not appropriate. I stopped getting a lot of invitations, it, it, by the way, so I'm feeling a certain way. Uh, but but no, what not, I will it, say also is do you think it's appropriate that uh, the commissioner attends those events at all? And, and no, I don't think it's it. inappropriate. No, I mean, I, listen, you can go to these events. I mean, he's a senior official in the department. The fact that he happens to be the department advocate makes it, you know, he has to be much more cautious about what he does when he's there and what those conversations are about. But, and they shouldn't. They and shouldn't I agree. I'm, I'm trying to put myself in his shoes. He works yeah. for the department. I don't want him to feel like he can't have a conversation and he's just boxed in. Um, but. I, I do think, you know, that it does invite a level of undue influence well, uh, it's, to the it's, process. It's, it's, it's it, can, it can. It can. Yeah. So I think the panel uh, had recommended that, uh, for instance, if an individual was to ask about the case, uh, a case at an event specifically, that, you know, perhaps uh, the department advocate would log that information. And I'm not saying I trust that 100%. Um, because how do we know that anybody would log that information? But do you, are, are you examining a process uh, for him when he attends events? Should there be another individual attending with him uh, to make sure that they take it, notes? And I think that that's something the panel recommended at the very least. Once again, I don't want him to feel as if he's boxed in and he can't have a conversation because we're all human. But what I don't want is him to be at a party slapping fives and having conversations on um, a disciplinary case um, and well, undue influence being. I, I suspect part you of won't that. you won't find that. So, <laughs> yeah, I think that's okay. But but it is something that we can talk about as part of our. Uh, our but the but the commissioner did agree. Yes. To do this in the recommendation. Sure, so is this process going to be put in place? Yeah, to that's part that? of what the uh, the implementation working group is going to address. But yeah. I think the panel specifically said that uh, they suggested that we have guidelines with respect to um, what types of events uh, the decision makers within the within the discipline process attend. That we have guidelines, that we have protocols, and that we have some type of a tracking or logging system, and that's specifically what we're going to begin to address in the uh, the implementation working group, which I believe begins in, in right, right after in we 45 get out of here. minutes. Oh, really? You're not leaving in 45 minutes. <laughs> Looks like the point. Um, <laughs> but 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 then and then I just want to add to that. Um, yeah. The report also indicated that the commissioner himself sometimes inquires about cases or expresses his opinion um, while the, D, D, the DAO is reviewing cases. How often does that take place? And do you think that that adds a level of undue influence to the process as well? Yeah, I, I can't answer that. I don't know. You can't? I doubt it. Ole, no, you I doubt well, it. I mean, there's, I mean, I think that the, what the commissioner is saying, putting a number on how many yeah, communications, not. he's not saying that there is, un, he can't speak to the undue influence, which there is no undue influence. I mean, again, we describe, But do you think the commissioner uh, calling downstairs to inquire about a case, do you think that could add a level? No, I, no. I'll, I'll explain why. You know, a pressure? I mean, the, the, com the, commissioner, the commissioner is the the head of the NYPD. He's mm -hmm. called upon routinely to comment about mm -hmm. cases that are of significant public interest, to put blinders on and, and separate himself from the day-to-day -day workings and significant cases uh, uh, affecting the public would be the absolute wrong approach. I think the important you, piece is, and we described in uh, the commissioner and the chief and, 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 the, and Commissioner Prunty described the process in which there are multiple layers. Now, although there's a recommendation, there's an investigation by Internal Affairs, there's a recommendation by CCRB or Department Advocate's Office. The first Deputy Commissioner reviews that recommendation. Ultimately, it goes back to the Police Commissioner to review that, that, that recommendation and be the final arbiter. It would be illogical for the Police Commissioner to influence a case that he's ultimately the final arbiter on on, on disciplining. So I, I don't believe that's what's yeah. occurring, and I think it's a vital part and, of it. And I'm not questioning the, the, the commissioner's integrity, because I think he has shown a, a great level of integrity since we've been here. But I do think that calling to inquire about a case could be perceived 
as undue influence, and I think that the panel acknowledged that. Well, uh, I think it, I, I, I acknowledge that it was raised in the report, mm -hmm. but I think ultimately the police commissioner has great confidence in the independence and the competence of the executives that are in charge of the discipline system, and there are significant uh, layers of oversight in that process. All right, I'm going to go to uh, Councilmember Deutsch now. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. So uh, firstly, I just want to say I've been, I've been sitting here since the beginning of the hearing and listening to the dialogue back and forth on several of the, of the, of the bills being heard today. And it's very important to have this open dialogue uh, on and offline. Um, so I just want to say for the record before I go to my question is that, you know, the NYPD is probably the most scrutinized agency uh, in New York City. And it used to be in the past that the internal and the operations and procedures within the NYPD was based on policy. And over the last years, we, um, here in the New York City Council, we've been legislating more on issues that affect um, New Yorkers within the NYPD. And we are holding offices uh, more accountable. And yes, we do need to get rid of the bad apples and work on these issues to make sure that um, um, things, things, it's more level when it comes to the community, the city council, and the NYPD. But as uh, was mentioned before, that an officer has great power, an officer has great responsibility. And in the meantime, I just want to say for the record that having a job where you have a pretty high suicide rates, uh, whether you're a police officer who's very stressful, a very stressful job, or even a retired uh, officer. Uh, we just had a, recently a um, retired um, MOS who killed herself. And we tend not to look or have uh, speak, speak about these things, how we could bring in more resources uh, to those offices. And when you have someone, uh, an officer, um, who has that stressful job, and we're constantly speaking about different ways to legislate, which is extremely, extremely important to have um, that accountability, but we also need to talk about that offices need and must get paid a living wage. Because when someone uh, signs up, for a job that puts their life at risk, puts their family's lives at risk, they need to get paid, a fair pay. And I think that we need to talk about it, especially now before the budget, um, and work with the unions, and work with these offices, and work with the council, and work with the administration to finally, finally get this done. Um, so, you know, it hurts me when I sit here and just talking about people, talking about the men and women who put their lives on the line and have more stress when they can't pay their bills, when they can't put, put food on the table, when they can't provide for the families. And that's very stressful, not only for them, it's, fr it's stressful for people that look at them from the outside and to say, how do they do it each and every day? How do they go to work and have so much responsibility? And when they get home, and when they have to buy clothing or diapers or formula, they can't, they can't afford it. Um, so I just wanted to say that for the record. So my question now is with the, um, most recently we had the, the incident with Jasmine uh, Headley, where the officers came in and responded to the call. I just wanted to ask as a follow-up of what happened um, to those officers, what was the outcome, if you could speak about that. And also, what do you think needs to be changed um, in regards to how the police respond to a very sensitive case? I saw the video, and uh, I, you know, I usually, there's always three sides to every story. But when I see the video, I said, you know, to me, having five children, two grandchildren, there's no excuse when a baby is grabbed away from a mother's arm, uh, from a mother's arms while she's laying on the floor. So um, I, th I think as a result of the incident, significant policy changes have gone into effect. We've, um, 
This is us together with HRA. HRA has augmented their internal policies to limit the number of cases where uh, they call the NYPD to the scene of one of their facilities. They instituted, I, I believe, a policy where a supervisor is brought uh, to the situation before a call is made to uh, for emergency re uh, first responders. As the police department, we instituted a policy of having a supervisor respond to uh, the, an HRA facility if we are called. Uh, so um, I believe there may be something else that I'm missing, but. Yeah, but it was the supervisor primarily. Uh, and I believe there was a training component as well. But I, there was another piece, I'm sorry, I'm just failing to recall. Yeah. But uh, we did institute, both HRA and the NYPD instituted uh, policies uh, after that incident, uh, and yeah. All right, just yeah. So, what, so what happened after that? I mean, what happened with the officers? What was the was their punishment? Was there sensitivity training? Um, is the officer required to work in a play group with kids uh, for what happened? Like, what happened after that? Yeah, I'm not sure where we are. I can find out for you. Okay, so uh, yeah, I'd, I'd like to Other know. Than what we're uh, yeah, I just want to know a follow up uh, to that. And uh, I have one more question, which has um, can go a little bit off topic. Um, so you have in the NYPD, within the NYPD, you have the homeless outreach unit. Um, and in the city, you have also what's called breaking ground. So when you call 301, breaking ground comes out and uh, um, makes uh, contact with the person who's maybe sleeping on the streets or the homeless person sleeping on a subway. And there have been an uh, unbelievable tool here in New York City. So I actually have the first time um, here in New York City, because I'm coming up with this uh, working with Steve Banks, we're having a training for first responders uh, on how to communicate with people, with homeless people living on the streets. Because what happens is, as New Yorkers, we always complain that the administration is not doing enough but you do have people that work, that volunteer in community boards, um, go to community council meetings, go to civic meetings. So people like to, to get involved. So without having the training that pe those people who are passing a homeless person or someone riding on the subway don't know how to interact. They may give that person a dollar, but they don't know how to interact um, and just try to reach out and what resources they could provide uh, what information they can give that person who's sleeping in the streets or sleeping on the subway. So we're having, I'm having a training in a few weeks from now with, um, uh, with DHS, two first responders throughout the city of New York on how to interact and how to try to build a relationship with someone who's living in the street to provide them with the right services. Um, that being said, so breaking ground does outstanding work. Now, with the NYPD homeless outreach, do you feel that something needs to be changed with, ha with how they are working with homeless people sleeping in the subways? Because I've, I've used the subway um, over the last month, and, and you see people laying on the car, on, yeah. on the chairs, you see people urinating, and a, writing a summons really doesn't mean much. Uh, if someone doesn't have ID or if someone may be undocumented. So what is the purpose of the unit of homeless outreach within the NYPD, number one? And number two, do you think there needs to be some type of reform to better not only issue, not issue summonses, but try to work together with DHS to actually give them mental health and give them, give them shelter? Uh, New Yorkers are really fed up when they go on the trains and the subways and there's urine all over the place. And if I have to sit down on, on a chair in the subway, I, I put on my gloves because I don't know if someone just urinated on the chair because there's no bathrooms or people are just laying down and urinating. And just a few weeks ago, I, the whole cab just emptied out. So we are, I mean, with, through our transit district, we are moving people off the, off the, out of the cars. But, you know, we're trying not to, to make arrests. We're trying to connect with other services that might be available. That's not always something that, uh, that the individuals who, who we're moving are willing to accept. So that, that makes it a, a bit more of a challenge. 
Now, now the, the new the group that you mentioned, I don't, I'm not familiar with. Uh, so if you call 311, breaking ground is yeah. mandated to respond within an hour okay. to that location, and they, it's very important to call 311 because they actually take notes and they build a relationship over time offering uh, shelter to that individual. So I think it's important for homeless outreach within the NYPD to work with breaking ground, to work together because it's not about issuing summonses and those summonses probably don't go anywhere and if there's a warrant oh, and then sense. you end up taking someone else, someone in who just doesn't have right. the funds or resources or has a mental illness. So I, I think we should do a better job and get the homeless people out of the trains, off the streets yes. and into shelter. And um, by working with the NYPD and working with Breaking Ground and working with, um, with Department of Homeless Services and HRA, I think we, we must um, do better for, for, for New York City and work together and, um, and put these people into, into shelter. So I know that in my district on Sheepshead Bay Road, we used to have almost two dozen homeless people. And I went out there three, four, sometimes five days a week speaking to them myself, knowing them by first name. And there was one individual who was out in the street for years and building a relationship with him. He's now in a, he's now in a um, regular apartment and he gets the mental health resources. If we put enough effort by working together, not just the administration, because they're not doing a good enough job, but working with the NYPD, working in partnership with, com with the community, we could, we could make a great impact and we need to get them off the streets and we need to make yeah. the quality of life in New York City better for, better for everyone. Well, Thank you. Well, I will follow up because you and I should have a, a sidebar conversation. There are a couple of issues that we can discuss both with respect to uh, transit moving into neighborhood policing from that perspective with, with officers who are, should be providing other types of services. Uh, but also uh, to, uh, to talk about uh, New York City Thrive and, and the work that Commissioner Herman, who was formerly with us, is now going to be running that so we could have a conversation about what type of uh, services uh, we could connect to, to, uh, and coordinate on to, to really address the issue you raised. Thank you very much. I look forward Thank to that, you. Commissioner. And also, I also um, want to ask the Chair as being the Public Safety Committee for five years, that we should have a hearing on um, MOS suicide, members of the service, the suicide rate and what resources we can bring in uh, to them, for them. And finally, um, I just want to mention what I said that we've originally, fair pay to every single officer, very important. Thank you, and I will, we will have a lot more to say on that, actually, on the uh, MOS. we working on a bill with Councilmember Levine, actually. Um, I want to go to Councilmember Cohen. Uh, thank you, Chair Richards. Thank you, Chair Lanceman. Uh, thank you for the panel for hanging tough. Um, I just uh, I want to follow up on the 50A stuff because I, I guess really we're you know these this package of bills and we're essentially here because I think that 50A is is sort of warping I think the the disciplinary process. Um, and, or making it uh, difficult for the public to have confidence if, if, uh, you know, with the lack of transparency. You know, just as a preliminary question, and I, you know, I'm, I may, I'm not as knowledgeable as, as other members of the committee, so I apologize, but I don't know, what is, the, what is the rationale for 50A? When does it make sense that an officer should, you know, his identity should protect, be protected, the, the facts should be protected, and when, when like, it's, I don't think it's universal. I mean, we talked about DV. I guess I could see an instance where we want to protect the privacy of the victim, but in a, in a, in a, in a DV case, why are, what is the rationale? And I understand it's not your policy, it's state law, but I'd like to, if you think it's a defensible policy, maybe it's not, or is there a rationale that you're aware of? I mean, there was an underlying rationale that was pointed to by the legislature back in, I think it was 1974 when they passed 50A, and that was, um, you know, an effort to protect police officers from being threatened, humiliated, harassed, either on the stand in the context of litigation, or as the courts later ruled and recognized, also outside of litigation. Um, so that was the underlying rationale. And you're right to identify this is not our policy at all. This is a state law that we must abide by. Having said that, 
we've been very vocal, as we said at the outset of this, that we're very much in favor of amending that state law so that we can increase the transparency. And I think the police commissioner has been very clear about this. You know, we need to build trust with the communities that we serve. One of the ways we do that is by increasing transparency and by increasing a sense of accountability. And we're very much in favor of that. So in response to your question, that was the original one of the original intents of the legislation when they passed 58. So in other, in other words, the concern is it, when someone's being prosecuted that the officer's disciplinary record would be used to impeach him on the stand. I think it was more a concern that unsubstantiated allegations, things that had not been proven or had not yet gone through the system would be used in some way to improperly impeach the officer. But that, but then again, it's, it's a broader sense too. It's also that officers don't in general get harassed or humiliated or, or um, threatened. Um, uh, what I also didn't understand, there was a dialogue back and forth. Th does 50A apply uh, when someone is no longer a police officer? In general, I don't think the department takes the position that we apply 50A in that circumstance. That you do not? We do not. But are those, those records are not, are, are not widely available, is my understanding. Is that, is that would no, you, you, would, you would turn over no, the disciplinary I, records I of officers who are no longer no, part? I think, no. I think it's important to understand, too, that there, even if you put aside 50A, you also have the freedom of information law. and those. That also applies here. So that's an entirely separate state law that we have to abide but, by. But in, under either circumstances, will you turn over uh, the, the disciplinary records of officers who are no longer employed by the NYPD? No, because then we have to apply the FOIL statute. That's what I'm trying to explain to you. Well, FOIL is not a bar to disclosing those records? It often can be. It often can be because FOIL has its own separate set of exemptions. For example, there's a privacy exemption, there's a life and safety exemption, there's a pending criminal proceeding or other proceeding. So there are all kinds of provisions within the FOIL. But you, do, but you don't parse whether they do apply or they don't apply. You have a blanket policy. You don't apply. You don't. You will not disclose uh, the the uh, disciplinary records of officers who are not part of the NYPD. Period. No, we apply the exemptions under FOIL to those records. That's what I'm trying to explain. So you think FOIL is a, univer is a universal bar to? I'm not saying that. I'm saying we would analyze it under FOIL. It does, it does that, so to, if I serve a FOIL request tomorrow, will you parse some you'll disclose and some you won't? Or, or is Sorry. it a, uni a, a we blanket? Will, we'll analyze it under that statute and apply the appropriate Well, exemption. let me ask this. Have you ever turned over <laughs> the disciplinary records uh, for someone where you f who does not work for the NYPD anymore and you found that FOIL did not apply? I can't answer that. I don't know the answer to that off the top of my head. I'd have to go back and look at what we've done. But will someone agree to get back to us to let us know? We can let you know, sure. Okay, I, I would appreciate that. Um, uh, the, the disaggregation question, too, like, uh, I wonder, like, it does sound like there's a, sort of a, a broad general agreement that, that, that enhanced transparency is good for the department. I, I think that we're advocates for it. Um, but it does seem a little bit like the, 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 the NYPD is taking the position of, of you know, uh, uh, for the officer. In other words, if, uh, like under the example that uh, Councilmember Lansman said, rather than saying, it, it, like, it, the right to privacy should be asserted by the officer as opposed to the NYPD in a case where there's a good faith b belief that it should be turned over, uh, you know, the, us making that request, whether it's subject to, I mean, the interpretive, the, is not the role of the courts to interpret 50A, uh, not in, in, in an open question. If you have a desire to, as, as you're representing, to turn over records, but you think it's possible that 50A, why don't we, uh, we could agree right now together, to, well, let's run a test. Somebody else will sue if they want to sue and we could let the courts decide, rather than it seems you taking a very, you know, even though the commissioner talked about a narrow interpretation, it seems that you're taking a fairly broad uh, 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 look at 50A and saying that it could apply. If it's not clear, it does apply, and, and unless it's absolutely clear it does apply, I think that the, that the default position should be it doesn't apply and let someone else Take us to court and decide if it does or it doesn't. I don't think we're doing that. I think we're applying the statute to the particular 
circumstances and we're applying it and we are um, therefore withholding the records under the provisions of the current state of the law. And our interpretation of that statute has been um, affirmed repeatedly, especially in the past four years, in appellate court decisions. So that's what we're doing. There's no default position. It's not an, an interpretation. We are applying the statute that we must presently abide by. Having said that, we'd like to see changes to that statute so that we can have more transparency. And I, I think just to add to that, I, we, we did attempt to go further. So when, when I make the distinction in, in, in the testimony, I point to the fact that, yes, there is 50A, but there's also two injunctions in place. It's two situations where the police commissioner decided to go further, to disclose more. One of the bills is, is body-worn camera footage, but the other bill is actually reporting on discipline. Right, and those those cases are the subjects of injunction. So we're not hiding behind 50A. We're trying to interpret it both in you, you know based on the recommendations of the uh, independent review panel, b based on what I think we both agree with. Uh, but we are being enjoined, and we are trying to push it, uh, you know, where we can. Yes, but in response to the question from the speaker, you thought it might be analogous that the the TRO. But we do, and, and is stating that as a reason not to support this legislation. But we don't know if it's analogous. Let a judge decide. Well, Why is the I'm, NYPD what deciding? I'm saying, what I'm saying is those cases are currently before the court. I not, know, but they not, don't apply. You, you, you vocalized an objection to this legislation based on that TRO, but we don't know if that no, TRO said, will apply. What I said was similar issues are currently before the court, right? And we have, we have court decisions, recent court decisions, cases that are currently before the court. And what I'm saying to the speaker is that we agree with the fundamental principle of this bill. If, if the 50A amendments that we're advocating for actually go into effect, we will be able to produce more than what the bill is asking for. So this isn't an issue of we're trying to not give what the bill is asking for, but we're making logical decisions based on cases that are currently in litigation, where they're going based on recent interpretations of 50A. Thank, uh, I appreciate that. Uh, Commissioner, I'm very fond of Oleg, despite this uh, interaction. <laughs> and I, if, if for just one second, there has been a dialogue between the, and it's, I know it's off topic, but I just want to go on record, a dialogue between the commissioner and I regarding manpower at the 50th precinct. Uh, and I, I need to follow up on that, because uh, although the, I'm getting nice letters back, I'm not getting more manpower, and I'm very concerned about that. Uh, and conditions of the physical plant at the 5-2, uh, that, that Precinct House is holding mo substantially more officers than it ever held, uh, and the conditions there are really not appropriate. We need some capital work at that station. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you. Miller, then Lanceman, then back to Co-Chair Lanceman. Thank you, Chairs, and thank you, Commissioner, for coming up. So, wow. We're here to talk mostly about 50A here. So I, I want to follow up on what Councilman McCone was just saying and, and the speaker is, is this, in my mind at the very least, and based on uh, uh, the original kind of execution of 50A and some of the more recent cases that it was more of a matter of, in, interpretation uh, because it appears that the NYPD was applying 58 differently from other law enforcement agencies throughout the, the, the state of New York. Uh, would you find that to be the case? I'm, I'm not aware of uh, different so. interpretations from other agencies throughout the- Other agencies were, uh, asked to and turned over information pertaining to discipline, to your knowledge? Not, not that I'm aware of. Uh, they, they would also be bound by 50A as well if they're within New York State. Yeah, but um, who, would, who, who would enforce that in the state if, 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 if an agency was willing to turn over the information and there was no um, there was no dissent from officers or those representing the officers? Well, I can tell you with respect to our experience, when we have tried, for example, to release the body-worn camera footage, 
for, uh, with respect to the disciplinary summaries, um, we've been taken to court by the, uh, the PBA. PBA. So, let me ask you, uh, how, much, how much of this, the conversation that we've had this morning around uh, 50A and, and discipline uh, um, is actually 50A and, 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 and how much is a matter of collective bargaining? I don't think Specifically, as we talk about discipline, and we talked about some of the time frames that were in there, and, and, and I know I'm going to put on my labor former union president hat and, and say that I know that there are provisions that say that certain discipline has to be executed within X amount of time, and that amount of time has been negotiated unless there is a, uh, an investigation going on. Um, but some of the cases that we talked about right. today clearly have exceeded yeah. right. those those time periods, although I know that every collective bargaining agreement is different, so I, I, I'm not going to assume. You did say uh, a year and a half or 18 months or something like that, and I, I, that's... Yeah, so I, that was, I, I don't think any of what we've discussed today is subject to collective bargaining. I think everything we've been talking about either falls under 50A or Article 75, which determines uh, uh, the process for administrative trials. Uh, the statute of limitations for an administrative proceeding is 18 months. So there's a whole body of law that pertains to civil service and these disciplinary adjudications. Uh, th there are some nuances in the collective bargaining agreements about representation. Uh, but everything we're talking about today has is, is been based upon uh, state or city law. So, okay, that's, um, that's something else that, that that's a whole nother view and without having the agreement in front of me, I, I certainly couldn't say that. But the, um, the panel had concluded that it was unable to properly order discipline outcomes due to in part PD's data collection or lack thereof and, and, and maintenance. As we move forward, and I know you said that there are some things that you're putting in place. I looked at some of the 13 recommendations, and in that hat, I, half of them, I, you know, they're okay. The other half, I, I just think convolutes the process and, and undermines uh, the integrity of the workforce that we represent here in the city. And, and I value civil service uh, and those servants uh, probably more than anyone else, but we're talking about transparency. We're also talking about, um, it was some mention of, of, of discipline, right? And, and the purpose of the discipline is corrective. Without transparency, without all the things that we talked about today, we can't be corrective. And I, what I see is we're, we're kind of walking it back, we're kind of justifying the system that we're in Aside from the recommendations, what do you see possible um, can be done in order to expedite some of these cases, in order to, um, to obviously they're very sensitive, but to maintain public integrity and, and the character of the department yeah. What are you doing? What can we do now? Well, I, listen. I, what we, what we, what the right now, since we're talking about the panel, we are going to implement the recommendations that they've that they've made, and how we do that remains to be seen in some cases. Um, but there'll be discussions within the implementation group about where we're going and how we're going to get there. That's that's the plan, and. Um, you know, obviously, some of the discussions we've had here today, most of the discussion around 50A, which is one of the one of the, the, the comments that was made by the panel, um, and the matrix and, and those sorts of things, are issues and DV uh, uh, in instances and cases. Those are some things that that are on our radar and have been on our radar for some time. So, those discussions uh, will will probably will probably get traction faster than some of the other issues, perhaps. But uh, all of it will be part of of the implementation 
um, landscape as we go forward. So in, in, in terms of discipline being implemented, uh, have you, when examining the data, have, have, have you applied that data to, to um, departments throughout the region? Is there, uh, and I know that you said that, that you, there was some numbers that you quoted and that was quoted and, 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 uh, and then there was numbers that were substantiated and unsubstantiated and so forth. Are those consistent with um, the other departments throughout the New York State region? And are they consistent with other agencies uh, throughout New York City, uh, municipal agencies? Well, well, no, we haven't looked at discipline except in, in our own department with respect to so what discipline. So w the point I'm getting at, and, 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 and because some of, uh, some of the infractions, uh, whether or not you, you uh, uh, not being truthful under oath and 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 uh, and uh, outside activities that may uh, impair you from doing your job or prevent you from doing your job job in a certain way, um, that happens throughout municipal employment. It happens in other agencies as well. The point is, are, are, are people being disciplined differently within the NYPD um, from other municipal agencies or other uh, law enforcement agencies locally? We haven't looked at other law enforcement agencies locally or other city agencies. We, we are looking at our specific disciplinary process, and we have been since 2014, and we've made adjustments as we've gone along, so it's been a process. Um, and, and we continue to do that. Uh, we're looking at... So, in... The, in we, we, you know, what we're doing is looking at the conduct of our officers, and, we, and the conduct of our officers are driving what we're doing um, and the outcomes of the discipline and how officers respond to it, all of those things uh, within the sphere of, of the NYPD. So I, I, so we, I think you said, and I think we all agree that the, the, the purpose of, of, of discipline is, is corrective and that we, you guys are operating with a system of, of progressive discipline. And um, I recently read that there was an officer who had uh, not just multiple complaints, multiple substantiated complaints and uh, a few settlements and was recently in in the paper and and, and how, how how does that happen uh, I'm not if, sure. if, if if discipline if if this is progressive discipline they are like instances person was charged person was disciplined how does it continue to happen well i'm, I'm not sure what case you're talking about so it's a little bit too vague to uh, i can't comment on on that example Okay, so, um, so uh, yeah, I was talking about something that was recently, it, in fact, it was in this week's, one of the uh, publications this week, and it talked about that. But again, uh, so in, in a case of, of a person, um, when we talk about discipline and, and, and what that may end up being, is there a case where someone, uh, how often is someone assigned to desk duties because of aggression? Or for whatever reason, not being, other than physical, not being able to perform duties. Is there, is, is there a, a time when folks are, how often are people placed on desk duty after discipline, not during? So you, you, you raise a, a couple of issues here. So let me take a step back and talk about the beginning of the disciplinary process, which would be some act that, that, that may be misconduct or corruption or some allegation or some triggering event that then prompts a response and an investigation. And it could be by an executive. It could be a captain. It could be internal affairs. It could be CCRB. Uh, those investigations will run their course. Depending upon the nature of the event, uh, the, the severity of the event, uh, the likelihood uh, or the potential for disciplinary action being imposed, even at that early stage, <clears throat> sometimes summary action will be taken. So immediately upon the event, 
a police officer may be suspended or put on modified duty, where we take their firearms, we restrict what they can do, and we assign them. As a matter of discipline, is anyone then placed on restricted duty? Yeah, uh, not re restricted is for a medical yeah, reason. Well. So yes, oftentimes as a penalty, uh, depending upon the facts and circumstances and the nature and the severity of the offense, as well as any aggregating and uh, aggravating and mitigating factors, the final penalty may include additional suspension days, additional vacation days, uh, change in duty status, uh, dismissal probation, and separation or forced separation. So in the case that I mentioned that you weren't familiar with, but there were multiple, potentially multiple, multiple like infractions, that person could potentially as, as, a, as a matter of discipline from those prior incidents could have been placed on some form of uh, it, it, it could have been, but we have to look at the facts, the particular case, the timeline of events, uh, what the misconduct was, when it occurred. Uh, there are a lot of things we'd have to look at. So we were kind of speaking in the abstract because we don't have the details on the matter you're speaking of. All right. Thank you so much, and, and look forward to the implementation <laughs> of the uh, panel's um, suggestion, and look forward to working with you on it. Thank you. Thank you, Chairs. Back to Co-Chair uh, Lanceman, and I'm going to dig up that case. Thank you. So um, now let's take a look at the other uh, bills that, that I am sponsoring with um, Councilmember Richards. These are the bills requiring reporting and disclosure on three different offenses, um, resisting arrest, assault in the second degree, and obstructing governmental administration. These are, um, I think, 3707 and 3708. And I'm uh, a little confused by the department's response and, and the basis for its uh, objection to, to, to these bills. First, the foundation for this legislation is the fact that um, these charges, resisting arrest, obstruction of government administration, and assault in the second degree, which is I think it's section three, which relates to assault in the second degree when you're assaulting a, a police officer, these are unfortunately um, very commonly used as a catch-all when there is no other basis to arrest someone um, and the circumstance arises where an officer or officers feel like someone ticked them off or mouthed off to them or needs to be taught a lesson. And very often these offenses end up not being charged or ultimately prosecuted by the district attorney's office. Now, look, and in fact, resisting arrest is the 15th most commonly arrested misdemeanor in the city of New York. I think this is for last year. Obstructing government administration is the second, um, is the 17th most commonly arrested misdemeanor. The data we have for assault too is, is not limited just to assaults uh, on police officers, but it is the most commonly arrested felony uh, in, in New York City and the fourth most common arrest overall. So your objection to these reporting bills, as you stated. We do not oppose the reporting of broad categories relating to these crimes, but we would be unable to provide certain detailed data points required by this bill. And look, uh, if it wasn't clear, what we want is the NYP to justify these arrests so that they are not being used as catch-alls just to um, uh, harass people and let folks know on the street, who's boss? Yeah, so right. I'll, I'll, I well, guess I'll start I wanna, with, I want to just, but, but I, your, I think I, I just want to log in our objection to that characterization. That's noted. We do not, this is your testimony. We do not oppose the reporting of broad categories relating to these crimes, but we would be unable to provide certain detailed data points required by this bill. For example, the department can report the number of arrests for these charges, disaggregated by borough, precinct, age, race, and gender of the arrestee. Okay. However, we cannot capture data on the specific underlying charge that an arrestee resisted, the relationship of an arrestee charged with a resisting arrest to another individual whose arrest they resisted, the nature of injuries in a felony assault case, whether the district attorney declined to prosecute a case, the entity which operates the building where the arrest transpired, the ethnic origin or specific gender identity of the arrestee, or the specific government function 
obstructed. I want to focus on three of these, because I, I, I can't understand how it's possible that you cannot collect this data. So first, however, we cannot capture data on the specific underlying charge that an arrestee resisted. Now, I don't understand how that's not possible, because I don't understand how you'd be able to charge and prosecute a case for resisting arrest without articulating some basis for the arrest in the first place. Sure. So uh, maybe it's just the lack of clarity in the way you've, you've drafted this provision. What this is basically asking for is the charge for which the person arrested was charged with resisting. So let's assume you arrest a person under multiple charges. How would an officer determine which particular charge that individual resisted? Now, if what we're looking to clarify is maybe write it in a way that is reportable, we're certainly willing to work with you to get there. Okay, I well, think. I understand. We wouldn't expect an officer to be a mind reader. If someone is charged with four different underlying offenses to be able to determine which one of those was the one that the person who was arrested for resisting arrest was, was resisting over, but maybe they'd be able to just identify what all four of the underlying charges. That, that's the kind of I mean, but that, that's, confusion that you're concerned about? That's the kind of confusion. I'm, okay. I'm glad that you agree with me on the confusion, and I'm, I think we can work past it and figure out a meaningful way to, to give you meaningful data. Okay. Well, we'll work on that. The second one. However, we cannot capture data on the nature of injuries in a felony assault case. Um, as you know, assault in the second degree Section, subsection three, with intent to prevent a, a person is guilty of assault in the second degree when with intent to prevent a peace officer or a police officer from performing a lawful duty, he or she causes physical injury to such peace officer or police officer. So I don't know how you would be able to charge, let alone prosecute, um, this offense without being able to articulate what is the physical injury that's a basic element of the offense. So why would the police department not be able to provide us data on the physical injury that when, when it is charged, uh, arresting someone for um, assault in the second degree? I think, I think the way that it can be done, again, drafting, I think the way it can be done is to capture broad categories of injuries in the way that we report on use of force and pursuant to a council bill and we would be able to link the, uh, the offense charged with a category of injury. That's what we do now with our use of force reporting. I believe that's something we can do here, but uh, however the way it's written again, it would seem that we would list individual injuries. We would disaggregate those injuries by a precinct. Uh, if there's a particular precinct that has only one such incident, <coughs> are we singling out an officer and talking about their medical conditions? I, mm -hmm. I don't know. I think there's a way to achieve the goal of that provision, but not as it's written. Okay. Just for our edification, what are, the, what are some of the, cate the broad categories of injuries that, that I think, are uh, reportable? You're talking use of force? Well, reporting? You, you, you rose yeah, up. You, I think uh, what it has is um, physical injury, I may be muddying the words a little. I think it has uh, serious physical injury, and there's a third category as well uh, that I can't Well, that, if that's what you're contemplating, I don't think that's going to cut it because... Well, like I said, I'm, we don't normally negotiate bills at the table. I raise the objection. I understand what you're trying to get to now, and I think we can work through it. Okay. Well, that's good to hear. And then the third one is... Um, in relation to the charge of uh, obstructing governmental administration of second degree. However, we cannot capture data on specific government function obstructed. Again, I don't know how you'd be able to charge someone, let alone prosecute them, let alone convict someone for um, obstructing governmental administration without being able to articulate the government function that they obstructed. Well, the government function that the individual obstructed is certainly articulated. It's articulated in the narrative portion of an arrest report. Uh, capturing the data, obviously, I, I, I would hope you know so through all of the bills we've negotiated that that is not a meaningful way to capture data, is to do word searches of a narrative. It may not capture all of the data accurately because officers will describe things in different ways using different words. Uh, there is no system now, a checkbox type system, the way that 
race, gender, age may be captured, that could let us collect the data in the aggregate and put it into buckets. That doesn't exist for OGA. Uh, that's more of a descriptive narrative on the arrest report, so that's the challenge right. with, with Well, the I understand the challenge, like there's no box to check currently or there's no field or, or whatever, but there's no reason that you couldn't set one up so that if there was a law requiring you to report, for an officer to report, what government function is being obstructed by the person that you're arresting for obstructing a government function, it doesn't seem like it's impossible to set up a, a system for that data to be articulated and, and collected in a way that you can deliver to us. It's, it's certainly not impossible, and if the law is a funded law, that would... Say that uh, again? I, I don't think it's impossible, and if the law is a funded law, that would... Uh, that could foresee the changes that need to be made to computer systems. I think that's certainly something we can talk about. Well, we can talk about that in the budget hearing, I'm sure, but like requiring the PD to report on the basis for the arrest that is making, I, I certainly, right now, I'm not of the mind that, well, you'll do that, but only if we provide you extra funding for that. This seems like a basic responsibility, and, and with all of our reporting bills, there's not then an, an additional uh, uh, requirement that, that the council fund the, the, the specific uh, reporting requirement that's, that, that uh, we're that's opposing. Actually, that's not true. So there are reporting bills that we work with council on that uh, will have us report on data that, that, are, that is captured by our current systems, and we never raise objections to it, nor do we attach any price tags to it, but there were, uh, reporting bills that the council worked on, for example, the, um, uh, the Criminal Justice Reform Act with the civil summonses that required significant changes to systems that was in fact funded. So it's a difference of what kind of reporting bills are being introduced. Some of them can be done without cost. Some of them have a cost attached. Mm -hmm. are, are you concerned that the department doesn't readily have knowledge of what government functions were obstructed by the 1,133 people who were arrested for obstructing government function I, last year? I don't think that's accurate. I mean, I, as I've just testified, that an officer charging obstructing governmental administration, or for that matter, any of the other two charges, needs to articulate on the arrest report and to the prosecutor the basis of that charge. So, of course, we, we know it's being done. There are safeguards in place with through district attorneys that would either pursue the case or not pursue the case, but it's being done. The issue is the way that you would have us report or collect the data. It's, I can run a word search for you. It's gonna give you inaccurate data. It, it's gonna give inaccurate data. Inaccurate data. So, so if, if, if that's how you would collect the data for me and it would be inaccurate, is there some different way that you're collecting the data for yourselves that would be accurate? Because otherwise you're telling me that the data that you would, you, would, you would collect to know why are all these arrests being made and, and are they good arrests is, is faulty. Do you have currently well, a mechanism? I mean, it's, it, of course there's a mechanism. There's integrity, uh, there's an integrity control measures in place uh, in the department that reviews arrests, that, that follows these things, that we can pull up arrests by officer, by charge and review the arrest report review the documents in that re in that require in that um, review, but what you're asking for is an aggregate data set relative to particular charges, and then you're looking to go even further and disaggregate it by the basis of that particular charge. Which I understand what you're trying to do, mm -hmm. but what I'm telling you is the system doesn't aggregate numbers in that way. It enables us to pull up the arrest, to review the arrest, to review the narrative, to do integrity control, but it doesn't do what, you're, what you would want it to do based on the, the language of this bill. Okay. Um, and then lastly, just a, a different uh, topic. I think it's intro 1105, um, which, is the, which has to do with um, false official statements. I know that this was maybe touched on earlier, but why not have the CCRB uh, review those allegations? I'm, I'm confused. I'm, I'm, can you? Well, let, let me. Right now, the CC, if, if someone is, if an officer is um, 
uh, testified falsely uh, through the CCRB, right? Where is that um, adjudicated? Where would there be discipline for that false testimony? So, uh, and I'll, I'll let uh, Chief Pontillo add to this, but if we, it currently the way the system works is that if we have ongoing relationships with the five DAs, the special narcotics prosecutor, two US attorneys, we, we are in regular conversation with them. We've appointed a adverse cre credibility committee within the department that reaches out to these, to these offices, collects uh, um, adverse credibility findings. Now that includes findings by the prosecutors themselves or findings in court, you know, and they notify of these things. Uh, the committee reviews these findings, pulls the transcripts from, from these events, uh, from the testimony, and then makes recommendations from that. Uh, one of the recommendations could be if it's, if it's deemed an intentional uh, false statement, one of the options could be to refer it to internal affairs for an investigation, which will ultimately lead to discipline and could potentially include perjury criminal charges. But how, how would others, you feel? Others would be that there could be a simple mistake in the testimony, a lack of pre preparedness by the officer. There would be training involved there. In some cases, there may be a reassignment of the law or a suggestion. Why not, uh, why not let the CCRB have jurisdiction over <clears throat> false statement cases? I think the uh, the Internal Affairs Bureau has a lot of experience with these cases and has done a very good job of them. Like I stated earlier in 2018, we terminated or and or separated 45 members of the department from the NYPD for perjury or false statement cases. There's also a criminal component to this. So if it's a false statement that rises to the level of perjury, misstatement at a sworn testimony or sworn hearing or signing an affidavit that is factually inaccurate, uh, internal affairs is going to work with the prosecutor that has jurisdiction over that matter. So the first part of that case will be a criminal investigation, and they will look to see if a criminal charge can be sustained. Uh, if internal affairs working with the prosecutor uh, decides that there is criminality and the prosecutor is going to prosecute the case, and it's a criminal case, it will run its course. Uh, and, and they will bring it potentially to trial and it'll be resolved. Uh, for those cases that uh, the DA declines or do not rise to the level of perjury or a false official statement, uh, but it's some other false or misleading statement, then internal affairs has demonstrated they're very capable uh, at investigating those cases thoroughly uh, and uh, bringing them to a resolution where there is, uh, there is discipline. Right. Well, without specifically impugning the ability of internal affairs to conduct investigations, you understand that the reason there is a CCRB is because of the public's, uh, I won't say lack of confidence, let's say desire for more in conf uh, confidence that comes from a somewhat independent body conducting certain investigations. Sure, but CCRB has jurisdiction over certain matters that are defined, uh, and other matters are handled by the Internal Affairs Bureau or even potentially uh, other outside bodies, especially when talking uh, in uh, a matter which is criminal or potentially criminal and is going to begin with a criminal investigation and possibly criminal proceeding, then Internal Affairs is best situated to uh, investigate those criminal cases and work with the prosecutor to bring them prosecution. All right, last one, just going back to the other the bills. Um, one of the things that, that you, in your testimony you say you cannot capture data on when the district attorneys decline to prosecute these particular offenses. Do, does the NYPD not review which charges it brings or, or, or arrests people for that, that the district attorneys ultimately decline to, to prosecute? Because that seems to me like something the department should pay attention to and should be concerned about if you see for certain kinds of, of charges that in a certain precinct or overall, a lot of those are being dis dismissed. They may be dismissed because the district attorney doesn't believe the, 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 or the, the validity or the, or the merit of the underlying case, which would ring one kind of alarm bell. It, it might be that the, the officers are not uh, 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 writing out their 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 reports correctly, or or or, or um, articulating their their reasons for such and such an arrest correctly, even though 
there is a good reason. Is no one at the NYPD like monitoring the, the uh, for want of a better term, uh, the, the declaration, declination rates for different offenses? Sure. I mean, the, the rates and cases are monitored. Uh, I think in the way you envision it again in the bill, this is district attorney data. You're asking us to report on another agency's data set. I've noticed that there was another bill uh, mm -hmm. uh, being heard today that has to do with reporting by the district attorney's offices, if, if that's something that they're going to disaggregate in their reporting. Do you have that information? Do you, does the NYPD have the information now in its possession, not necessarily at this table, but, but somewhere at one police plaza, on the number of arrests for obstructing uh, the administration of justice or arrests for resisting arrest that the district attorney declined to, to prosecute? Yes, so we have access uh, near real time to every declined prosecution case. Uh, so all those criteria that you describe, like the reasons why the case was declined, and the overwhelming majority are prosecutorial discretion. The next biggest category is complainant not available. Uh, and there are some paperwork ones. Uh, but it also includes things like officer failed to appear, officer not ready, uh, insufficient you know, legal basis for, for a stop or no probable cause. Right. We get those, we examine those uh, pretty much on a monthly basis uh, and we conduct investigations where we see uh, there are repeat DPs or uh, one of the categories is a category that um, uh, uh, raises questions about the conduct of the officer. So, so we get that. But I think what we're talking about here and, and the, the point Oleg is making, that, that that's data feed that we get from OCA and we're talking about disparate systems. So the, the problem is linking up data from two entirely separate systems to produce the uh, aggregate data you're looking for. So it's not a question of not having the data, it's not having uh, data in a format that's readily capable of generating reports on a timely basis. We, we, for, for whatever, in whatever format you have it currently, can you provide that data to us for the last year for those three offenses? Well, I, I think, Council Member, I think it, you have to appreciate the fact that this is not NYPD data. The data in the manner that we get it needs to be recognized. He, he says that you have data. We have data. Whatever, whatever for, format you have it in, that's, I'd that's, like to have that that's data. That's not how the department reports data. The department reports, it reports its own data that we can stand behind and we can verify. This is data from another agency that you can readily ask the other agency. Wait, but I'm asking you. you. It's data that you have, correct? Sir, it's data that you have. Can I have the data that you have? That's my question. <laughs> Council member, you want us to post a public report? No, 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 I'm not asking you to post anything right now. All I, that's, I'm not talking about the bill. I'm talking about you've well, got data about. that I'd like to see. And I believe that that data would help inform my thinking about how this bill should be negotiated, presented, and ultimately what the law should be. You've got data. I'd like to see that data. That's we'll, all. Can I have that data? We'll, we'll be in contact with your office about it. Thank you. Thank you. And I just wanted to, we're going to begin to close out. Um, I just want to go back to the um, false statements again. So the panel found that the department ru routinely under prosecutes false statements cases by not charging these cases under provision of the patrol guide that has a presumptive termination penalty. It recommended that the department be more ag aggressive in investigating officers' claims of mis uh, mistaken statements and forced determination penalty in all cases in which an officer has been found guilty of making a materially false statement and require the commission to explain any deviation from that policy. Um, so once again, you know, the panel, certainly it's not me saying this, thought that you were undercharging. Um, you, can you speak a little bit to why that isn't occurring? I think one of the things that even the panel recognized in its report is there's a specific provision in the patrol guide, I think it's 20308, mm -hmm. and that's the one that has in our patrol guide a presumptive dismissal policy absent exceptional circumstances to be found by the police commissioner. That's a pretty narrow provision. It applies in situations in which there is an intentional uh, falsehood by the officer, 
Um, it is about a material fact, and it is in the course of an official proceeding. And I think the panel themselves recognized in their report that there's some difficulties with the way that particular provision is structured, that it's not altogether clear and sometimes can lead to the difficulty in whether or not it's charged. For example, I think one of the things that the panel pointed out was, you know, the provision says material, but material to what? That was the panel's analysis. It's unclear. Um, and the panel also recognized that there can be often, uh, it's difficult sometimes to prove the operations of an officer's mind when he has written a statement or made a statement, and that's one of the other elements of that, and they recognize that sometimes that's difficult to prove. So I think that's, I think the panel themselves analyzed, um, at least in, in that regard, as to why that particular provision hasn't been um, I, hasn't been prosecuted as much as others because it's a difficult provision. Right, but having they also... Said that, mm. Having said that, again, um, the panel also laid out a series of recommendations for us um, in order to improve in this area. And um, as we've said many times today, um, the police commissioner has embraced those recommendations and um, once the implementation group gets underway, um, those are the specific things we're going to take a look at and implement. Right. And he also said more aggressively investigate false statements. So I'm assuming, I, I'm not saying it wasn't taken serious, but that we need to do a little bit more work there uh, to protect the integrity of the department. How many officers have been terminated over false statements? Do you have that, Matt? Uh, in 2018, it was 45. So 45, okay. In 2018, over false statements. Or perjury. Or perjury. Either uh, terminated or separated as a result of a plea negotiation. Okay, and then uh, just last point. I know uh, they also recommended the department should upgrade and integrate its case management system because it seems like IAB has their own information, DO DAO has their own information. Um, and we need to integrate that. Now, they also talked about access to this system uh, and, and, and also um, uh, an auditor, periodic auditors of the specific the disciplinary process in, in, um, in the system. Uh, who else would have access to, so an independent auditor, what does that look like? Um, would the specific agencies we, that- We that, don't know. Say it again. I mean, we don't know yet. I mean, that, that'll right. be part of our discussions. I mean, that's we've been we've had. But 58 wouldn't preclude DOI, the IG, CCRB from having access to uh, the case management system and uh, the disciplinary audits. Would that preclude them from exclude them from having access to these things? Or no. are you considering? Would you consider also ensuring that those agencies have access as well? Well, I think um, some of the agencies that you mentioned have Already. Um, a statutory yeah. oversight obligation, which we comply with routinely. Right. Okay. Um, this might make it more efficient. I mean, depending right. on depending but they would, the but set up. Uh, as you develop, you're going to develop this case management system. I just want to ensure that there are more eyes and ears um, specifically here. Um, not saying that we don't trust you uh, to be accountable and transparent, but the more eyes, the better. Um, with that being said, I want to thank you all uh, for coming out. I know this has been a tough discussion, but a necessary one. Really? Uh, I have the utmost respect for each and every one of you, uh, as you know. But uh, at the end of the day, uh, we have an obligation to drive and, as an oversight body these hard conversations. And at the end of the day, I think we all share uh, the same common goal, right? We want a safe city. We want to ensure that we have the best officers uh, in the department. Uh, but the only way for us to achieve uh, even more historic record crime lows um, is to ensure that we have in our building true trust uh, with local communities. And the only way to do that uh, is to ensure that we have the best of the best out there serving our communities. Once again, this is not an indictment on the entire department. There are a small minute of people in a department who are getting away uh, with all sorts of infractions. And 
that leads to mistrust with the community. Uh, but furthermore, as a neighbor to Sean Bell, I, I lived across the street from him. Um, you look at so many different cases, the Eric Garner cases. We want to avoid having families having to come before this body to testify about a lack of transparency and accountability in the department. And lastly, I think the most important thing is that we don't want to see community members harmed. This is just as much about the safety of officers, but uh, more importantly, and just as important, I would argue, the safety of community and community members. And I think sometimes the department gets lost I understand you have an obligation to protect officers, but I also urge you to look at it from the civilian's perspective. If we do that, <laughs> we will move mountains in this city. Well, um, but once again, you know, when you turn on the news and you see an officer still getting paid after misconduct, in which you know that if you were in any other job you would be fired for, uh, it doesn't say that we are building a true system um, that ensures that the police are held just as accountable as the public is held accountable for their actions. There cannot be two laws, laws for the police department and a law for the public. I think we all have an obligation to adhere to one law, and that law should apply to everyone evenly. So if you're out here doing a DUI, listen. <laughs> I mean, as a politician, I would be put on the front of every paper and probably be told to resign. Same should go for police officers. Well, you know. There should be no distinction between the two. We all are public servants. We all take an oath of office, and the public expects us uh, to carry ourselves with professionalism, with courtesy, respect. And, um, and like I said, large majority of the department, probably 95%, of the department carries themselves in that way. The problem is when we're shielding that 5%, that 5% is out there running amok, and we have to hold those individuals accountable so that we don't have to have victims of police violence in the future. So thank you for coming today. I'll allow you to give a closing statement. Not um, really. But I, I want to thank you. I want to thank you, and I want to thank the police commissioner because He's done some things, in my opinion, that are very tough that, that other commissioners would have not <laughs> nearly gone towards. Um, but um, I, I want to acknowledge that and thank him for doing that, but also say that we, we're not going to stop at driving the conversation around accountability and transparency. Well, uh, you know, I body. just, all I would say is that we do that in the context of, of 50A, figure out how we strike that balance. Um, but also, I would just take exception to your, your last comment about you know, suggesting that there is some sort of widespread people running amok uh, in the department. I didn't say widely. I said 5 percent of those individuals. So I just well, to but you said running amok, um, you know, which suggests that, that somehow some. this is conduct that we, don't, that we don't discipline people for, and that's not the case. Um, and, and I think you also discount, if you read my testimony, and you get a sense of what we've done and why we've done it, and it's all been for the purpose of rebuilding trust with communities. And I would also disagree that there's a majority of people out there who think that, that the police are not doing their jobs. That's, uh, I just want to correct you. I did not say that. I said over, I, we believe 95% of the departments, I just well, want to put that on the record, yeah. this is yeah. doing a great job. But well, that five percent, five percent that are out there running, five thousand or thirty-six thousand is a big number. <laughs> you know, I'm not sure that um, that's the case. That's all. I just want to be clear about that. Well, we we could disagree on that one. Absolutely, that, that's okay. I'm going to just ask if the panel can stay, just to hear the first panel. We would really deeply no, appreciate no, that. No, no, we can't, man. We we've got. We, if the panel, it is if you two can stay just to hear the first panel. That would be deeply appreciated. Um. Eric Vassell, Victoria Davis. We'll, we'll Constant, leave someone behind, though. All right? But we've got to. Can we've someone got, from the panel remain? No. Yo, lady, can you, can you stay? All righty. So I'm going to call the first panel Constance Malcolm, Victoria Davis, Eric Vassell.
All right, and we'll just ask you to state your names for the record. Uh, and then we're going to put... Oh, yeah. And uh, so state your name for the record, then you may begin your testimony. Do you, do you want each of us to... I'm sorry, <coughs> first time. So you'll just press the button, you'll say your name for the record. Yeah, my name is Eric Basso. And then you could present your testimony or whatever you want to say. Oh, I'm going to go first. So who, you wanna, you're going to go first? Okay. Yes. So you can go first. And excuse me for my voice, I have like a slight cold. <laughs> I have a cold too. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I do want to start by thanking uh, Speaker Johnson for uh, the invitation to come here and Councilmember Richards for allowing our testimony today. I just want to start by saying my name is Victoria Davis. I am the sister of Delron Small, who was killed on July 4th, 2016, by Officer Wayne Isaacs on Atlantic Avenue. Delron was driving down the street on Atlantic Avenue. Wayne Isaacs was as well. Uh, Wayne Isaacs was driving erratically, and put, he put people in the public in danger, as well as Delron, who was driving at the time with his four-month-old son and 15-year-old stepdaughter who were in the car. At some point, they both step at a, at a stop sign and Dalran stepped out of the vehicle to speak to Wayne Isaacs and ask him, you know, why is he driving so radically? He can put his baby and his children in danger. Wayne Isaacs, Delron never actually got to the vehicle, uh, but Wayne Isaacs shot Delron three times uh, as soon as Delron exited the vehicle and approached it. Wayne Isaacs' testimony during the court hearing uh, was that he shot Delron not once, not twice, but three times because he's trained to shoot in spurts of three. Delron's Delron's case was the first case by the special, the AG special prosecutor, to be taken to trial, and for six weeks, and was unjustly found. When Isaacs was unjustly found unguil, um, not guilty, as as officers usually are. Um, I just wanted to say a little bit about Delron before I continue. So the reason why I myself and my brother Victor, who's here as well, uh, represent Delron is because we do not have a mother. Our mom died when I was nine, Delron, um, Victor was six, and Delron was 12. She died from complications of HIV and AIDS, and therefore we lived in the, the foster care system in various different homes. Uh, we ultimately lived in a foster home, which then turned into a, an adopted home that was very abusive and very traumatic. Dalron spent all of his time trying to find an adult who would remove us from the house, and he was unsuccessful. Uh, even until Dalron died, and we were all adults, he felt very guilty that he was unsuccessful at protecting us. Although I've explained to him plenty of times that it wasn't his fault and he shouldn't have had to carry that burden because he was also a child himself. While Dalron was our brother, he was like a father figure to us because he had to protect us and um, he did so, and he meant a lot to me. He let, meant a lot to Victor. While I lived, I moved upstate for a period of time to Utica, about four hours away, Delron would often come and visit me, check on me, make sure I was okay. We spent a lot of time on the phone. When I lived in California, Delron would call and FaceTime and speak to my other son and just make sure that we were, we were okay and check in.
on the evening that Dalran was killed by Wayne Isaacs, Dalran was leaving a, it was July 3rd, the evening of July 3rd, when he, when he was leaving a family gathering with his, uh, like I stated, his four month old child and his 15 year old stepdaughter in the car. Um, Even though Dalran exited the vehicle to ask Wayne Isaacs why he was putting his family in danger by driving so radically for so long down Atlantic Avenue, uh, I feel and the public feels that Wayne Isaacs had other options. Wayne Isaacs uh, could have not rolled down his window. Wayne Isaacs could have driven off. Wayne Isaacs could have this is my brother Victor. When Isaacs could have stated that he was a police officer, and I just wanted to state for the record, when Isaacs was off duty, and he was in plain clothes driving in his personal vehicle. Um, sorry, I just, it's just things that I just didn't want to forget, and I wanted to highlight. Um, when Wayne Isaacs shot Dalron. Dalron stumbled from car to car. Uh, I watched the video. He stumbled from car to car and ultimately fell in between two cars, bleeding to death. When Isaacs did nothing to preserve Dalron's life, he looked at him, he holstered his gun. He then called uh, 911. Uh, complaining of fake injuries and never ever told them that there was a civilian bleeding to death in between two cars. When Isaacs for a week lied about the interaction, even stating that Dalron attacked him, the public took to that narrative and a week later the video surfaced that showed that Wayne Isaacs lied. During the trial, Wayne, um, the defense for Wayne Isaacs continued to state that Wayne Isaacs was a police officer and uh, in an attempt to give Wayne Isaacs some leniency and I believe that's how the jurors uh, saw Wayne Isaacs as a police officer. Uh, the defense also mentioned tattoos that Dalron had and they mentioned his criminal record. Wayne Isaacs knew nothing of this. He knew nothing about Dalron. When Dalron exited the vehicle, but the way that the, the defense attorney put Dalron on trial created a narrative for the jurors that allowed Wayne Isaacs to walk. The AG's office believed so strongly in the case that they were willing to prosecute Wayne Isaacs with a murder. Although Wayne Isaacs was not charged with murder, Wayne Isaacs is a murderer. When Isaacs killed Dalron in cold blood, and he should be held accountable. He has not been held accountable in any way, shape, or form. He actually received a higher salary uh, since the incident. Since the, con the conclusion of the trial, uh, my brother and I, over the summertime, the hand delivered a, mess, a, a letter to Mayor de Blasio and Commissioner O'Neill. We've never received a response from them. Um, we were disregarded. Um, we believe that Wayne Isaacs is a danger to uh, pu uh, public, to the public. If he was able to kill Dalron and not have 
any sort of compassion for him. He shouldn't be patrolling the streets and he shouldn't be patrolling uh, anyone because he did not protect and he did not preserve. He did not protect and he did not serve. And those are the reasons that he should be held accountable. Uh, if he doesn't, if he's not held accountable, the city would set a precedence that officers are held at a standard, a higher standard than civilians and that it is okay for them to kill and they'll just go back to work uh, with no accountability. Uh, if Wayne Isaacs so happens to kill another civilian, it would be the fault of the de Blasio administration and who knows, he'll probably just go back to work again. Since Dalron's killing, I had a, a child, and because Dalron meant so much to me, to pay honor to Dalron, I named my son Justice, because that's what I was what I spent all of my time pursuing justice for Dauron, even when I was pregnant, um, in the hot sun, and the winter, you know, just because I wanted, I, I need what we need, and we need to make sure that when Isaacs is held accountable, and accountability to us looks like Wayne Isaacs being fired. If it was any uh, any other person, especially a civilian. When Isaacs would have been arrested on the scene, he would not have been able to tell these lies and he would not have been able to be given preferential treatment. Uh, I do have a list of demands or questions, or <laughs> sorry, not demands, but um, I do okay, have a demand. list of asks for Dalron, for my four-month-old baby, Justice, and for the rest of my family. I'm pleading with you all to, to demand, demand that the NYPD immediately bring discipline charges against Wayne Isaacs for the multiple violations of the NYPD protocol he engaged in, including escalating the situation with a civilian, murdering my brother, lying about it in official reports and more. Past city council bills that will require the NYPD to publicly report on what discipline steps that have not taken, that have not been taken related to all cases of police killings, deaths in custody, police sexual violence, police brutality, and lying in an official capacity. The next ask is pass Council Member Williams' resolution to call on Albany to repeal 50A as soon as possible. To work with me, other families, and the groups that we work with, like the Justice Committee, Communities United for Police Reform, to make sure that we can prevent other families from going through what we have gone through. We would never want to see any more families experience what we have. We've experienced a lot, Daron's death. The pain did not end at Daron's death. It impacted our family negatively in many ways. The department has made no actions. There's no formal charges against Wayne Isaacs. Uh, the department didn't charge him with anything. And so, thank you for your time and thank you for your invitation. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Councilman, for allowing me to sit. Uh, again, my name is Victor Dempsey. I'm also the brother of Daron Small and Terry Davis. I really just wanted to add something else to this. You know, it's, we've talked about our brother's murder for year, you know, since it happened as much as we can to bring awareness to it. And sometimes besides the families and the supporters that we had and the organizations who's helped out all of the families since then, 
we had to witness our brother get murdered twice, not just with Wayne Isaacs murdering him, but in that courtroom, awaiting a verdict for days. And to believe, you know, and we still believe us being the first family to utilize the special prosecution that families before us fought for with organizations like CPR and Justice Committee to fight to get the special prosecution, the special prosecutor to take on these police involved murders and to watch them work day in and day out on this case, do the fact finding and really go through every little thing for our family to sit here and say, he's gonna be held accountable. Just looking at the facts and to feel good about that, to, to get the support from all of the other families who suffer just like us and to tell them we're gonna be fine, we're gonna get justice, we're gonna get justice. And to hear that verdict and him being acquitted right there, my brother literally got killed the second time. That pain is unmountable. It's, it's in, in, you can't imagine what we went through having to listen to someone else say, your brother was murdered, but there's nothing we can do about it. I really wanted to bring that home because I don't think the department, the NYPD understands what they're doing to people. Not only are they murdering civilians, they're demolishing the trust that the public will have with them because you're not holding anybody accountable. Like my sister said about the video, the video surfaced six days after the murder. Wayne Isaac's original testimony was my brother hit him repeatedly. I don't know if any of the council members have watched the video. My brother was killed instantaneously as approaching that car. Not one time do you see a punch being thrown, even if you wanted to assume, which it wasn't even there. I don't know how we lost that case. But one thing that did stick out to me when the judge was giving directions to the jury and Steve, the, uh, the, the, that his attorney fought to say, regardless if he's off duty or not, he's still a police officer. And he ran that home over and over and over. And I assumed that it was just so the jury who are members of the public would give him this unprecedented, you know, view, like he's, you know, he's, he's a public servant, he can't do any wrong, is the interpretation I got from that. And he said he didn't have a duty to retreat because he, he's an officer, regardless. But like my sister stated, you know, he had time. He stated that he watched my brother walk. You could have rolled the window, uh, pull out your badge, but you, he testified to reaching for his handgun. He testified that that's what he chose to do. And not only did he not, he didn't shoot him one time, he shot him three times, three times. A medical examiner testified to saying, we don't know which shot, which, in which order the shot came that actually killed him, but my brother drowned in his own blood. One shot hit him in the hip, that pretty much he couldn't walk. That's why he was stumbling. Another shot pierced his lungs and his lungs got flooded with blood. And as my brother laid on the concrete dying, Wayne Isaacs picked up the phone, he made a phone call, but he not once in that recording that we heard in that trial did he say there's a man dying. I shot, he, not, not once, he said he discharged his weapon and he needs help, he's a member of service. I can provide this tape for you, I, 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 that's exactly what he said. Not once did he acknowledge that there was a man dying but this is someone who took an oath to protect our city. So I really just wanted to reiterate that because like my sister said, she had another child, I have a son. My four month old nephew at the time was in the car with my brother. My 16 year old niece was in the car with my brother. His girlfriend was in the car with him. That's never gonna change. It's never gonna be etched out of their minds. And like all of the other family supporters who fight with us every single day, we relive this every single day, just hoping that we get some form of accountability. And at this point, him being fired is the least of accountability that we can ask for. So I really just wanted to make sure that we understood how detrimental that is to my family as well. Thank you for having the courage to come down here and testify and to speak on unfortunate incident. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Richards, 
members of the Public Safety Committee, thank you, Speaker Johnson, for this invitation to speak today. My name is Eric Vassell. I'm the father of Saeed Vassell, who was murdered by the NYPD on April the 4th, 2018. Within the space of three seconds, he was shot 10 times. I must say to the committee that the death of my son brings sorrows and pain to our family, also to the community. The pain and sorrows is not about that my son died, but is the way that he was murdered and what happened after he was murdered. Hours after my son was murdered, he was placed on social media by the NYPD. It takes 16 weeks after his death for us to know the names of the four police officers that killed my son. Days after he was murdered, the case was taken up by the AG office. And until today, those four police officers are still on duty. I'm asking this committee to assist me and my family and the community. I'm asking you for your assistance in demanding that these police officers who murdered my son, Said Basel, put and modified duty. Thank you very much for listening to me this evening. Thank you. And, um, my name is Constance Malcolm. I'm the mother of Romali Graham. Um, my son, Romali Graham, was murdered in front of my six-year-old son and my grandma, my mom, in 2012 in my own home. Um, in this testimony today, I'm also speaking about uh, Ms. Carr, speaking for Ms. Carr because she couldn't be here today. So you're going to hear in testimony from my side, my case, and also Gwen Carr case. Um, so um, I want to also thank, like everybody else already did, thank this, um, Mr. Richardson and uh, Mr. Johnson to have us here today to hear us, you know, speaking about what's going on. Um, it would take days for me to really go into everything that happened to me and my family, which we know we don't have that time. But I try to so much as much as possible that I can. And also with Eric Garner case too. Um, since I have just a few minutes, there's a few things I would want to highlight now. The rest will be in written um, testimony. Um, in both of our case, like again, I said, Ms. Carr and my case, the NYPD have stuck accountability and failed to be bring transparency. They have been used this lack of transparency to make it harder for us, our family, to fight for justice and accountability for our loved one. Um, in the case of Romali, which is my son, there was at least 12 officers that was involved in my son's murder. Only three out of a dozen officers was disciplined. Um, on this day, Mayor de Blasio and NYPD have still refused to give me names of the officer engaged in misconduct with my son. They, they, there was at least 12 officers that should have at least been fired, but they wasn't. There was, off, I'm gonna give you a couple of examples. The officer who, the officer who um, assaulted my mom after Romali was killed, she was interrogated for seven hours in a precinct 
after she just witnessed her son was killed. I mean, her grandson was murdered. These officers that also leak sealed documents of my son. Officer also assaulted me in the precinct when I went there to find out about my son. They assaulted me also. And also the officer that also tried to cover up the incident. None of these officers was ever fired and we don't even know some of the officer names. This is unacceptable. Keeping these kind of officer on the job is very dangerous to New Yorkers. The two, um, there was three officer that was charged. Two of the officer Two of them is off the force, but none of them was fired. And the reason two was off the force, because it was nonstop fighting from me, didn't want to give up, my family wasn't about to give up, an organization and the community that stood behind me to fight to make sure these officers didn't stay. It took five years nonstop organizing by groups who supported me Richard Hayes even saw, he wouldn't even saw any discipline trial if it wasn't for me out there in the front line. Richard Hayes was, was able to resign, resign instead of being fired. Richard Hayes has gotten annual salary, which you hear from testimony here from these other family, for overtime increase after murdering loved ones. These officers continuously getting overtime on modified duty, racking up their pension. That's unacceptable. This is the only job that I see that you get a reward for doing bad behavior. It took six years to have any movement on Sergeant Morris and Officer McLaughlin. They never saw a discipline, um, discipline trial. Morris is off the force, but well, McLaughlin is still on the, the force, and McLaughlin was the one that kicked my door in. But yesterday, he's still on the force. Let me be clear. Hayes and Mar Morris was forced to resign, but not because of the NYPD. In spite of everything, It was a nonstop public pressure that organized with groups supporting me. Not would have ha it would not happen. Both Hayes and Morris would still be on the force. Every step of the way, 50A was an ob ob obstacle. This 50A is a really big problem. And that's why me and other families fighting for re 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 repeal is very, is very important. Richardson is the, um, the DOA, DA, DAO, um, also was very disrespectful to me and my family. In, case, in the case where we was going to trial, Richardson wouldn't even tell me the charges that this man that was facing that murdered my child. He wouldn't even tell me the charge this man was facing. Had to sit through a trial to catch charges which I should have been told before all of this. This is a disrespectful thing that we as family gotta go through to get justice. They refused to let my mom testify. She was in the house when everything happened. They made it look like she was never there in that trial. She never told what happened. She, could, she didn't get a chance to tell what happened. Only Richard Hayes and his little goons with their fabricated stories got to testify. She and my son was the only witness apart from the rest of them that was in the house, the officers that was in the house. She wasn't allowed to testify. 
So basically, you never heard her side of the story. Richardson also, when I met with Richardson, I asked him, can you have your team come to my house to see the layout of my house? Because what the officer was saying happened, it couldn't have happened that way. I begged him to have his team come to my house. He said yes. He told me yes. That never happened. I also think that if they would have came to my house in this trial, they would understand a lot more about the apartment and what these officers were saying did not happen the way how they said it went down. Because the layout of the house would have shown there's no way these officers could have been in the hallway when they said it happened and how it happened. There are many examples I could go into, but like I said, it's so much. But today, as I sit here, Richardson is not fit to be in that office. He needs to get fired from that office. As I go in, I'm going to, I'm finished testifying Romali. I will go into Ms. Gwen Carr's testimony. Again, I thank you to sit here and listen to me. As you know, Eric Garner was murdered on July, in July um, 24th by NYPD. It's been five years later, Daniel Pentaleo, the officer who choked Eric, the officer who choked Eric, um, and threw him on the ground unlawfully and arrested him. Officer who lied in the, um, the official report, and you, you hear testimony all the time, these officers continue to lie on reports and nothing has been done to them. Officer who failed to supervise and other officer who engaged in the misconduct are all still on the force, still collecting a paycheck again. Ms. Carr is very worried that NYPD is trying to sweep, sweep this under the rug. It's not sure if this, this mayor, Mayor de Blasio and the Commissioner O'Neill have continued to, they have continued to refuse to tell her the name of the officers. Again, you hear this often again. This administrator don't want to give the name of the officer whom you know, harm people, and it's just a disrespect to the family. They continue to want to give her the name of the officer who plays in the, um, the murder of Eric Garner and attempt to try to cover it up afterwards. They have the names, they have the name of five, five, five officers bes beside Pentaleo, only because she and group supporting have been pacing to um, like the media report of officer who lied in the report and this is how she gets these names. All of the families stand with Ms. Carr and are really concerned that the de Blasio and O'Neill have no intention of holding any officer accountable for murdering Eric. Given the widespread cover up and many responsible for the misconduct, excuse me, of the misconduct of Pantaleo. Um, it should just be, it, sh it should not just be Pantaleo facing possible discipline. It was so many other people that was there that should be also charged and it's not charged. Pantaleo, just make it clear, Pantaleo need to be fired. You choke a man on national TV and you still have a job. Again, what organization does that but the NYPD? Um, if it wasn't for the CCRB pushing for charges for Pantaleo, disciplinary charges, that would have never happened. Again, NYPD don't seem like they want to bring any of these officers that murder unjustly to justice or, you know, discipline anyway, any transparency. They tried to block CCRB from bringing charges. NYPD tried to block CCRB from bringing charges. 
It wasn't until Ms. Carr pointed out that NYPD lied, delaying charges against, um, against the, um, last, uh, last year, that, that the NYPD decided to stop blocking CCRB from bringing charges against Pantaleo. Pantaleo case is only one that has even moved forward, and that's because of CCRB again, not the NYPD. The NYPD has even brought another officer up on disciplinary charges, not the one who lied on the official um, report, or the one who jumped on Eric back, falsely accusing him of selling cigarettes. Sorry, not accusing him of selling cigarettes and for the arrest in him. They also started um, spreading propaganda stories about Eric. Remind you, if it wasn't for, what's his name? Ramsey Ortiz, we would have never knew what happened. Thank God for him because we would have got another story. Erica had just broken up a fight, a fight. That's not the warranty you get for breaking up a fight, a death sentence. Shame on, shame on New York, shame. Where is the middle? We are in the middle of a massive cover-up. Ms. Carr and I, uh, Ms. Carr and all, um, all of us feel Nobody's hearing us. Nobody cares about us. We are really, we are really worried that Pantaleo might not get fired. What happened in my case, where they let this office went and resign, we are very scared that might happen again in this case. We want these officers to be held accountable. We have these two family here also. I know that um, the Davis and the Fats also need help in their fight for justice for Delron and um, Sahi. We can't keep having we can't keep having our black children murdered by NYPD, NYPD officers, and no one is ever held accountable. It's so much families not here. So, so many family die, passed away before they even see how their case panned out. If is this what New York stands for, I don't know what to say. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank all of you for coming here today. I know it takes a lot, and I want you to know that we are hearing you. Uh, and that's why we're here today. I'm going to go to Councilman Inez Barron. Uh, thank you to the chairs for holding this very important hearing. And I'm um, glad that we had. The opportunity to hear directly. From those families that are impacted. And I'm glad that you gave them the time to be able to tell this story. But until we um, have change, and until we get a mayor and a police commissioner who acknowledge that the lives of black people, brown people, poor people of all colors are important, and that the NYPD certainly does not have any privilege uh, that insulates them from being um, prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. And until we get citizens who understand that as well, it's going to continue to exist. Um, one of the biggest examples for me of a police officer who has risen through the ranks and gotten increases in pay is the inspector at the 75th precinct, whose name is Inspector John Shell, who in 2008 shot and killed 
or Tanzo Bovell by shooting him in the back. There was never an investigation by the department to determine uh, if any kind of policy had been violated or to bring charges. But recently, after 11 years, uh, there was a civil trial, and the jury awarded the family a uh, settlement. The jury awarded uh, an award to the family because the ballistics proved that inspector, the inspector in the NYPD at the 7-5 precinct, in fact, lied when he said, oh, he was falling and his gun accidentally discharged. It was proven to be a lie because ballistics proved that he had to be in a standing position in order to have the bullet enter at the angle that it did. But until we have the ability to have jury trials that bring us the result that the evidence lays out before us, that officers lied in their reports, that officers constructed evidence and that they were protected by the system. Until we can change that, it's unfortunately it's going to continue. So I met uh, Victor and his sister uh, after the killing of their brother, the murder of their brother, and they have been stalwarts and they have been activists to try to bring attention to this and, and so Ramali Graham's mom and all the others that have unfortunately established a bond based on the crimes of murder committed against unarmed citizens. But until we get an action and until we get people in power who are willing to acknowledge that all lives are important, particularly black lives, brown lives, and poor people, because they're the ones who have been subjected to this. So until we can get that, we're going to be coming here again and again. And 50A is one of the ways that we can get information about those officers who have a history of engaging this kind of activity. I want to remind you that Kenneth Boss one of the people who killed Amadou Diallo had killed before. So we can't forget this. We can't slip it under the rug. We've got to make sure that we get the laws in place and get people to have their minds awakened and sharpened to the fact that crime is crime, even when it's committed, committed by those who wear a blue uniform, and justice has to be served. Thank you. Thank you. It's powerful. Thank you all for coming out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for and thank us. you to the rest of the council members. I think we forgot. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to call the next panel Cynthia Conti Cook, Jen Borchetta, Christopher Boyle, Jackie Caramana. Oded Oren. So I'm going to go through this again. Christopher Boyle, New York County Defender Services. Jen Porchetta, the Bronx Defenders. Cynthia Conti Cook, the Legal Aid Society. Jackie Carmana. And Oded Oren.
righty. All right, so I'm gonna uh, ask you, I mean, most of you know the drill, I'm assuming. State your name for the record and who you're representing. We're also, due to the hour, um, going to put you on the clock, so we wanna hear specific great ideas, but I think we know all of you well. So, start, ladies first, and then we'll work our way down. You press, press the button. My name is Jacqueline Caruana. I'm a senior attorney at uh, Brooklyn Defender Services in the criminal defense practice. Um, I wanna thank all of you for the opportunity to testify. I did submit a written copy um, of my testimony to the committee, but I would like to focus, um, you know, with the limited time that we have on the stories of two people whom I personally represented who were directly affected by the lack of access to police disciplinary records. Um, both of these cases involve um, allegations of assault on an officer. I know um, that uh, that was brought up earlier and, and, and the high number of arrests there are on these assault two charges. Um, and they are often the type of charge that we see um, as public defenders where, you know, there's an allegation that our client has done something wrong, then, you know, nothing has happened. There is, uh, nothing is found on their, on their person. Um, there's no underlying offense. And then, that, then they're being charged with an assault to an assault on the officer. Um, so the first story that I wanted to tell you was about um, my client, Mr. C, I'm gonna call him. Um, a police officer stopped my client, Mr. C, in the street uh, because he thought that he saw an unknown heavy object in Mr. C's pocket. It turned out that Mr. C had nothing in his pocket, so the officer then charged Mr. C with disorderly conduct and claimed that Mr. C had headbutted the officer. Mr. C then ended up with a felony assault charge, even though the officer did not suffer any injuries. I know that that was brought up earlier. What are the injuries? Um, why can they not document and report on what these injuries are? Clearly, this officer's credibility was central to the case, but unfortunately, as Mr. C's defense attorney, I had no access to the officer's disciplinary records. Because of Civil Rights Law 50A, the only method by which to obtain police disciplinary records is to file a motion with the court. I did so in that case, um, and, and to then request that the court order the police records to be turned over to the judge to review. In that motion, the defense is required to make a clear showing of facts sufficient to warrant the judge to request police records for review. We can't make that claim without access to the police records. It's a catch-22. In order for us to satisfy the requirements, we need the records. 50A is set up in a way that we will not prevail as defense attorneys in order to obtain this information to adequately defend our clients and cross-examine these police officers. So therefore, these motions are usually unsuccessful. In Mr. C's case, he was initially charged with a felony and ended up with an ACD, if you're familiar, an adjournment in contemplation of dismissal. So his case was eventually dismissed and sealed. But it was shortly after I filed the motion to get access to the officer's disciplinary records that the prosecution immediately offered my client this ACD, from a felony assault charge to an ACD. And that is because, the, in, in my opinion, the, the prosecution did not want me to gain access to this police officer's disciplinary records. I don't know that for sure, but I do know that they must have spoken to someone who authorized this ACD. Um, and that, that's one of the stories that I have. The other one, I'll, I'll be brief, um, would, but I think it's also equally important, was about um, an inmate at Brooklyn House of Detention, my client, um, we're gonna call him Mr. H. That case actually ended up going to a jury trial. He was accused of assaulting the officer and of possessing um, a sharp, a uh, piece of plexiglass that was charged as a weapon. Um, I filed a motion to gain access to his disciplinary records. I was denied. Um, actually, the Department of Corrections showed up to the court proceeding to personally oppose my motion to get access to this officer's records. Um, during the jury trial in which my client was acquitted of all the charges, it came out that this officer had fabricated the uh, paperwork and that the actual item that he, my client was ac uh, um, accused of possessing this piece of plexiglass was planted. Um, it was very clear during the testimony and he was acquitted. That officer is still currently em employed at Brooklyn House of Detention. I saw him there personally last week when I was there to visit a client. Um, so Brooklyn Defender Serv Services supports the resolution urging the repeal of Civil Rights Law 50A and we thank the sponsors for their work to improve police accountability. Um, we also support the bills that will require reporting of police disciplinary actions, but we stress that the information that's gleaned from these reports should be used to enact further reforms. 
Um, we thank the council again for the opportunity to speak and we hope that you will view Brooklyn Defender Services as a resource as we continue to work together to address this issue. And if you have any questions, um, I'm here to answer them, but also um, feel free to reach out to Saya Joseph with our office. Thank you so much for your testimony and the work you do. Uh, my name is Christopher Boyle. I am the uh, Director of Data Research and Policy at New York County Defender Services. Um, I have a couple of uh, very brief anecdotes uh, that I myself have filed um, with this 50A motion. So I'd like to just take a quick look here. This is the motion that I filed. It's almost two inches thick. Most of it is exhibits that have to do with civil lawsuits against police officers that were involved in my client's case. He was charged initially with uh, some type of a drug sale. Um, eventually, after I had filed this motion and it was denied by the court, uh, I was offered uh, through my client a misdemeanor and community service. Uh, so we've had similar experiences when we file these uh, 50A motions. Uh, there is lots of fighting that goes on, uh, but we do eventually see some uh, give by the district attorneys because they don't necessarily seem like they want us to get access to the files. But in this particular case, what I wanted to highlight was, so the, the way this works in practice is we kind of do a research of trying to find out what types of lawsuits were against some of the police officers. So we'll do a search, we'll get that. If you're doing the right thing, you're making phone calls to the lawyers that represented them in the lawsuits. So I did that. I made some phone calls to some of the private lawyers. I find out, like most of these cases, they start out as criminal cases. They're all dismissed because if you took a plea, you're not going to win a civil lawsuit. So they're usually resulting in ACDs or they're resulting in dismissals. So I find out this one case was a drug charge and resulted in a dismissal. I said, why did it result in a dismissal? He gave me all this paperwork. It turned out that the lawyer who worked for legal aid uh, apparently found out that there was a video and showed that the officer had completely lied about that event. Uh, and so the case was eventually dismissed. But there's no mechanism here for us to find that out. So we're discussing whether or not we're discussing 50A motions, but there's another issue here. You know, uh, I listened to this letter that Mr. Vance apparently had given about the idea that they were going to try to get police personnel records. I've never had a district attorney join in an application for me to try to get a police officer's personnel record. Uh, never in my history of doing this. And so what I'm wondering here is, why wasn't that information, this officer lied under oath at a grand jury proceeding that there was some type of drug sale that happened. There was now proof, video proof, that this did not in fact happen. But nothing was done. This officer probably still works there, but more importantly, none of the rest of us knew about it. This officer might have gotten moved to a different precinct in a different borough. We would never know to be able to make an application at some point. Now keep in mind, a judge knew this and still denied my motion. I could not get access to the police personnel records, even having that information there. And I'll just talk about one other case very briefly. So I had another case where uh, my, charge was char my client was charged with a drug type of charge, a drug sale. He claimed it didn't happen, and the officers that were involved were from the Viper unit. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with that. Now, I don't know what a Viper unit is. I Google it, and it turns out there's a New York Post article that says, dumping ground for dirty cops. So there's apparently, there were hearings on this. I had no idea about it. So I file another 50A motion, once again denied, even though it's clear that the Viper unit is the dumping ground. Headline from the New York Post, the dumping ground for bad cops. So what ends up happening is I realize eventually that IAB apparently went and spoke to my client at the hospital. My client didn't realize they were IAB, never told me about it. Then we got the motion granted because there was an ongoing IAB investigation. Once we got access to that material, it was apparently really, really awful stuff, and they dismissed the case outright. So that was the end of the case. There are more problems here than just 50A. There are reporting problems. We are not getting the information about who's lying. Most uh, officers are not going to be charged with perjury. We are not getting these falsified report information, whether they have lied on the road somewhere, because nobody wants to charge them, because that's the end of their career. Let's be honest. If they've lied under oath, what are the odds that a jury is ever going to believe that officer again? They are effectively done at NYPD. That's why they don't do it. Thank you. Thank you. 
Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Cynthia Conti Cook. I work at the Legal Aid Society, and we are a coalition member of Communities United for Police Reform. Um, to start, I just want to thank you for this panel, and thank you for today, and thank you for listening to the families. Um, I also am I'm very grateful that I'm here um, offering, offering in, in writing very specific uh, feedback. But my testimony today, I want to focus on um, correcting the record somewhat from what the NYPD testified to about this morning, specifically as it regards to what 50A does and does not do to the legislative history of 50A and to how the department is still abusively interpreting 50A. Um, as Justice Jenny Rivera said in her dissent from the Court of Appeals case this past December, government is the public's business, and the police are certainly also the public's business. These bills are crucial first steps to allowing the public into the process and having an informed role in deciding what reforms need to be made, and, and we hope that these reporting bills are the first uh, step in many more steps that we will be able to take hand in hand with full amount of information that we need in order to create community-based reforms ourselves and to be heard by the city council and, and by the department. These bills are all really important pieces to a puzzle and I think it's important to emphasize that missing any one of them will leave a, a, big, picture, a big hole in the picture that we're trying to understand here. And especially with 50A. So turning to some of the statements made earlier today, um, Councilmember Cohen asked about the legislative history of 50A, and I think that this was specifically answered wrong. Um, in 1976, there was legislative history that showed the concerns about 50A were mostly about how officers were being questioned in court. I also just want to restate that confronting an officer with prior misconduct in court is not harassment, it is impeachment. It is constitutionally guaranteed for someone accused of a crime to be able to confront their accuser and being able to question officers about prior misconduct is a part of that um, confrontation right. People who are, uh, have misconduct records that are deemed either irrelevant or lack a good faith basis, those are kept out by the judges. The judges act as gatekeepers in those contexts. Um, in 1981, the legislative history was expanded to include correction officers. The department this morning, um, the legal department specifically testified that there was additional legislative history regarding just general harassment, protecting officers from embarrassment. That was in the context of prisons in, legislati in the legislative history in 1981. The courts have done a very sloppy job of combining those legislative histories and extending the, legis extending the concerns about harassment to police officers from prison guards. And I think that it's worth really deciphering what we're talking about when we're talking about what um, the legislative history has already really put into the record. Uh, the department is currently opposing our request for civilian complaints for Officer Scarcella, who has been retired for more than 20 years. Earlier today, that they testified that they would not be uh, opposing requests for officers who've been terminated, and um, that is incorrect. The uh, Councilman Lansman asked earlier um, whether the panel was adopting the, re the uh, report from last week, the recommendations to not broaden the interpretation of 50A any further, and yet they sat here and said that they were uh, possibly going to oppose some release of aggregated data. I think that those two statements are internally inconsistent. The, the 50A does not cover aggregate data at all. And for them to say that they have concerns about whether 50A uh, would cover aggregated data, I think really just means that they're worried the PBA will sue them. I don't think it means that the PBA will win, and I think that we should still demand them to report on aggregated data. Finally, I just want to say that there's nothing in 50A that protects officer safety more than existing FOIL exemptions that protect the privacy of all public employees. In Chicago this past week, we learned that an officer who's leading the uh, implementation of implicit bias training has a long history of civilian complaints. We would never have known that if the Chicago Police Department had not had to make their 30 years of civilian complaint history public, and a journalist organization, the Invisible Institute, made that available publicly. The Chicago Police Department's Fraternal Order of Police confirmed that no threats have resulted from that database being released, and that was confirmed in the panel's report released next week. I'll leave the rest of my comments to my written testimony. Thank you. Thank you. 
Good afternoon, Chairman Richards and Chairman Lansman. Thank you very much for the opportunity to testify today and for this important package of accountability and transparency bills. My name is General Nick Borchetta. I'm the Deputy Director of the Impact Litigation Practice at the Bronx Defenders. I'm here with my colleague, Oded Oren. Uh, Mr. Oren is a criminal defense attorney, and he'll speak from that perspective. In my testimony, I'd like to focus on lessons learned from the stop and frisk remedial process. We have represented the plaintiffs in both the Floyd and Lagan cases. And while our work with the federal court monitor overseeing the reforms in those cases is well known, what's less well known is the massive community input into reforms that was conducted as a part of this reform process. I want to bring attention to their voices today as they are the people whose lives are affected by the NYPD's continued um, unlawful practices and its refusal to meaningfully hold officers accountable. As background the, in this process, this community input process was held over a three-year period from 2014 to 2016. It included 64 focus groups of predominantly black and Latino people from neighborhoods in New York that bore the brunt of the NYPD's unlawful stop and trespass enforcement practices. Over 500 people gave testimony in those focus groups. There were also community forums that were held throughout the city, and in those, focus, in those community forums, over almost 2,000 people participated. The focus group transcripts are available publicly. They are uh, linked to, or the link to them is provided in our written testimony. And we would urge you to look at those in the context of the reporting bill, particularly on the disciplinary matrix, because we think that their voices are important. In addition to the NYPD's reporting on the implementation of a disciplinary matrix, it's important that their voices on the need for it are also reflected. And so to end my testimony, I want to uh, share their statements. These are some quotes from the focus group transcripts, and they reflect really an overwhelming consensus among people affected by these practices that police are not meaningfully held accountable. There's no accountability. The police can just do anything. I'll lose my job if I have weed in my pocket. They can't lose their job if they shot someone wrongfully. I see all my life cops break the law and nothing happens to them. There should be consequences. They act like they can get away with anything, which basically they can. If you don't pay a consequence, you're not going to learn anything. Even though they have evidence of misconduct, the cop always wins. We've made significant changes, but the new rules will only be as good as enforcement and accountability. No matter how many people you get to testify and say that person was in the wrong, as long as he has a badge, he's untouchable. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time, Chairman. My name is Oded Oren. I'm with the Bronx Defenders. Um, I wanted to speak a bit about um, police disciplinary records in criminal court proceedings. Um, I think as my colleague at uh, Brooklyn Defender Services highlighted, those records are really important for us when we um, take a case to a hearing and then a trial. Um, but I want to highlight two other uh, aspects or roles that these records play uh, in our representation. Um, by influencing the judge and the proceedings and the juries if the case goes to trial, uh, the disciplinary records provide some measure of accountability for unlawful behavior through the court system itself. Even when other accountability systems, such as the CRB, CCRB or IAB, fail to do more than just give an anemic slap on the wrist to the officer, um, by airing what happened in court and by be being cross-examined on those records, um, there is some accountability that comes to that specific encounter with the police. Um, and just as importantly, and I think this was highlighted by the previous panel, um, disciplinary records help our clients and their families and their communities find some measure of closure. The records allow us to contextualize police behavior and to show that our clients' claims about profiling and use of force and other abuses have precedent, that they are very much rooted in the specific behavior of that officer or of the NYPD as a whole. These records aff affirm our clients and their stories of abuse by the police, they validate our clients, and they ultimately vindicate our clients in criminal court, in federal court, and in civil court. 
I wanted to take just a few more moments to talk um, about, uh, I believe it was the last back and forth be be between Chairman Lansman and the NYPD representatives here. I think, uh, Chairman Lansman, the data that you were asking for um, about cases or encounters with the police that ultimately were DP'd, uh, declined to prosecute, um, I think that data is instrumental um, for you and for everyone and for the public as a whole to understand what is actually happening and to hold officers accountable. And I think that even when we gain access to disciplinary records of the police, that allows us to know which officers have already been implicated in the past. But I think the data that you were talking about would allow us to um, highlight and find out about new officers who do not have a misconduct record and to highlight other ways in which misconduct of various um, ways happens and maybe is evading our gaze. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Lansman for questions. So these motions that you have to, to, to make to be able to get access to these um, records, this, this is the Gissendanner motion? Yes. What, what, is, what is it that you need to show? Whoever wants to answer that. You want to do in order to show that, so this is for a subpoena. This is not for using the information in a courtroom. In order to get to the information itself, our attorneys have to um, create a showing that they know the, of the existence of material in the custody of the police department or the Civilian Complaint Review Board that would be relevant and material in their case. That means that they have to show two things. Something exists that they know of. That is impossible for us to show unless we have previously gone through this process and we know that there are files from another case, in which case we probably don't need to do this again. But for officers for whom we do not already have information, it is literally impossible for us to show to the court that we know of the existence of records that we believe would be relevant or material in our case. Also, in, the, in a few cases, we've, you know, the Legal Aid Society created a database that it shares with other institutional defenders like the Bronx Defenders and New York County and Brooklyn Defenders. And we try to share as much publicly gleaned information as we can so that as best as we are able to, we can make the case that there is likely going to be internal records that are relevant because we know that there are lawsuits and we know that there's news stories and we know that there's a good amount of other public information and therefore it's highly likely but we can't prove the existence of internal records as well. How often is that enough? The existence of <clears throat> civil lawsuits which suggest that there must be something? Almost never. Judges love to say that we are often on fishing expeditions and, and that lawsuits mm -hmm. are not the same as internal misconduct. And it's true, all lawsuits are not the same as internal misconduct, but if we can't even get a sense of whether or not an officer has a disciplinary history, it's impossible for us to even make the, the slightest application to the court based on evidence. So uh, the problem is, is that the lawsuits all settle out. So there's never a finding of wrongdoing. So what the court finds out is that eh, these are just accusations, right? So you could have 50 lawsuits against one particular officer and they've all settled for $100,000 each. That does not sway some judges. Now my understanding is that the NYBD I think, did some kind of report or there was an inspector general report where what they were gonna do was uh, they were gonna have a demarcation line of a certain number of lawsuits would then um, indicate that the officer needed to be retrained in some way. So if the officer had, I don't know what the number was, but if the officer had seven lawsuits or ten lawsuits, that there was some training. So therefore, if they were supposed to have some training, one would likely be able to say that there must be something in his personnel record because there was some level of wrongdoing found at that point because he or she would have to be retrained. Uh, but these are bars that we cannot meet uh, besides the fact of what I said before, which is there's lots of information uh, that would be useful for all of us, but the district attorney's offices dismiss cases without saying this case was dismissed because it was a lying cop. Mm -hmm. They just won't say it. I mean, how do you come up with a situation like test lying? Everybody knows what that means, and yet you only have 45 people out of, what, 30,000 officers, whatever how many years, is, is charged with perjury, and yet we all know that test lying exists all the time, every day? Uh, it, it just boggles my mind. <clears throat> so yesterday I was out um, side City Hall with a number of people who had been wrongfully convicted. Their names would be familiar to you. Some cases spent decades in prison and um, at the root of their wrongful conviction were a variety of 
common flaws in our criminal justice system, which you know better than, than anyone else. Um, how important is it to get this information to be able to prevent wrongful convictions? And I don't mean it has to be a wrongful murder conviction where someone spends 30 years in prison, but a wrongful conviction for a relatively low level offense that still can have an extraordinary impact on someone's life. It is not only extremely important because police misconduct is one of the leading causes of wrongful convictions, it is nearly impossible to, to make an, a 440 application, so the, the type of application you have to make where you can't get discovery. So the Court of Appeals in December said that the public has no right to police misconduct information whatsoever, that the only context in which we can ask for it is in ongoing litigation. That means it's impossible if you're doing a 440 application for someone who is, is seeking a, a finding of wrongful conviction, you're in a public posture at that point. There is no existing litigation for you to ask for that information. The filing of your 440 motion doesn't create litigation for, to satisfy the, the end, New York Civil Liberties Union case? That it would if it got decided? that far, but often those cases are dismissed on the papers. Yeah. And so if the attorneys who are doing an investigation prior to filing that 440 motion and trying to make a really strong case on behalf of their client so that it will stick and they'll get in the door and they can get more discovery, they often can't, get even, can't even get in the door because they haven't been able to access the information through freedom of information requests. I'd like to speak speak to this on the trial level because obviously I think it would be extremely important for our clients not to get convicted and then have to go through this appeal process. What it looks like when you don't get the documents after you file this Giss and Danner motion pursuant to 50A is you're left with these lawsuits. Practically what that does for you at trial, it gives you the opportunity to ask the officer about the lawsuit. And, the off, and you're, not, you're bound by the officer's answer. You can, you can say, well, isn't it true on such and such a day you assaulted this individual? And because this lawsuit has settled without any admission of wrongdoing, the officer's going to say no. And you, you, there's nothing I can do at that point. I can't impeach him. I have no access to their disciplinary records. And so what it looks like is I'm asking an officer a question about something I don't know the answer to. I know the answer. I have the lawsuit. I know it was settled but I'm not permitted to talk about how much it was settled for. I'm not permitted to impeach him on the fact that this lawsuit was settled or with his disciplinary record, which I don't have access to. And so what happens is when I have a case that's based entirely on the credibility of a police officer, which are so many of our cases, I can't effectively impeach this police officer because I don't have access to these disciplinary records and you end up with wrongful convictions that way and then you end up in this appeals process that Conti is talking about. Okay, thank you very much. Ready. Thank you. All right, Drew Hewen, Kang, or, or Carolyn Martinez, class, Community United for Police Reform. Kylene, or, yeah, Kylie, Kylan Greer, Girls for Gender Equity, slash CPR. Darian X, Make the Road New York, CPR. Michael Sazisky, New York Civity Liberties Union. And Nahel Zamani, forgive me if I but butchered your name, Center for, for Constitutional Rights. Awesome. Peace and good afternoon, council members. My name is Darian. I'm a youth organizer for justice and community safety at Make the Road New York. Um, for far too long, young people in the city have faced harm and abuse by the hands of police with the burden of scrutiny always being placed on them instead of the NYPD. Young people specifically are exceptionally vulnerable to the violence uh, that the police commit in our communities. For instance, on our streets, unconstitutional stops continue to happen every day. And just because the NYPD has not been documenting these stops doesn't mean that they have changed in their practices. This violence is also very real in our schools where we are supposed to feel the safest. As uh, recent Buzz Ar BuzzFeed articles report, hundreds of officers have abused their powers from lying on official documents to sexual harassment, and they continue to work in our communities. Over two dozen of those officers work in our schools where students and families have no idea who is patrolling their hallways. Safety 
for young people of color has been precariously held in the hands of those who routinely criminalize their neighborhoods, and in some cases, like those previously aforementioned today, kill people who look like them. Not only can we no longer allow this to be the context through which young people live their lives, uh, but we can no longer allow for the harm and misconduct committed by the NYPD to be hidden behind blue walls of silence. Despite the rhetoric that the NYPD has displayed earlier today and uh, throughout their history, uh, despite this rhetoric that they have somehow been completely retrained and transformed, um, that is far from the reality, and we know that this exists as just a form of political gaslighting for our communities. Uh, police misconduct, abuse, and sexual harassment continues to happen with little or no consequences for officers. What videos and high-profile incidents like we have seen do is bring light to what's in the shadows throughout black and brown communities. The calls to provide transparency and accountability from communities most impacted by police violence has never been louder, and it is, and is, and it is this council's duty to answer those calls. The council, this council must urge and fight for a discipline matrix with swift and severe consequences if we are going to mitigate abuse of power in an agency that continues to police itself. I would add that this discipline matrix also needs to be fully transparent and fully pu public um, to our communities as well. Supporting a full repeal of Civil Rights Law 50A must also be a priority uh, for this council. And the fact that the NYPD continually, continuously attempts to broaden the scope of this legislation should be alarming to everyone. Um, 50A was one of the sole reasons Ms. Carr was unable to identify whether officers involved in killing her son had a history of misconduct, though we later did find out uh, a, find out this misconduct about Daniel Pantaleo through leaks, confirming, again, what our communities have always known um, through our day-to-day -day experiences uh, with the NYPD. I'll, I'll end here and just saying that we urge this council to really stand with young people of color and to stand with communities and to prioritize these issues. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, Councilmember Donovan Richards, Chair Richards, and uh, Chair Lansman. Um, I work uh, my name is Kylan Greer, and I work with Girls for Gender Equity. Um, we work daily with young women and trans and gender nonconforming youth of color who are policed at every juncture of their lives, on the way to school by the NYPD, in school by NYPD school safety agents, and while accessing city services, as seen in the case of Jasmine Headley at the Department of Social Services. Young women and trans and gender nonconforming youth of color, uh, young people are criminalized for normal adolescent behavior oftentimes hypersexualized due to historically located racialized and gender-based stereotypes, and their bodies are regularly policed because of their race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, gender identi identity, and gender expression. Girls for Gender Equity applauds the introduction of Resolution 3709, the repeal 50A uh, resolution, um, calling on the New York State Legislator to pass full repeal of New York State Civil Rights Law 50A. This would make certain information from police personnel records make certain information from police personnel records available to the public, um, such as reports of misconduct. As an organiza organization that has worked to address gender-based violence for 16 years, we understand that acts of gender-based violence are often patterned and repetitive. Frequently, sexual harassment and sexual assault are not a one-time or isolated incident. At, as with other forms of police misconduct against community members, officers have often have disciplinary re records that reflect former complaints of misconduct against alleged officers. Survivors, or, survivors who report sexual misconduct by police officers are met by a disciplinary system that benefits from hiding repeated misconduct from the public eye. Girls for Gender Equity also stands with Anna Chambers, an 18-year-old girl who was raped and sexually assaulted by two NYPD officers in Brooklyn, and who is one of many survivors of NYPD gender-based violence, including police sexual violence. These experiences and narratives are often unheard in the mainstream media or conversations about policing. This silence exists alongside a multitude of systemic barriers to reporting survivor supports and often victim blaming and criminalization of survivors. This is absolutely and unequivocally rooted in racial and gender-based discrimination. In February 2018, the Civ Civilian Complaint Review Board agreed to begin phasing in taking reports of police sexual misconduct against members of the public. 
Since the adoption of this policy, the Civilian Complaint Review Board has reported 130 incidents of sexual misconduct with 50 reports uh, with 50 complaints of sexual assault sent to the DA's offices. Located in a landscape where very few people report experiences of gender-based violence and with limited public awareness of CCRB's recent adoption, this number is significant. Still, survivors must still participate in a dual process run out of the NYPD Internal Affairs Bureau where survivors are treated in deeply dehumanizing ways and the NYPD has ultimate decision-making authority over disciplinary outcomes. As a city, we must enable CCRB to make final disciplinary de de discipline determination in cases that they already prosecute through the administra administrative prosecution unit and in cases where the NYP NYPD commissioner deviates from a CCRB recommendation that the commissioner sh and the commissioner should also publicly make available why he made that dissenting decision. And finally, um, I think it's important to name that NYPD school safety agents, um, any complaints that a young person may have about NYPD school safety agents, um, it is referred to the Internal Affairs Bureau of the NYPD. So young people are expected to be interviewed in a way that is deeply dehuman, dehumanizing um, and treated as if they are the person who did something wrong. Um, and there's no reason for this. Actually, the CCRB should have absolute mandate over um, these peace officers, um, and in particular, NYPD school safety agents. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Chairs Richards and Landsman. My name is Michael Szyzitski. I'm Lead Policy Counsel with the New York Civil Liberties Union. Uh, today's hearing and the bills before these committees are critically important. The report that was issued last week on NYPD discipline confirms many of the issues with the NYPD that the NYCLU has been raising for years, including the lack of transparency within disciplinary processes, the Commissioner's complete authority to decide outcomes in all disciplinary cases, the public's trust in police is diminished every time an officer is not held accountable and brought to justice for misconduct. And it's further diminished when departments like the NYPD actively resist sharing even the most basic information about the rules that they purport to follow, and even the most basic data on what happens when complaints start winding their way through the disciplinary system. The bills before the committee today are not enough to eliminate all of the flaws in the NYPD disciplinary system, but they are critical first steps. And our written testimony goes into more detail with comments and suggestions on each, uh, but I do want to highlight the importance of the resolution calling for repeal of Civil Rights Law Section 50A. Uh, the NYCLU strongly supports passage of this resolution and is actively working uh, with our partners to repeal 50A through the state legislature in Albany. 50A is an anti-democratic embrace of state secrecy. It permits police departments to cover up their inaction on past allegations of officer misconduct when they're confronted for, with demands for accountability. It inflicts additional and continuing harm and trauma on police abuse victims and grieving family members who have lost loved ones to police killings, denying them closure, denying them any real sense of whether justice was served in their cases. And it has been twisted to justify withholding everything from body camera footage to completely anonymized use of force data. And New York City bears no small part of the responsibility for this provision's shameful expansion in recent years. It's a state law, but New York City has really made this a pressing problem. A few years ago, the NYCLU submitted a FOIL request for redacted decisions from the NYPD's trial room. Our goal was to gain a better understanding of the analysis underlying the decision making in those cases, and we specifically did not seek any identifying information on individual officers. The NYPD denied our request and brought litigation challenging that decision. Uh, at, but in December, the New York State Court of Appeals issued a sweeping ruling in this dispute, denying our request for those records and expanding the reach of 50A so dramatically that it now operates unlike any other exemption in the State Freedom of Information Law, categorically banning the disclosure of these records and declaring redactions unavailable. New York is one of just two states to elevate records of police misconduct to the level of state secrets. And we do this despite the fact that there's already robust protections built into FOIL that are fully capable of balancing legitimate officer privacy concerns with the public's right to know how government agencies respond 
when public employees violate the public trust. And in the exchange uh, earlier this morning, the NYPD, despite their insistence that there are specific concerns that underline the importance of 50A, essentially admitted that there are exceptions in FOIL that address every concern that they have raised. In the exchange with Councilmember Cohen, uh, the NYPD acknowledged that FOIL has an exemption for personal privacy. Mm -hmm. It has an exemption to, uh, to redact information and withhold records when there are legitimate concerns about safety. Those records are, uh, can be handled just like any other record under a Freedom of Information Law request. There is no reason to assign this special level of secrecy and protection specifically to police personnel records. Uh, when these are the records that communities are most vitally in need of seeing. Uh, so with that, I will uh, conclude my testimony. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Ju Hyun Kang with uh, Communities United for Police Reform. I'm representing some of our members who were not able to make it today. Um, rather than go through written testimony, I'm just going to actually make three points. Uh, First, on some of the myths that were put forward today by the NYPD, one myth. Uh, uh, so I'll do myths. I'll do a few additional examples of disciplinary problems. So three myths. One is that um, they have to wait for a criminal legal process to conclude before they can move forward on discipline. We know that this is factually and historically incorrect. There are two examples that I would raise. Um, one is when Anthony Baez was murdered by the NYPD. Francis Lavodi, who is the officer who put him in a chokehold 20 years before Eric Garner, was actually uh, put through the NYPD disciplinary system and fired before the DOJ prosecuted Lavodi. That is the only case in the past several decades where an NYPD officer has been prosecuted by the feds and convicted and sentenced. And when that federal case happened, they were able to rely on the NYPD trial for being able to assess where there was perjury and other issues that were helpful in the federal case. So I want to make that point really clear. That's a choice that they make. It's not a rule. It's not a law. The second example is when Anna Chambers, uh, the 18-year-old who goes by the name publicly of Anna Chambers, that Kylan from Girls for Gender Equity mentioned, who was raped by two NYPD officers. After she was raped, um, the Brooklyn DA's office, before they moved forward on the case, and that's still actually in pretrial motions, the NYPD immediately uh, scheduled a disciplinary trial for those two officers. Those two officers, those two, those two Brooklyn detectives ended up resigning um, so that they wouldn't have to go through the NYPD disciplinary trial, but it shows you an, another example from a recent period where if the NYPD chooses to, they will move forward a case. And so hearing from the families that we heard earlier uh, with uh, Ms. Malcolm talking about her case with her son, Ramarley, as well as Eric Garner, Said Vassal, as well as Delron Small, these are all cases that should not be going on year after year, and they're not the only cases we're talking about. Um, second is, the second myth is uh, NYPD representatives today said that when 50A is amended, they will be able to be more transparent and release more data. Um, I actually think that uh, all of you, um, uh, certainly Councilmember Richards and Councilmember Lanceman know for sure that that's actually just not what's going on right now. The bills that are in the package that uh, the Council has put forward are all bills about aggregate data. That data can be released tomorrow with no revision to 50A. So what's happening right now that we want to just make really, really clear is that the NYPD is running game. That's all it is. They're running game. They're using 50A as a rhetorical uh, way to be obstructionist about just being transparent about misconduct and discipline. Um, the second part of that is that they talked about all of the advocacy that they will be doing on 50A amendment. We've heard this for the past two years. Uh, that has not happened, and you know we're curious to see what the modification bill looks like that they're proposing. Uh, the last thing I'll just say is that um, this idea about 50A uh, repealing 50A, risking officer safety, um, is really just about fear mongering, uh, and that it's not factual. Piece, as Michael said, the foil foil already actually excludes personal information. They can redact um, addresses and personal addresses, phone numbers, etc., of officers. Uh, other stuff will be in written statements. Thanks so much. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Nahal Samani, and I'm with the Center for Constitutional Rights. And I'd like to thank you guys again for holding this very important panel um, and committee hearing. Um, following the heels of the introduction of bills as well as the final report of the independent panel. I wanted to spend about 30 seconds addressing some of the confusing points from earlier today. 
Um, first, on the relationship between the CCRB and the NYPD. I was a bit confused about the statistics that were cited by the department. Looking at the CCRB's annual and semi-annual reports, from 2017, in APU cases, there was only a 27% level of concurrence. The first half of 2018, 26%. So unless the rest of 2018 was dramatically different, I'm a little bit confused about the statistics that were cited, particularly with regards to APU cases. There are some slight differences with the other swath of cases that don't represent the most serious penalties ascribed by this board, but some clarity, I think, is needed. Um, second, we know that there is some incongruence or lack of accord between the CCRB and the NYPD, as confirmed in the page 26 of the discipline panel and the report talking about the downward departure of the commissioner. Third, I am again a little bit confused about why the NYPD cannot publish aggregated information, particularly as it's broken down by precinct, which is a very useful uh, tool for future interventions and concern, particularly because they regularly post this information with regards to use of force, and that's on their website. Uh, fourth, with regards to stop and frisk, my organization, the Center for Constitutional Rights, uh, along with some other organizations in the room today, is involved in litigation around this issue, and the federal monitor in our case confirmed the stops are still racially discriminatory, they lack reasonable suspicion, a portion of them, and a number of them are not documented. So merely the number of stops going down does not demonstrate that the issue has been solved. I wanted to, of course, appreciate the package of bills that you guys have introduced, um, including increased public reporting and the resolution to appeal 50A, and commend the independent panel for the recommendations in the report, particularly the recommendation 9C, around reducing um, the DAO's request around reconsideration reports. Two things that I think are really important that will come about if your bills are passed, and of course as the panel recs are implemented, is showing why the NYPD continues to prefer lower level penalties and how much this occurs. And two, when and the NYPD does not pursue any disciplinary action. And I would urge the council that in any bills that are ultimately passed, you include this clause around no pursuit of disciplinary action as something that should be measured so that we can have a wider understanding of this. I'd like to conclude by just reiterating one thing that we found in the course of our litigation that was reported on by the Federal Monitor. The Internal Affairs Bureau currently investigates allegations of racial profiling. They have never substantiated an allegation of racial profiling. That means that there's a whole swath of cases where members of service are not appropriately being dis sanctioned. So we should consider that when we're discussing very disturbing findings of the panel and as the, as the council itself has found, as advocates have been raising for years, about the systemic failures within the NYPD's disciplinary process. Thank you. Thank you, and we'll have a lot more to say about that eventually. Uh, but thank you, thank you all for your testimony. I'm gonna call the next panel, Shanika Charles, Roberto Cabanas, Charlotte Pope, Kate McDonald. Everybody here? Shaniqua Charles, Roberto Cabanas, Charlotte Pope, Kate McDonald. All right, uh, ladies first. Shaniqua, you want to go first? Okay. Greetings, family. On November 18th, 2018, I was assaulted by police on the corner of my block in the Bronx which, by the way, is the poorest congressional district in the country, only feet away from where my, at the time, eight-year-old daughter stood. 
While having a conversation with someone, I was manhandled, dragged, hair yanked, arm cut, and thrown into the back of a 52nd Precinct squad car. As I screamed for my life at that point because I was not under arrest, there were three different points during this interaction where I quite literally thought I would not make it back to my daughter, Miracle. I thought I was going to die. Officer Capellan and his cronies made sure to divest from the protection in those moments, particularly after over eight officers took my body and did what they wanted. I was never placed under arrest. I was never told that I broke any laws. The only law that came to mind was walking while black in America, as these officers who refused to give any information to my goddaughter nastily drove off, I kept asking if I was under arrest, to which they continued to respond that I was not. Being kidnapped that day caused emotional trauma and physical, and physical scars. What is the point of this story? My name is Shaniqua Charles, and I'm the executive director of Miss Abby's Kids, a youth development nonprofit organization servicing the Northeast Bronx and beyond, and the co-founder of Never Be Caged, a newly formed organization to end mass incarceration through investment in our youth. And the point is that tirelessly working on criminal justice issues daily to correct the ills that impact communities of color and communities experiencing poverty does not even keep us as humans safe when police want to engage in negative behavior. These bills that are proposed would not only force police officers to have to think more deeply before terrorizing the communities they're supposed to serve and protect, but will also begin a record of responsibility that officers would have to adhere to. If you want to speak truth to power, then holding officers accountable to their actions of misconduct is a large piece of that puzzle, right? Not only this, but also holding the department responsible for actions um, that are being taken to respond when people are nastily violated, like myself and the countless others that also unfortunately end in death. Secondly, T-2019 uh, T is a must, particularly in our city where black and brown bodies are over-sentenced and much ado to the unrelenting power that prosecutors wield during arraignment processes and sentencing. We have staunch evidence of poor choice and targeted prosecutorial practices when we have a stain on New York City like Rikers Island where 89% of the population are black and brown bodies when we know that we only make up about 25% of this city, where Craig and Johnny can commit the same exact crime, have the same background, and Johnny goes home, perhaps never even being arrested, and Craig surrenders the rest of his life to being caged like an animal for the next 25 years. Something must change, and these bills are a strong start in addressing the two most powerful players in this heart-wrenching, rights-violating game of how many folks can we eliminate through mass incarceration. So thank you um, for introducing those, about 20 seconds more. Thank you for introducing those and also making sure that the people who are directly impacted by these ills every day are not only heard but supported, the grassroots people and the boots on the ground people. Our ancestors didn't jump off of ships to be free for us to still be in enslaved. We need healing. We need reconciliation. We need empathy. We need change. And we need change now. We need to continuously honor the work of our boots on the ground, grassroots, directly impacted humans that have the lived experience of what's wrong with our current system, which we all know is not broken, and creating community around these issues based on love and humanity. Peace and blessings, and thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you so much for your testimony. Afternoon. Um, my name is Kate McDonough, and I'm the director of Dignity in Schools Campaign New York, which is a multi stakeholder coalition of over 20 New York City based organizations that work for education justice and the end to the school to prison pipeline. I'm here today because systematic racism is leading to the gross over policing of our coalition members in school. Um, for example, research has shown that while black and Latinx Students do not misbehave more frequently than their white peers. They are more likely to be punished harshly for their actions. For example, black and Latinx students make up 92% of all arrests and 91.7% of students given summonses, yet only make up 67.1% of the student population. So while white students who may get into a fight have an opportunity to get at the root of the issue and receive support and guidance, 
black and brown students are placed in handcuffs and traumatized. We support the council's step, um, steps towards accountability and transparency through the legislation that was proposed today so that our young people can get the justice they deserve. We also support the repeal of 50A. I think it's also important to note though that this is a system of a, a, sim a symptom of a larger issue, which is state sanctioned violence against black, black and brown young people. Right now there are more NYPD school safety officers in our schools than there are guidance counselors and social workers combined. Currently the city gives over $300 million of the DOE's budget to the NYPD's school safety division. As we saw the NYPD's budget grow, we also, for the school safety division, we also saw funding for restorative justice in fiscal year 19 decrease, which is something that has proven to build positive school climates and reduce the criminalization of black and brown young people. So you get what you pay for. So in addition to taking these steps, we do urge the council to divest from this violence and invest in the success of our young people. We need funds to be reallocated from the NYPD to the DOE to enable guidance counselors and social workers to be in every school. We need funds to enable restorative justice to be expanded citywide. So we have a choice. As we propose, as we work towards this legislation, you can also be looking towards how to continue to invest in the success of our young people and their well-being. I also just want to uplift that our young people are thriving. Um, they're amazing young folks who unfortunately can't be here right now. Um, but it's not because of the system, it's in spite of it. And I know that together we can create the schools that they want, need, and deserve. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Charlotte Pope. I'm with the Children's Defense Fund New York. We're also a member of the Dignity in Schools campaign. I'm also here to bring attention to policing students as they attend school. According to data made available through the Council of Student Safety Act, young people experienced 10,000 police interventions in schools during 2018. Patrol officers and detectives who function outside of the school safety division are also policing schools and were responsible for 74% of all school-based arrests and 57% of all criminal court summonses during 2018. Students in school experiences of policing are far-reaching and the consequences of our and the consequences of or potential for relief from daily conflict or harassment fails to be transparent to students and their families. The BuzzFeed database shows 206 cases involving a school safety agent or representative of the school safety division. Substantiated charges included 52 instances of physical contact with students, including unnecessary and excessive force against a student, wrongful searches, and engaging in a physical altercation with a student, all resulting in forfeiture of vacation days. Students repeatedly attest to instances where SSAs and the police entering schools escalate incidents that could have otherwise been resolved or mitigated by an educator or counselor. CDF New York supports requiring the police department to submit reports on complaints of police misconduct, and we insist on the need to bring greater transparency to complaints originating from school-based incidents and to, to disaggregate complaints by command in order to identify trends. For the introductions requiring reports on arrests for resisting arrest, assault in the second degree, and obstructing governmental administration, we ask that they include whether the person was arrested in an area operated in whole or in part by the Department of Education. Finally, we urge the city to move away from police in our schools, especially as policing students is not a substitute for investing in counselors, social workers, and other life-sustaining resources. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, Chairperson Richards, Chair Chairperson Lansman. Uh, thank you for providing us with an opportunity to testify today. My name is Roberto Cabanas, and I'm the coordinator for the Urban Youth Collaborative and also part of Dignity in Schools campaign. UIC is a coalition of youth-led organizations all across New York City. Our young people are youth of color from Make the Road New York, Rockaway Youth Task Force, Sisters and Brothers United, and Future of Tomorrow. Every day, members of our organizations deal with the harsh and dehumanizing precincts of police in our schools. 
While their mere presence creates detrimental impacts on young people, the frequent displays of abuse compound these harms. Across the city, approximately 95% of all police interactions in schools are with students of color, despite only making up 67% of the student population. The discriminatory use of policing in our schools means that it is also very likely that black and brown students are the students most regularly abused by the NYPD in their schools. Our members have shared stories of physical and verbal abuse of school safety agents and other NYPD personnel in schools. Had I known <laughs> this hearing would go this long, um, our young people would have organized to be here. I know they would have loved to talk to both of you today and uh, any other the council members that are here. Um, when this type of abuse occurs by police and school safety agents, young people do not know where to turn. The complaint system is incredibly difficult for them to navigate. Most schools do not even know how students can file complaints against the NYPD personnel who, and who the police are in their schools. Some students have, have still been able to file complaints despite the excessive hurdles they face to do so. In the last two years, there have been nearly 300 force abuse of authority, dis discourtesy, offensive language complaints lodged against school safety agents. We know based on the bar barriers young people face in filing these complaints that this number vastly undercounts the true scope of abuse occurring in our schools. And yet that's almost a complaint in every school every day. The rate of abuse appears to be on the rise. Just yesterday, data came out about the complaints from quarter four of 2018. The complaints was approximately 57% higher than the same quarter of data in 2017. But once a complaint is filed, there is no transparency as to what, if any, disciplinary action is taken against the NYPD personnel. On average, complaints remain open more than 50 days, and some are open more, open more to 100, 100 days. During that time, as the complaints are issued, SSAs still remain in schools and are still uh, interacting with our students. Young people must feel safe and supportive in their schools. When we permit SSAs to stay in schools who have abused their authority, use force against young people, or are disrespectful, we tell young people, the message we're sending young people is that they don't matter. We tell them that this, that we tell them that they are, if they are abused, we will not support them. I'm just wrapping up. Uh, we're asking you to change that. The city must provide a transparent dis disciplinary process so that all New Yorkers, if they file a complaint against the NYPD personnel, their complaint will be taken seriously and appropriately, appropriate disciplinary action will be taken. SSAs with complaints against them should not be able to work in schools, and we also support the repeal of 50A. Students, uh, students parents, and community members at large need to have the opportunity to understand the disciplinary histories of people who are around our city's young, young people every day. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you all for your testimony. Thanks. And we're going to go to the last panel, Devon Woodley, Tawaki Kamatsu. I'm messing this up. Kamatsu, Kamatsu, Kamatsu. It's not me. It's your handwriting. Kelly Price, Kelly Grace Price, and Stephanie Binhami, Binham, Binhami. I'm going to ask you to begin, sir, and I'm going to ask you, I know you're a regular here, mind your language. Okay, thank you. Oh, uh, you know what? Ladies first. I will continue this. Uh, young lady, you begin. Press your button. It's going to light up red. There you go. And they'll just state your name for the record and everything, and you may begin. Good afternoon. My name is Stephanie Benon, and I am a member of the Closed Rikers Campaign and supporting our partners at Communities United for P Police Reform. I am here because I understand that being a police officer is not an easy job. I understand that police officers put their lives on the line by taking an oath to protect and serve communities that are entrenched with violent crime and drug abuse. 
but we, the people who live in these communities, do not feel protected by the police at times. Too many innocent black and brown kids are dying by the hand of police officers. Um, my, younger brother, best, my younger brother, best friend, and college roommate, Dan Roy, DJ Henry, was shot and killed by Pleasantville, New York police officer, Aaron Ness, on October 17, 2010. DJ was a senior and football athlete at Pace University who decided to go out one night with one of another friend to a local bar when Pleasantville police were called to the scene for an alleged fight. An innocent young man who was only 20 years old at the time was shot by a police officer all because he was told to move his vehicle from the fire lane. This officer, Aaron Ness, was promoted within P Pleasantville Police Department this, that same year that he shot and killed DJ Henry. My brother is still not healed from the loss of his best friend, and I'm not healed because that could have been my younger brother in that car with him. The fact that Officer Ness was not held accountable for the unlawful shooting and was able to keep his job deeply affected how my brother views local police officers as being discriminatory against black and brown people. And I wanna be able to let him know that we are fighting for police reform so that NYPD follow the law moving forward and he does not have to fear for his life or wait for justice that will never come. New York City spent millions of dollars of taxpayers' funds to settle cases of police misconduct, which involve allegations of wrongful imprisonment and police brutality. Why are taxpayers being held accountable by paying off settlements, civilian complaints against NYPD police officers for police misconduct? Should police officers be held accountable for their crimes? Who's policing the police? These are some of the questions that comes to mind when I see how black and brown, low-income communities are deeply impacted by police misconduct. I am here to testify in support of Bill Inter Inter Introduction 1105 in relation to requiring the police department to submit reports on complaints of police misconduct. I believe this bill will make NYPD disciplinary process more transparent. The City Council's ability to obtain frequent disciplinary report from NYPD officers is a starting point to break through the lack of transparency surrounding police misconduct. The rate of police misconduct complaints have increased in an all-time high within five years, and the number keeps rising. The number one issue regarding public safety in our community is how police are policing our community. Black and brown people are mostly targeted by police using physical force or even worse, deadly force causing death against citizens. Police shooting have impacted black and brown communities that should be protected by the police who are there to serve the community. It should be mandatory for police officers to report every police shooting and use of force in every department. So there can be tighter control over their discretion. Police officers should also be penalized if they do not report their action because it shows accountability. This bill calls for a change that will create space for real tangible police reform. It will require that NYPD be accountable for any misconduct and ensure that our communities have access to vital information to support our cause of justice, for justice, I mean. Thank you, thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Tamika Graham and I'm sitting in for Devon Woodley who had to leave in an emergency. Um, I'm gonna give his testimony, that way he doesn't go unheard. He says, most people assume the district attorneys are keeping us safe. This is far from the truth. The sad reality is that people who are standing and or awaiting trial are contributing taxpayers, essentially paying racist prosecutors to lock them up based off of the crime they allegedly committed without a fair understanding of the person standing trial. That gives them the room to operate in the dark. We trust them because we have to and because the people elected them. If we the people elected them into office and are paying them to do their jobs, then we have the right to transparency. We have the right to know what they know. It is our duty and our right to hold them accountable for their false accusations, their racist tactics, their insensitivity to black and brown communities, and most importantly, protecting our due process and a fair and speedy trial. Nobody should wield the power to take someone's freedom and neglect their humanity without being accountable to our communities. Accountability is the foundation for reforms. Remember that district attorneys could, on their own, enact significant pretrial reforms without waiting for Albany to act. 
Here in Manhattan, DA Cyrus Vance's office practices open file discovery whenever they feel like it. They would drastically reduce court delays if they practiced early and open discovery in every single case that they prosecuted. Five years ago, I was fighting an assault charge. I had never been arrested. I had never been pulled over and never had any warrants for my arrest. I was in college. I was working two jobs to support myself and my daughter and was privileged to post an outrageous $10,000 bail through the love and support of my family and friends. But instead of explaining the man I was, the district attorney office made me out to be an irredeemable monster with a suspected history of violence or violent tendencies. With no prior engagement with me, other than the police report and probation assessment they gathered, Instead of getting to know me as the man I was and who my family and loved ones knew me to be, an upstanding, taxpaying, contributing member to, of society, the prosecution decided to call me and quote, monster, a menace, and convince the judge that I had no regard for public safety. The DA's office made me look less than my worth and lied to the courts, depicting me as a boy who had been born into a life of crime and knew nothing but wreaking havoc and causing pain. The insensitivity, the injustice, and the racial profiling must stop now. DA accountability and transparency are what we need now in order for, return, for reform to work. We must reform the system. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Kelly Grace Price, and I just wanted to thank Ms. Graham for raising the specter of DA accountability. This has been um, my crusade for the better part of a decade. I, I won't um, bore you with what happened to me with Cy Vance, but um, I wanted to make a few comments specifically about the DA reporting bill, um, and then I wanted to talk about sexual assault investigations in the NYPD and in the CCRB, and I'm gonna try and make this super quick. I've submitted my written testimony to all of you via email. I beg your pardon, I don't have access to a printer. Um, so some general comments about the specifics uh, of intro um, T 2009 um, I, I'm not going to go through everything. Um, I'm already tired of the sound of my voice. My service dog is exhausted. But I, I really want to emphasize that we need more reporting on sexual violence and how our city DAs treat us when we turn to them in our darkest hours. If the Me Too movement has taught us anything, is that our, our DAs are egregiously behind in servicing this segment of the population. Um, I think that a few additional requirements could be very easily added to this bill to specifically address um, the needs of sexual assault and harassment survivors. Uh, I think we need the number of cases of IPV, rape, sexual abuse, and sexual harassment that have been sent to the DAs from the NYPD. We need those numbers. I'm, I'm a member of the Downstate Coalition um, Against Sexual Violence, and we've asked numerous times all of the, the parties for those numbers, including the mayor's new commissioner of the Office uh, Against Gender-Based Violence. She doesn't, have, she doesn't have those numbers. She doesn't have a clue. We really need the numbers of how many, not just 61s, but how many cases of rape and sexual assault are, are submitted to the DAs for prosecution. I was at a, an event with the Reverend Q English last summer, and um, the former commissioner of the Office Against Gender-Based Violence, Rose Pierre Louis, showed up, and she threw off the top of her head that there were over 85,000 complaints in Manhattan alone in the previous year of rape, sexual assault, or sexual harassment. But then I literally heard Cy Vance the next month say that his office only prosecuted about four or 5,000. That's ridiculous. So um, without going ad, ad nauseum through all of my reporting requirements, you have them submitted. I also, this is whimsical, but I also have a deep desire to have additional reporting. Um, your, your bill, uh, Councilman Lanceman 3706, um, specifically asks for um, uh, the, the NYPD to turn over its records to the DA about discipline. We need the same kind of disciplinary records about district attorneys made transparent. Um, I really don't need to go through the nauseating reporting on bad DAs around town. There's the Brooklyn ADA who was spying on her lover. There's the, the nanny cam scandal. There's 
Eli Tchaikovsky's kid, or Michael Tchaikovsky's kid who choked out a girl in a bar. There's the alleged pimp that was working in the investigative use unit of the DA's office. There's so much reporting, but we have absolutely no transparency. Jeffrey Schlanger, the, the former chief of staff for Cy Vance, his best buddy, had to leave in shame because he was acu allegedly accused of sexual violence by a, an intern. Now he's the general counsel for the NYPD. I actually like Mr. Schlanger. He tried to really help me when he worked for Cy Vance. But still, if, you know, what's good for the goose is, is good for the gander. Um, my time is up, but please, if you could take my recommendations and try and get some kind of reporting about, and also, the DAs don't investigate themselves. They have the Brooklyn, if someone in Cy Vance's office has done misdeeds, his office doesn't investigate. It's, it's Ben Darcel Clark, but the latest one got punted to Brooklyn. But the public has no feedback on where those, how those investigations turn out. Um, anyway, please, thank you for, for letting me go almost last again. Thank you again. Thank you for being here. Hi, my name is Tawaki Kamatsu. I've testified to you previously. Um, in, I guess, talking to me when our first interaction occurred, you imposed a prior restraint on my First Amendment speech. My um, testimony today is not for anyone in this building. It's instead for Federal Judge Lorna Schofield, the Second Circuit, and federal judges assigned to the federal courthouse in Brooklyn. I'm going to play some videos of public meetings, um, starting one with one on September 26th of 2017, where NYPD Officer Raymond Drolla of the Mayor's NYPD security detail um, illegally kept me out of a public town hall meeting in violation of New York Penal Code 175.25. As a district attorney candidate, Mr. Blackman, you should actually do something in terms of enforcing applicable law. Um, the second video I'm going to play for your benefit, as well as the people in this room, is a public meeting that the mayor held on October 25th of 2017 in Brooklyn where uh, defendant Howard Redman of the mayor's security detail, again, kept me out of a public meeting so that I couldn't engage in whistleblowing. So, Judge Schofield, this is for your benefit to establish that there is indeed linkage between my existing claims in my federal lawsuit and the additional claims that I seek to add to it. Here we go. He's not letting me into this public meeting in violation of your... Here we go. So this guy is Howard Redman. He's a defendant in the federal civil rights lawsuit I was talking about. And Howard Redman, the case is Sherrard versus City of New York. He put somebody in jail for 19 hours and now he's not letting me into a public meeting. Yep. I'm stepping. Is this good enough? Over here. Oh, so how's this? Bias, is this is good. I'm following your orders, so I'm just asking you. Is this good enough? Okay. So I'll take, go even further back. How's this? You want to know about misconduct? Here it is. There you go. Actually, you got him. Ma'am, you come in? Sir, you have to step to the side. That's the evidence. Over evidence right now. I can tell you again. Do not block the side. You stay right here. This is Lieutenant Nieves of the NYPD Security Team. That's November 27, 2017. Currently violating 18 USC 1512 here. and 18 USC 242, 245. He's also violating New York State's open meetings law. This is yeah. Officer Baez, badge number 5984. The housing? What's your name? It's Cruz. You know my name. No, uh, this is your badge number 751. Yes, you November 27, oh, yeah. 2017. A public hearing. Okay, thank you. Your so time is up. Let me just quickly. Time is up. Uh, you really? could wrap up. Yes. So, Letitia James, an attorney for the, assist the Attorney General of New York State, she filed papers on January 11th of this year in my federal lawsuit claiming that if there's a public hearing, people don't have a protected First Amendment right to attend a public meeting. Do you agree with that? I'm not going to comment on should, what uh, the State Attorney General says. I have not had a conversation. So uh, thank you for your testimony, uh, and thank you for coming out today. Thank you all for coming out today. I want to especially thank um, the staff who worked on this uh, particular hearing, Daniel Adis. Casey Addison, uh, Nevin Singh, I know the Committee of Justice, Maxwell uh, Kampfner-Williams, uh, Kishorn Denny, 
Monica Peppel, hope I got all your names right. Um, wanna thank you all for the work uh, you've done to put this, together, this hearing together. I also wanna acknowledge the work once again of the Blue Ribbon panel. I married your wife, Barbara Jones and Robert Capers and the NYPD for coming out and most importantly, the uh, members of the public who came to testify uh, today and especially those families who came out to give testimonies on uh, unfortunate incidents that happened in their uh, particular lives. So with that being said, this hearing is now closed.